Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our 2024 Fair Housing Conference. Yes. My name is Frobel Changada, and I am the Long Island Regional Director for the New York State Division of Human Rights. This year's conference is titled Beyond Brick and Mortar, Housing Equity and Inclusion, and will focus on the impact housing has on our everyday lives and the potential of helping us build a fair, more equitable New York State. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, New York State Division of Human Rights Acting Commissioner, Denise Miranda. Commissioner Miranda was nominated by Governor Hochul in March 2024 to serve as the Acting Commissioner of the Division of Human Rights. Prior to this, in 2017, Commissioner Miranda was appointed and confirmed by the Senate as the Executive Director of the New York State Justice Center for the Protection of People with Special Needs and served in that position for seven years. Prior to joining the state, Commissioner Miranda served for six years as Managing Director of the Urban Justice Center's Safety Net Project in New York City. Commissioner Miranda began her career here in the Bronx as an assistant district attorney in the Domestic Violence and Sex Crime Bureau of the Bronx County District Attorney's Office. Commissioner Miranda has been actively engaged in the practice of law for nearly 30 years, focusing her work on social justice issues and protecting the rights of vulnerable individuals. Please help me welcome Commissioner Miranda. Thank you, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I am Denise Miranda, and I'm the Acting Commissioner of the New York State Division of Human Rights. And if you listen to that introduction, he said March of 2024. And if we do the math on that, it's relatively recent. I have to tell you, um, it really is an honor, before I start with um, my notes, it really is an honor to be here because approximately between 12 and 15 years ago, I attended this conference as an advocate working on behalf of marginalized communities, um, working on behalf of public housing tenants, and making sure that they were aware of their rights. So now to stand here um, before all of you in this position, I just want to say I recognize the privilege, but also the honor that it is and the responsibility that comes with it. So thank you for joining us today for day one of our conference, Beyond Brick and Mortar, Housing Equity and Inclusion. Each April, New York State celebrates Fair Housing Month and commemorates the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act, which was signed on this very day, 56 years ago, on April 11, 1968. Passing this landmark legislation took years of effort from civil rights activists from across the country and our very own state. Our partners at the U.S. Department of Housing and Development have set a theme for this month, Fair Housing, the Act in Action, underscoring the Biden administration's commitment to addressing longstanding issues of equity and inclusion. And we know Governor Kathy Hochul shares this commitment. Fair housing laws protect individuals when they rent an apartment, buy a home, apply for a mortgage, and even when they're seeking modification or accommodation to fully use and enjoy where they live. Protecting the right to fair housing is a step towards tackling many of society's ills. Housing is more than shelter or a roof over your head. Housing determines where you can work, the education your children receive, the type of qu and quality of food available to your family, and even the quality of the healthcare available. New York State has a particularly proud history in civil rights and fair housing. In 1945, our state became the first in the nation to pass an anti-discrimination law, which initially prohibited discrimination in employment because of race, color, creed, or national origin. In the 1950s and 1960s, legislators and activists worked to add fair housing protections to our state law. As we gather here today, many decades later, we note how much more inclusive our state human rights law has become. The New York State human rights law not only protects against discrimination based on race, creed, color, or national origin, but now includes age, sex, sexual orientation, military status, disability, familial status, arrest record, and lawful source of income. Thanks to legislation signed by Governor Hochul, our state law now also protects people based on their immigration or citizenship status and survivors of domestic violence. 
As many of you know, the division works closely with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to advance fair housing. Our partnership with HUD has enabled stronger enforcement of fair housing laws and has also made today's program at this wonderful venue possible. So we thank them. Each year we investigate over 600 complaints of housing discrimination filed by individuals across our state. Disability, race, and color, and lawful source of income are the most frequent basis of complaints at the division. But we're not just waiting for these complaints to be filed. We also have a division initiated action unit that seeks out and investigates widespread patterns and practices of discrimination. In one such case, our team found that a popular real estate website was excluding individuals who received Section 8 housing choice vouchers from certain real estate listings. Our team filed a complaint and ultimately ensured that the website changed their practice and paid a $40,000 fine to the state. Beyond enforcement, education is also key to our efforts advancing fair housing. The division is proud to partner with our sibling state and city agencies, fair housing organizations, and local stakeholders to host community-based events across our state. We've worked with HUD on PSA campaigns to spread the word about fair housing protections to tenants, landlords, home buyers, and real estate professionals near and far. And so, as we listen to our programs today and their distinguished speakers, let's ask ourselves, how can we take what we're learning and act on it to advance equity and inclusion? How can we as individuals act to make sure that New York becomes a fair state for everyone? With that in mind, I'd like to introduce our featured speaker this morning, Alika Ambry Samuel, Regional Administrator for HUD's Region 2, which includes New York and New Jersey. Ms. Ampri Samuel was appointed in January of 2022 by President Joe Biden. In her capacity as regional administrator, Ms. Ampri Samuel oversees over $6 billion in programs and activities in our region. She, with members of Congress and local elected officials, worked to ensure that the department's policies and programs create more affordable, environmentally sustainable, and inclusive communities. Prior to this, Ms. Ampri Samuel served as a New York City Council member where she chaired the Public Housing Committee and as a deputy leader. Prior to being elected to the City Council, Ms. Ampry Samuel served on the senior team at the New York City Housing Authority. She has held a number of public service positions, including Chief of Staff in the New York State Assembly and Democracy and Human Rights Coordinator at the U.S. Embassy in Accra, Ghana. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Ampry Samuel. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I always hate hearing folks talk about me. <laughs> Y'all know how that feel, right? It's like, no, I'm just a little girl from Brownsville, Brooklyn, who grew up in the project. <laughs> I usually lead with that, but good morning, everyone. Good morning, housing champions, fair housing champions. It's such a beautiful day outside. <laughs> But on this day, I can't think of a better place to be than at this gathering of passionate professionals committed to leveling the playing field for everyone seeking the most basic needs, a safe place to lay your head. And so I bring greetings on behalf of our acting secretary, Adrian Todman, who was here last night. We were at the National Action Network conference um, last night and we talked about today. And so I'm just bringing you greetings. And as you all know, HUD celebrates Fair Housing Month in April, but fair housing is a priority for HUD every single day of the year. And during this month, we aim to make it top of our mind for all Americans. And HUD's theme this year is the act in action. And HUD wants to drive home the message that we all deserve a sanctuary to live and raise our families, and we must act now. So let's pause for a moment to acknowledge the work that's being done. Is it working? And what else can we be doing now? And so this year, HUD is intentional about what can we do now and how do we act now? And so the theme for this conference, Beyond Brick and Mortar, Housing Equity and Inclusion, focuses on ensuring that everyone, regardless of background, finds a place to call home, that sanctuary where dreams take root, families thrive, and futures unfold. 
This is what we wish for ourselves and our loved ones, a welcoming home in the community, accepting of who we are. And so I wanna thank Commissioner Miranda for your leadership because leadership matters. Who's in the seat matters. So thank you. We are privileged to partner with the New York State Division of Human Rights and your work is invaluable to our agency and our clients and our families. All of you here today are essential resources that we rely on to educate and enforce fair housing law. And we all work very hard to fight housing discrimination, but as you all know, there's so much more to be done. And so I also wanna thank John for opening your space. I know you're here every year, except for the past couple of years, but thank you. And thank you for your work. John had a career down in DC, so a lot. <laughs> um, and I also wanna thank our Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity FHEO colleagues. Many of them are here today. So my FHEO family and FPM, can you please stand up? Seriously, seriously? <laughs> So um, I want to recognize the FHUO family because they eat, sleep, and breathe fair housing for our agency. And so, I, and I also want to recognize that our Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Demetria McCain, who isn't here today, but she's bringing remarks tomorrow, and we have a full weekend um, with our Principal Deputy Assistant. Um, we'll be over at NARAB. I know several people in this room are going to be out there this weekend. So in fiscal year 2023, HUD and its Fair Housing Assistance Program partner agencies received more than 8,000 complaints alleging housing discrimination nationwide. And during the past three years, the HUD office, our FHEO office in New York alone, received 1,300 fair housing complaints. And over 60% of them were from residents with disabilities. 10% of the complaints received were for retaliation and just take a moment and, ima and imagine being a parent trying to keep a roof over your head and make sure your children are safe, but living in the constant fear of arbitrarily losing your home or a person with a disability living in fear because they were defending their right to housing. And nearly 600 complaints were for reasonable accommodation. And these are the ones who report the discrimination. We know there are so many who do not file out of fear or because they think that the fight is just not worth it because they won't win. The truth is that millions of people across the country do not have real housing choices, and particularly those that belong to the protected classes identified in the Fair Housing Act. This is why the Biden-Harris administration and HUD prioritize strengthening fair housing protections and enforcement with executive orders during the first week in office. President Biden, during the first week put to paper, and it wasn't just ink on paper, but the executive orders demonstrate this administration's commitment to working with communities to end discrimination, redress past discriminatory housing policies, mend broken doors, shatter dreams, fracture communities, and secure equal housing opportunities for all. In the past three years, HUD has worked very hard to level a playing field for our residents so that they can rent where they choose buy a home where they choose, receive accurate home appraisal, and help in home buying, and help in getting the finances that they deserve to buy a home. There's an initiative that I just wanted to highlight quickly. Our, um, in 2022, President Biden signed the Violence Against Women Act, Reauthorization Act of 2022 which enhances housing protections for survivors applying for and living in units assisted by HUD programs. VAWA 2022 protects individuals' rights to call emergency services and report crimes for their crimes in their homes. So families don't have to fear losing their housing if they need to call 911. And last year, HUD issued the notice to public regarding FHEO enforcement authority and procedures establishing a VAWA complaint intake, investigation, determination, and enforcement process. And in October, HUD announced funding to homeless service providers to prevent survivors of domestic violence from becoming homeless and to connect them to housing services. So that's the act 
in action that we're talking about. But when we talk about HUD, folks sometimes only think about public housing in Section 8. And we also focus on removing barriers to home ownership. And I'm hoping that the first panel will talk a little bit about the work that you all are doing around home ownership and removing those barriers. But at HUD, we stood up, I don't know if you heard former Secretary Fudge's talk about personal property appraisal stories and how her own personal home was valued at $250,000 less than her white neighbor. And it was simply because she was a black woman. And so this passion led to an interagency task force on property appraisal and valuation equity known as PAVE. And so just quickly under PAVE, we've been able to make the appraisal industry more accountable, empowering consumers with information and assistance, preventing an algorithmic bias in home valuation. And the team is working to cultivate a well-trained appraiser profession that looks like the community where they're working. And so I just wanted to highlight those few things because we put our money where our mouth is. And last year, HUD provided $3.2 million to our partners right here in New York for enforcement, testing, prevention, compliance, education, outreach, and capacity building. And so we're doing the work. And I know because I'm standing here and everywhere I go and we're talking about fair housing, the question is always, so what's going on with AFFH, right? For the past year, everywhere I go, I have been just as passionate and anxious about that final rule, I think, as everyone in this room. And so um, I'm gonna read an update real quick because I can't just say this, right? HUD has issued a proposed AFH rule and is now carefully reviewing submitted public comments and developing a final rule to help us implement that AFFH mandate. Y'all all know what that means, right? <laughs> the process is, 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 is right there. We're right there. And under this secretary I, and under this administration, I really do believe that we are going to get to that final rule by the, before um, the third quarter. And so in conclusion, Fair housing is not just about laws, but real lives, resilience, and progress. Someone once said, doing the best at this moment puts you in the best place for the next moment. And in order to carry out a positive action, we must develop a positive vision. So I'm so grateful to have all of you as partners in this mission to eradicate discrimination, people with a vision who work hard to put best practices into action. Your commitment to fundamental right to housing profoundly impacts our families and our communities. So let us continue to champion equality and create more success stories in the fight against housing discrimination. Thank you all for allowing HUD to provide a few words today and have an amazing conference. Thank you very much, Ms. Amprey Samuel. Uh, now we have a few words from our host, uh, Mr. John Cavalli, Executive Vice President for Public Affairs here at the Bronx Zoo. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna, I wanna hear good morning, come on. We're, you're at the zoo, how bad of a day can um, I, I was As I was reflecting on the, the comments from the commissioner and the regional administrator, I, I um, I realize I'm gonna do everything wrong because uh, this whole conference is about brick, beyond brick and mortar. I'm gonna tell you about brick and mortar, about where you are. And uh, I am actually gonna talk a little bit about leveling the playing field, but let me, let me start you off right here. This space for the conservation environmental community is kind of like hollow ground. And I, what I mean by that is um, in 1905, something called the American Bison Society was started here. Um, what was that? We had 30 million buffalo in America, they were hunted down to 21. And we can have a very interesting conversation about why that happened. It was fundamentally about people of color and trying to get them onto reservations. The bottom line is that the Bronx Zoo at the time, working with the Native American community and the business community and the government community came together, saved the buffalo from extinction, and we shipped them out to uh, Oak, the Osage Nation. And what's fascinating is as a Bronx site, um, if you see a buffalo out west, 
they're probably from the Bronx originally, all right? So just remember that New York City delivers in many ways, right? Number one. Number two, this space for us is hollow because it's really a, our one communal space where we can bring people together. There's been so many kind of famous people that have come through here. One that I shared with the table was actually uh, Fidel Castro. When he met with Nikita Khrushchev, decided to come to the zoo first, right? And um, he, there's a great photo in the Daily News, if you can find it, of him holding a hot dog with two New York City police officers next to him. Like, I guess he was going to steal a hot dog. I'm not really sure what they were worried about. But this space and Helen Keller and so many others through the years have been through this place. But I think people think about the Bronx Zoo as this wonderful place to bring your family. But we are an anchor institution. And I think the regional administrator referenced leveling the playing field. Well, that's actually what we do every day here. Um, we are the largest employer of youth in the borough of the Bronx. We're the largest employer of minority youth. We have the largest STEM program in New York City. We manage a citywide program that has 1,100 paid STEM internships. 74% of them are from communities of color and underserved communities. So I know you're all looking at me. It's like, what's this old white guy doing up here talking about this? And I will tell you, I was born on 180th and Hughes Avenue. My parents are immigrants. So I know within my life experience what it means to be an immigrant, to be, and then we moved back to Italy when I was a child. And then after nine months, my father said, what the hell am I doing in Italy? I got to get back to America. And we came back. And therefore, I was able to live here and have the opportunities that this country has given me and my family. What we try to do here at the Wildlife Conservation Society is do that every day for the communities where we serve. And we are in four out of the five boroughs. Uh, we have about 3.5 million visitors a year at our properties. But we also work in 60 countries around the world. We now manage about 250 million acres of land around the world, and we're home to 50% of the world's biological diversity. That's the work that we do here in the Bronx Zoo every day, which is where I'm going to go in about two minutes to continue to do that work. But I wanted to leave you with that understanding because we are your partners. You have to see us as anchor institutions. I was speaking to a, a fellow um, at HUD, and I think sometimes you forget you all forget the role that we can play, the catalytic role we can play in the communities that we serve. So I'm just honored to have you here. I wanted to be here uh, on behalf of WCS, on behalf of the Bronx Zoo, to just bring that point home and realize that here in New York City and candidly around the world, we're here to be your partners. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. We're gonna get started with our panel in just a couple of minutes. Good morning again. Uh, my name is Frobel Changada, Regional Director uh, for Long Island for the Division of Human Rights. I'm going to be the moderator today for our first panel. Uh, our first panel today is Building a Nest, Home Buying. As you know, buying a home is more than just real estate. A home helps build generational wealth, access to schools and jobs, and much more, which is why it's important to promote equity and inclusion. Topics discussed in this panel will include predatory lending, foreclosure and eviction, and SUNY-made programs available for first-time buyers. Today on our panel, we have uh, Darrell Ford, Senior Vice President of New York State Homes and Community Renewal, Megan Foe, Chief of the Social Justice Unit of the New York Office of the Attorney General, Baba Ham, Vice President, VP of New York Market Enterprise Community Partners, and Blondell, Pinock, CEO of Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation. Let's give him a hand. First up, we're going to have uh, Ms. Uh, Darrell Ford sp speak about what her organization provides in, in services. Morning, everyone. Thank you so much to uh, the Division of Human Rights for uh, putting this together and and uh, that better? I'm from Brooklyn. I always think people can hear me. Okay. <laughs> uh, so thank you for uh, putting this together and including uh, the State of New York Mortgage Agency in today's uh, uh, activity. So the State of New York Mortgage Agency is a public authority offering affordable 
uh, low cost mortgage products to low and moderate income home buyers. And every year we help over 2000 first time home buyers achieve home ownership uh, in ways that they probably thought were not possible. New York state is a very expensive state. And often many folks think that home ownership is beyond them, that it's not possible. Well, there are so many ways to make it possible. And I'm so proud to say that the state of New York mortgage agency, Sony May, helps with that, with that challenge. We offer mortgage products that are low cost. We cap fees. Our products are offered through 70 participating lenders throughout the state. And our programs come in all different shapes and flavors in order to meet the needs of those who are trying to achieve home ownership. One of the ways that often folks think um, home ownership is such a hurdle is money, right? Money. Well, we offer that. Sony May's number one program is our not repayable, forgivable down payment and closing cost assistance. Home buyers are eligible for fifty. $15,000 that they don't have to pay back. And if you're low income or from an underserved community, up to $30,000 in non-repayable assistance. That is 80% of our home buyers benefit from that program and they often think it's not possible. Also, Sony May allows folks to layer and combine as many affordable home programs as they are eligible for right, by any means necessary. So if Sony May's assistance doesn't help you cross that finish line, well, maybe you can combine it with an employer assistance program. Maybe there's a nonprofit that's giving, uh, giving money away. Sony May programs allow you to, to layer two, three, four, as many subsidies as a home buyer is eligible for. And we do that everywhere in the state, right, by any means necessary. Maybe a first-time home buyer could only afford that fixer-upper, right? Well, we offer a renovation program, so you don't have to. We'll lend you both acquisition and renovation cost, right? Maybe you're a veteran. Maybe you're a new graduate. We offer lower interest rates for those folks. One of the great initiatives that we started in the past two years is we looked at why were communities of color, households of color, being denied mortgage approvals at one to two times the rate of white households, even when you adjust for income. We looked at mortgage rejections over five years and we said, what are the reasons stated by lenders for rejecting and not approving those home buyers? And we said, what can we do to fix that? So we developed inclusive underwriting guidelines that captured sound financial management that perhaps was not documented in traditional underwriting. And so those, those underwriting guidelines are available through our 70 participating lenders in every community. I, as a first generation American, I know that many immigrant communities, perhaps they don't trust the banking system. Perhaps where they came from, they, it couldn't be trusted. So I know my uncle always kept a box of cash under his mattress, right? But he never missed a payment. And so our inclusive underwriting guidelines I'll capture all types of sound financial management so that we can give those approvals. In looking at the rejection rates of certain underserved communities, we decided that we could also be a little more generous, give lenders a tool to make it possible to approve those home buyers. And so we developed a mortgage product called Credit is Due to encourage our participating lenders to develop a special purpose credit program right? Most lenders aren't using that option, that availability, because, but in partnership with Sony May, we will take on the risk. So that special purpose credit program says to lenders, if you are lending to historically disadvantaged communities, Sony May will give you a mortgage product that can allow you to approve them. We offer our inclusive underwriting guidelines. We offer expanded down payment closing cost assistance of up to $30,000. And in today's economic environment, we also offer an interest rate that is 2% below the prevailing rate if the home buyer needs it. So we are closing loans today at 4.75% because often communities of color, they're making less than their white counterparts 
often their homes are not appraising or when they're going for the transaction, they're looking at the lack of credit history and saying, we can't approve them. You might think that with all of these sort of leveling tools that Sony May borrowers may not be as successful. We have lower delinquency rates than the state average and the national average year after year. And so what is the biggest challenge I think for home buyers? Not knowing about all these options. Even if you know about Sony May, maybe they don't know about how they can combine it with other nonprofit options. So events like today, sharing that information and to all of you active advocates out there, right? Please, I tell everyone everywhere I go, this may not help you, but please tell five people. And if those people tell five people, we can really make a change. So thank you so much for giving me a couple minutes and I will hand this off to my fellow colleagues and I'd love to get some questions later. Thank you so much, Ms. Ford. Up next uh, on our panel will be Ms. Blondell Pinock, CEO of Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Okay, good morning. Um, so uh, thank you for allowing me to come here and to talk about the work that Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation does. Uh, just to set a little bit of context, um, we talk about anchor institutions and we talk about hollow ground. So Bed-Stuy Restoration was founded um, in 1967 uh, between a partnership with uh, Robert Kennedy Sr. Uh, <laughs> and Jacob Javits and um, community leaders. Um, and it was in response to redlining. It was, a, it was in response to the disinvestment that occurred in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Um, it was a time where there had been uh, race riots. It was a time when uh, neighborhoods and the stores and businesses had been decimated along the Fulton, Fulton Avenue corridor. And uh, Robert Kennedy did a walking tour and determined that this was a neighborhood that needed to have investment. And the reason why he chose Bed-Stuy, because his other, his other neighborhood that he did tour was, was Harlem. But he chose that sty because of the level of passion that the homeowners that were there had and the activist spirit that existed. And he knew that whatever was gonna happen, even though they gave him a hard time, that they were going to be able to make change occur um, in that community, and they did. And as a result, uh, Restoration um, was able to acquire two super blocks um, through public-private partnership, it received $7 million grant from the federal government, in addition to private foundations that were able to support what restoration needed to do within that community. Oh, you can, okay. I'm, I'm gonna put this a little closer, can you hear? I'm holding it up. <laughs> so um, what restoration did, it created a built environment. And in that built environment, um, it provided the opportunity for housing. It formed a mortgage coalition um, and it was able to help um, over 1,700 homeowners um, repair their homes, uh, get mortgages, qualify for mortgages uh, over time. Um, in addition to that, restoration became uh, a place for a marketplace. We provided uh, space for uh, restaurants and for businesses to come, um, as well as the holder of culture um, in, in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Uh, restoration to this day continues its housing focus because our mission has evolved to one of uh, closing and disrupting the racial wealth gap. Um, because it is still um, imperative, particularly in central Brooklyn, where the gap is estimated to be between 40 and $50 billion. Um, and when you think of Bed-Stuy and you think of Crown Heights, you think of brownstones and you think of homes. And so it is even more imperative that we enforce um, and that we have as part of our services, uh, we have counselors, HUD certified counselors, who are available to provide one-on-one -on -one counseling um, and to provide the tools necessary to get people eligible and give them the knowledge base, because we are a trusted partner, give them the knowledge base of what's necessary in order to purchase their home. But just as important, um, because we know that a home is probably your greatest indicator of wealth, 
It's also maintaining that wealth and maintaining that home. Bedford-Stuyvesant is a fastly gentrifying community and neighborhood. Um, and what we are aiming to do is to ensure that the homeowners that are there are able to maintain their homes. Um, so we have a lot of policy initiatives that we are also putting forth to help with deed flipping and deed theft that is rampant in Bedford-Stuyvesant and Central Brooklyn. Um, we are working with local elected officials to ensure that doesn't happen. We're also helping our homeowners know and understand um, the uh, um, any any work that we're doing through our home ownership program about speculators who are coming in, and they're definitely targeting our older homeowners um, and trying to um, take their homes uh, due to um, whether it's taxes, whether it's a water bill, and just having the education and knowing what needs to happen, I think, is really the first battle for us. Um, and being able to reach out because of our connections, because we are a convener, because we are a place that that um, holds many nonprofits that um, reach out into the community, uh, we are able to have those conversations. But there needs to be more. Uh, more needs to be done. And um, thankfully, the partnerships that we have with Sunny May. Uh, the partnerships that we have with HPD, we are able to inform a lot of people that they are able to participate in the home ownership, particularly in a very high cost market like New York City, because that is the hardest thing. Um, we are fortunate over the last two years, we've been able to um, have a total of 50, 44 homes purchased um, through our program. Um, that's $13.6 million in, in the value of the homes purchased. Um, our average, uh, the average income for our home buyers uh, is $89,000. Uh, average credit score is 727. And uh, the average savings, $37,000 that they have. And uh, the average investment, $33,000. But we're combining all of these resources with the banks that we work with, including JP Morgan Chase, including Citibank um, and TD, um, in addition to our work that we're doing with Sony May and with HPD, and we are providing uh, workshops, we are providing counseling, uh, we go out to churches, uh, we work with community groups to ensure that uh, the community knows what's going on. And we particularly target our seniors since a lot of them are still homeowners in the community, and we want to ensure that they are not being taken advantage of. Um, but those are just some of the things, some of the tools that restoration is doing in order to uh, ensure that we not only attain wealth, but that we retain wealth and we're able to pass it on generationally. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Panok. Our next panelist is, is Ms. Baba Holm, Vice President of New York Market Enterprise Community Partners. Thank you. Can, can you guys hear me in the back? I, I've gotten a tip. I have to hold it close, close to make sure everybody is able to hear me. Um, Enterprise Community Partners is a national nonprofit um, that exists to make uh, a home and, and community places of pride, power, and belonging. We really work at the intersections of program, capital, and policy. Um, and as we, you know, most of people know Enterprise for the work that we do around affordable rentals, um, but home ownership, we believe, is really critical as we think about affordability, and it is also one of our priority areas um, as well. Um, and we support home ownership through a number of different tools that Enterprise leverages, including our capital tools in which we help to finance affordable projects, home ownership projects. We have a, a few affordable home ownership projects here in the Bronx. Um, Stevens Commons is a recent um, project that's a 58 unit project, affordable home ownership project that will serve households with the AMI between 60 and 80% AMI. Um, and when you think about home ownership, right, some of the challenges are what is affordable? How much can a family um, actually carry in terms of mortgage costs and all the other related uh, expenses of home ownership. And so we are really proud of the work that we're doing to support the creation of affordable home ownership. We have another project underway in Chelsea, Manhattan, um, which will also be an affordable home ownership cooperative project 
that's a 26 unit project um, that we're working with AFI to bring to fruition. And I think the challenge in New York has always been, how do you create new affordable home ownership? Um, and, and that there isn't enough supply. We know about the supply constraints. And so we really think bringing capital to the table to help build new affordable home ownership is it has to be part of the equation. It has to be part of what we think about, not just supporting new home buyers, but bringing more supply into the marketplace. And so that's an, uh, an important part of our work. Um, we're also doing a lot to support programmatic, innovative approaches around home ownership. We have an initiative right now um, working to support community land trusts, um, and community land trusts um, are, uh, you know, really trying to find a way to maintain permanency in home ownership, and working um, with community members who are interested in community land trusts. We have a community land trust initiative right now. Um, that initiative has helped to lead to the acquisition of over 170 units of affordable home ownership. Um, and some of those units are um, home ownership that comes with a rent to buy option. And so there's a lot of different innovative approaches to bringing on new home ownership um, opportunities and making sure that those opportunities remain affordable in the long term, not just that first home home buyer who's able to get in, but how do we protect the affordability as values of home continue to grow um, and we provide a stock, an affordable stock that other families down the line can purchase um, and, and be able to maintain. Um, we've also been working to support uh, new approaches around appraisal you, you heard uh, about the challenges on appraisal bias and how it impacts uh, wealth creation, wealth um, equity. Um, and so through our work with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, the Center for New York City Neighborhoods is developing a digital tool to move the appraisal process into more automation. It's really now heavily manual um, and there's a lot of subjectivity in that process and we think that that contributes to the bias and the challenges that have um, contributed to um, a loss of equity, um, especially for BIPOC households. So through that tool, the goal is to also incorporate alternative underwriting practices and have it, um, again, automize um, and so that we, we remove the individuals who are making a lot of subjective decisions um, and determining on who should qualify for a mortgage. And so we're really extremely excited about the prospects and bringing on that innovation. And we think that that helps would open up the door to more BIPOC households and low income households being able to qualify for a mortgage. Um, we've also been doing really a lot around making sure that we are uh, sharing and, and, and you know broadening folks' horizon and they understand about the systematic discrimination and the history of redlining and why it's still relevant that this isn't just a practice from 1960, 1940, 1970s, but it has a residual ongoing impact on home ownership in particular um, and housing choice and housing opportunity. And so we've worked with Undesign the Red Line. Um, Undesign the Red Line offers an exhibit that talks about the history of systematic discrimination and redlining tailored to the locality, right? So here in, in New York, we have focused on the practices of New York State and New York State entities and how they've contributed to the discrimination and the housing disparities that we see day to day. Um, and that's been incredibly powerful, not just to talk about how we've gotten to where we are today, but what are should be some of the solutions on the table to address that legacy of systematic discrimination and the impact that it continues to have day to day. Um, another thing I just want to point out is, you know, as as we talk about what should be within the sphere of home ownership and how do we, you know, step into our act, it is we think also really critically important. Um, New York State is an innovating state. We have source of income discrimination laws. We recognize that there's a lot that needs to be done to ensure equity and fairness and opportunity. Um, and we back it up with resources. And so we're really incredibly proud of New York being a leader in this field. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Holm. 
Our final panelist today is Ms. Megan Foe, Chief of the Social Justice Unit of the New York Office of the Attorney General. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, okay, good. Um, so again, my name is Megan Fox. I'm the Chief Deputy Attorney General for Social Justice at the New York State Attorney General's Office. And I wanted to bring um, the Attorney General's um, regards to all of you. Um, we are delighted to be with, her, with you here today and work with many of you um, throughout the year on sort of building more equitable communities. And I'm going to do my best with the PowerPoint. I'm not the best uh, multitasking in this particular way. Um, so the so the Office of the Attorney General has a range of bureaus that work in the fair housing space. Um, you know, we are the state's chief law enforcement officer, um, and we have um, both civil and criminal authority that sort of works on um, real estate fraud and home ownership issues. You're going to hear um, in a little bit from the chief of our Civil Rights Bureau, Sandra Park, about our enforcement work. So I'm going to sort of breeze through some of it um, to this morning so you don't hear uh, the same thing twice. Um, but we have the Civil Rights Bureau that sort of really focuses on the range of um, enforcing you know, the Fair Housing Act and other civil rights laws to address um, you know, discrimination in, in um, in lending and um, home ownership. We have the Consumer Frauds Bureau that has really taken the lead um, over many years looking at servicing issues and foreclosure prevention. And over the past um, couple of years has looked at sort of servicers response to homeowners in, during the um, COVID crisis and making sure that homeowners were getting the relief that they were entitled to. Um, the Real Estate Frauds Bureau that looks from a criminal's pr perspective at um, real estate and housing and um, fraud, and then the Protect Our Homes initiative, which um, is an expanding initiative this year for us to look at deed theft. And from a criminal and a civil perspective, how can we work with other agencies to to combat deed theft across the state? And while you know, for many years I worked, um, you know, with homeowners in Brooklyn around deed theft, we are now seeing it in many other parts of the state as um, you know real estate values increase and homeowners are really struggling to, to make ends meet. So um, that's us in a nutshell. Um, and so just briefly, some of the work and some of the issues that we have seen, this will not be sort of news to any of you, but we can continue to see redlining across the state, right? Lenders who are not lending in communities of color, and I'll talk about sort of some of the analysis we did on the Humda data um, recently, sort of um, in a few minutes. Um, and, you know, we have um, over the past couple of years worked with, you know, after the Newsday reporting about the sort of real estate broker discrimination on Long Island, we had several investigations out there and we continue to partner with the division and with uh, the Department of State to address discrimination um, through with real estate brokers. We have an expanding and sort of, um, you know, look at sort of appraisal bias as we are seeing more and more complaints around appraisal bias and looking at, you know, how that is also a barrier, not only to home purchase, but also refinancing. We had a lot of complaints, you know, when um, the interest rates were low, you know, of homeowners who were denied refinancing because of an appraisal issue. And now they're locked out of, of those sort of, you know, an ability to sort of lower their interest rates. Um, given the current sort of interest rate environment. We continue to see servicing abuses. We had a settlement last fall where um, a servicer was, you know, automatically deducting, you know, impermissible fees from, from homeowners' accounts, which, you know, for if you're a low or moderate income homeowner is, can really be financially destabilizing. And we brought tens of millions of dollars back to homeowners in New York State. 
And then looking at sort of, you know, real estate fraud, whether it's the sort of fraudulent or predatory high cost, you know, rent to own that we saw sort of upstate or sort of the deed theft and sort of other homeowner um, real estate and sort of home purchase scams that we continue to see, you know, across this, the city and throughout the state. And while enforcement is the core of our work, it's not everything that we do. Um, we are available to partner on policy initiatives and provide our expertise, you know, either to the legislature or sort of other state agencies. Um, we do a lot of education and outreach, you know, across the state to make sure that homeowners both know what their rights are, to know how to make complaints to us and sort of know what to look out for so that they can not, you know, so they can prevent, stop the scams before they happen, right? That is the sort of best way to address many of these issues. Um, and then we have also more recently started, you know, issuing some reports and our um, racial disparities in home ownership was a report that we recently filed, uh, it recently issued, where we looked at HUMDA data from, um, let's see, I think it was 2018 to 2021 to sort of look at what the, what the lending environment is in New York right now. Um, so much like um, Undesign the Red Line, you can, we continue to see deep disparities in lending and home ownership rates across um, the state. And I think if you looked at the maps that underline, undesigned the red line shows about redlining back in the 60s, and then you look at where lending is happening now, they're gonna be the same, right? And so that I think, you know, while nothing we saw in the Humda data in this report was surprising to us, you know, it is alarming that this is still where we are. Um, so we looked at where we tried to look at through the data, sort of what's happening at all, at different stages along the process. And we used the, the more recent expanded HUMDA data. So we had access to credit score when we were doing our analysis. And not surprisingly, we saw disparities at the submission of loan applications, approvals or denials, the pricing of loan products. Um, and that was both true for home purchase and refinance loans. I was like, I need glasses and then I don't need glasses at the same time, it's very confusing for me. So New York, as with many other states, uh, you know, there is sort of a wide gap in home ownership rates, right? White households, 67% own their homes compared to only 34% of households of color. And while this is true, a national trend, New York is, ha, shows some of the worst disparities. And these disparities are really the result of decades of discrimination in the lending industry, whether it's, you know, active public policies from the, you know, that the undesigned, the red line exhibit was showing, or it is lending discrimination, or it is just the, you know, the result of all of that discrimination means that people don't have access to, you know, the financial resources and um, to purchase a home right now. The, what the end result is, is that many black and brown homeowner um, families have been locked out of home ownership opportunities and that opportunity to build wealth. And it is true in every MSA in our state. And like I said, it is, you know, it is true at, at, if you look just along the home purchase and the lending process, you're going to see discrimination in every point of that process, at every decision point. So the first thing that we looked at was the pipeline, right? And we saw that Black and Latino um, applicants were underrepresented, you know, in, in the mortgage application pool. Um, you saw lenders receive fewer applications from Black and Latino applicants in their proportion of the state population with 7.6% of purchase applications from Black applicants and 9.5% from Latino applicants. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Um, but, you know, you need to look through you know, at the system at, as a whole to think about all the different reasons why a lender might not be getting mortgage applications. 
Is it because they don't have, you know, meaningful relationships in that community? We see, you know, in a lot of communities still there aren't, you know, banks, you know, in neighborhoods of color, right? So there aren't those sort of day-to-day -day relationships um, with people who are looking for a loan. There's, you know, gaps in marketing. There is gaps in the loan products that are being offered. And I think there are challenges and I think barriers with, you know, the what lenders are requiring in terms before, you know, in order to approve somebody for an application um, for a mortgage. And so all of these, you know, all of those reasons are, you know, come together, but the reality is that the app, there are not enough applicants, you know, um, of applicants of color, you know, applying for mortgages at most of the of these institutions. And then you also see that there are more applicants of color being denied credits for home, pur home purchase loans. And this is true even when you control for credit score. And so while we didn't have access to all of their criteria that lenders consider, right, when they're looking at whether they're going to qualify some, someone for a mortgage, we did have all the big ones. And I think the trend is consistent and it's, it's consistent with what we hear from individuals too, is that many, many um, homeowners of color are being denied loans at a disproportionate rate to white applicants. So you look again, you know, you look, we look, we control for credit score, we, we controlled for loan to value and income, and this disparities remain. And that is, these are disparities across the state in every MSA. The next thing we looked at is what the cost of the credit was. You know, when I was doing foreclosure prevention work and we were like really dealing with a lot of the sort of subprime predatory loans you saw, you know, homeowners of color who were just paying, you know, tens of thousands, you know, if not more in, in extra costs and fees and, um, and you know, in, in interest rate payments um, for loans that they were getting. And that, dis that pattern and that disparity continues even after the foreclosure crisis, right? So when we look at um, applicants, you know, you see that they, that black and Latino homeowners are paying more for their mortgages than white applicants. We did see, you know, and this is also again, not surprising, I don't think, is that more homeowners of color are accessing FHA loans than conventional mortgages. And this, you know, is true at every credit score band, right? And so whether it's, you know, that the brokers that people are going to ha are more likely to sort of offer FHA loans or whether it's they don't have access to the capital they need to get a conventional loan or they're being steered into FHA loans, which is certainly something we've seen over the decades. You know, the reality is FHA loans are an incredibly important product, but they are also higher, they're more costly, right? And so if you can qualify for a conventional loan, you shouldn't be choosing an FHA loan. And you get even at sort of at every credit score, we are seeing sort of um, more homeowners of color look, accessing FHA loans than than other mortgage products. Um, and this is costing, you know, whether it's conventional loans, FHA loans, or other types of mortgages, this is costing homeowners of color tens of thousands of extra dollars, you know fees and, you know, collectively hundreds of millions of dollars in interest payments um, for these higher cost loans. And that's, you know, money that you don't have for all of the other expenses that, you know, you need to, to sort of support your family. So we also then looked at refinance loans and the story is the same, right? There are fewer, you know, homeowners applying for refinance loans those loans are, you know, they are more likely to be denied refinance loans and the refinance loans that um, that people of color are getting across the state are more costly. So if you think about what that means right now, right, homeowners who were denied in 2019 and 2020 for an, a refinance loan are were locked in to higher interest payments than many white bar borrowers across the state. Um, 
And so there's a lot more detail and data to, in the report. I encourage you all to, to take a look at it. But, you know, this is not anything new, right? Everybody in this room knew what I just said before you walked in this room. Um, but I think it's important to talk about because this is not an accident. We didn't get here by accident. We got here because there is pervasive and systemic discrimination in the lending system, right? And that, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the myriad of reasons that that has happened across the state, we're in a moment where, you know, particularly in the sort of interest rate environment we're in, particularly with what housing costs, you know, are right now, we need a very proactive and aggressive you know, reinvestment in communities of color and sort of, you know, policy decisions to make home ownership more, you know, accessible for um, homeowners of color across New York State. Um, so here are some of the recommendations that that we put in our report. I'm sure there are many, many ideas sort of in this room about what we could do together. But just to sort of highlight a few, even though you know, I don't think enforce, you know, enforcement is not the, the, the exclusive answer to this. More enforcement is critical to make sure that the actors in this space are serving communities of color. Um, and so we do think that we need to sort of strengthen our existing fair housing laws, you know, state fair housing laws. We also really need a true um, unfair and deceptive acts and practice consumer protection statute in New York State. Right now, we only have authority and you know, protections in New York State for deceptive acts, we really need sort of unfair and abusive um, protections as well for consumers. We need to sort of, as um, folks were talking about today, really sort of continue to expand affordable mortgage products that both address homeowners who can't you know, put down that down payment, but also the, you know, address the sort of interest rates that we are looking at right now. Community development financial institutions have done amazing work across the state, whether it's in Rochester or other places, to sort of reach um, people who have been unbanked or un, you know underserved by the financial, serv um, the sort of you know mainstream financial services institutions, and we need to continue to support them. And you know we really need to look at public banking and other solutions like that that will take public dollars and reinvest them in communities. You know, because that is, you know, the, the extraction of wealth from communities of color across the state has done long-term damage, and we need to continue to think about ways that we can reinvest um, dollars back into communities so that they, they, we can really truly build equi equitable neighborhoods across the state. Um, that was a whirlwind tour of our report. Um, happy to answer any questions that, that you have. And you know, encourage you to reach out to us if you have any issues that you want to talk about. We are here to partner with you, whether it's on an enforcement matter, a community education, you know, event, or some some other idea you have. Um, we really do deeply appreciate all the work that you do and um, and working with you. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fox. We still have a few minutes left. Does anybody have any questions for our panelists? Okay, I'm coming right over. Hello, hello. My name is Vanika Mock, and I have a major question that I have not heard addressed. The new ruling on how commission is paid to brokers agents will directly impact first time home buyers as well as minority home buyers. And it'll put a lot of extra pressure on real estate brokers and agents. What is being done to mitigate those issues? Should I explain more in detail about what that means for people? Or do you understand what I'm talking about? Okay, so what's going on with the new ruling? It started out in Missouri. And what it basically says is no longer will sellers be able to pay the commission up front. As typical, you'll see in the listing, agree the listing online, that the agent will be paid, the buyer's agent will be paid a certain commission paid by the seller. Now we're going to have to negotiate our commission as we submit our offer, which means for buyer's agents, you're going to have a lot of situations where you're going to have someone possibly from another company looking at that offer and saying, you know what, we're not going to take that offer. It's from whatever company, or we're going to offer them 
a half a percent or one percent as opposed to two, three percent or whatever the case may be. That's going to have a negative impact, a huge impact on that first time home buyer who may not be able to pay the commission two or three percent or whatever that one person, whatever. And when we go and try to negotiate that commission and have the seller pay it, they may say, you know what? Nope, we're not going to pay it. Have your buyer pay it. How many first time home buyers have that extra money to pay? And I don't hear anyone discussing this issue. And it's going to have a major, major impact on the very same people we're trying to help. Who, who would like to address that? Ms. Ford? Uh, so, so it's a relatively new ruling, correct? And, and I hope folks can hear me. And so uh, Sony May does not work on policy. And uh, some of the panelists here can certainly work. Uh, sorry. And so some of the panelists uh, also have another angle. But I will say, uh, just from Sony May's perspective, in terms of our mortgage products for first-time home buyer, even though uh, a, a home buyer is required to, let's say, put 3% down, what Sony May requires is that it's only 1% personal funds, right? The rest can come from Sony May's grants and subsidies and other grants and subsidies. So if home buyers and uh, are using our product, they will have more of their own cash available for something like a commission, right? Because for our underwriting purposes, you only need 1% of your personal funds. And so if you were covering the rest of your down payment with $30,000 from Sony May, perhaps another $15,000 from another nonprofit, a first time home buyer will have more of their own cash towards expenses like a uh, buyer's commission. Another thing that, that I think is, uh, that Sony May can do is that actually our process is is relatively fast, right? So a first time home buyer is on a level playing field with another buyer in terms of getting it closed. Often there is a misunderstanding about that. So if we are giving a first time home buyer low cost mortgage, low interest rate, we are capping the fees that our lenders are allowed to charge first time home buyers. They are capped at nine hundred dollars for a transaction. We are trying to leave as much of the first time home buyers cash in their pocket for the other expenses that we cannot control uh, so that they can move forward with that transaction. You're right. It is a significant issue. There are, we have to tackle it in many different ways. But today, that is what Sony May has to offer. And we will continue to strategize on ways and products where we can assist and support first time home buyers. And so some of our other panelists may also have some any, anyone else want to add? Yeah, I, I, I did, I did want to um, add here that, you know, that ruling was really intended to lower the cost all around in terms of selling a home um, and purchasing the home. And I understand the practices. It was a fixed rate commission that could be split between a buyer's agent and a seller's agent to the extent. Right. Um, but, you know, when we think about the cost to get to purchase a home, there is a lot of fees and other costs beyond just the price of the home. Um, and so we have to pay attention to unintended consequences. Does it freeze out first time home buyers who are going to be constricted and, and what they can bring to the table in terms of the closing related costs? the minimum down payment that's expected based on the purchase price. But just looking at, you know, um, that home buying in and of itself is an expensive proposition. Um, and so just looking at the, the sphere of, are, are there things that we could do to lower the fees for home buying, I think is an important place for us all to be involved in. Ma'am, ma we're actually going to have uh, panelist uh, later today and tomorrow that may be able to address directly your issues. No, it's a really important issue because as realtors, we're allowed to make a living and why can't we make it in one of the best markets in the world? Like we're capped as opposed to other people who are making a living and helping the public, why do we have to be limited? So as she said, you have to convince the homeowner to pay 
part of the commission because it would work. It's a marketing tool. We were able to do that recently. They didn't want to, but we negotiated a lot with him. Do we have any further questions? Hi, um, my name is Hersey Rain and I'm a realtor. This is not about real estate. Um, I wanted to know more about the programs. Uh, if we can have an event specifically for my community in upper Manhattan, where there's, you know, lifelong renters for like 20, 30, 40, 50 years that have been paying rent on time and don't know about the programs. They're now seniors. They probably have more opportunities. So how would I be able to reach out to any of you um, about hosting an event in my community? Uh, so at sonymay.ny.gov, uh, there is a tab that says Sony May in your community. You can go to that page. You'll see where we are. And also just click request a Sony May presenter. We do these types of events all the time. I was just in the, uh, in the Bronx yesterday. I will be in, in Harlem tomorrow. Um, uh, we want to get this message out, and we certainly partner with uh, realtors. We have a MythBuster series that's coming up for realtors, explaining how they can use this in their business and how a Sony May loan um, is just as powerful and in some ways more powerful for, for closing transactions. So uh, we welcome, uh, you know, have, have MetroCard, we'll travel, right? We'll be there. And, um, Thank you. And there, there's also a nonprofit known as uh, Neighborhood Housing Services of NYC, and their focus and goal and mission is to provide um, home ownership for people of color in New York City. Um, they too can be a resource that would provide information on what it takes to own a home, uh, their down payment assistance program, um, and any other home ownership programs that they have. Neighborhood Housing Services of, of New York City, of NYC. Neighborhood Housing Services. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm Danielle Bookbinder with Keller Williams Realty. Um, and I'm from one of the worst three areas in the state, Buffalo, New York, when it comes to discrimination. And one of the things I'm a little curious about is what fees in particular that are being charged more for people of color on loans and what can we do as people in the industry when we're seeing loan estimates question those things so that they aren't a problem. So um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, we looked We looked at all the fees that are reported on HMDA, right, and combined them. So we didn't look at fee by fee and which fees were more costly. We just looked at the total fees charged um, for for homeowners, you know, for white homeowners and and homeowners of color, um, and I can see if there's sort of additional detail that we can provide you. I don't have that sort of information, the breakdown in front of me, um, but I, I I do think that it is important just to question the fees. If you you all have a tremendous amount of experience about what loans costs, right? For for all of the um, you know the the people that are you know you're assisting in purchasing a home or refinancing and just doing your own comparison and really understanding how the banks are calculating those fees and what is going into um you know what's behind the the how they're determining those calculations i think it's incumbent on all of us to to look at that you know together and sort of see you know, why is somebody being charged, you know, um, you know, more in closing costs than somebody else and sort of what's the driver there and how can we negotiate um, those down? So I'm happy to sort of, you know, brainstorm more with you um, and see if we can provide some additional detail um, about sort of exactly where the disparity, if there are certain fees that are driving those disparities. But I think just, um, you know, we looked at it sort of more holistically to look at sort of systemically what was happening in the industry. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, thank you. I would like to understand if when a person from a minority looks for a mortgage, 
has to deal with government agencies. And if the way they deal with government agencies is efficient, is transparent, and with uh, um, user-friendly bureaucracy, because all my experience as a broker in dealing with agencies that provide vouchers is that there is total reticence. There are many different fields, I would say. Uh, what is the English word for fields? Uh, fiefdoms. And um, each one has its own bureaucracy. And it's very difficult for us to work with uh, government agencies. That could be one of the reasons why there is less acceptance of applications from people of color. It's not personal, it's not anything to do with the person, but with the institutions that supposedly represents them and that is doing a very bad job. And I think the truth is, I'm thinking of the world of the vouchers. The vouchers is an ecosystem with the public housing agencies in one hand and the landlords, the wallet and the home. And then you have the real estate brokers and the case managers who uh, make the system work. Now, I think there is a lot of bias in this world because all I see is pointing fingers to brokers and to landlords. I never hear uh, any public discussion about caseworkers ghosting their clients. And yeah, and uh, <clears throat> if we want, and I think we all want equity and fairness, we need to have efficiency, transparency, and accessibility. Instead, now we have chaos, reticence, and bureaucracy. So what are we doing to improve the system so that, for example, artificial intelligence can create a hub to answer to the many questions that vouchers holders have and have no response? And they write to Facebook groups where you can really see who the culprit of the dysfunctionality of the voucher is. When you hear the clients, you hear mostly complaints about the agencies and the PH public authorities, uh, public housing authorities. Would anyone like to address that? It was more of a statement than anything, but. I think that's pretty much the last question of the day. Glasses. I want to thank everyone for attending today and especially uh, thank our panelists. I just want to share um, a little bit of my personal history. I live in Long Island, but I actually grew up here in the South Bronx, lived in the projects for about 10 years. And in the late 80s, my family was able to purchase a home through the uh, Nehemiah program. And so my family is actually a success story for you champions of housing. So thank you on a personal note. We have to transition to the next panel, but please feel free to connect with our panelists for questions and further conversation. Thank you all. What a fantastic morning. I want to say thank you to all our panelists. How about we give them another round of applause? So this afternoon, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Adolfo Carrion Jr., Commissioner of New York City Housing, Preservation and Development. A fellow Bronx native, Commissioner Carrion has spent his professional career working to build and improve historically marginalized communities here in the Bronx in other areas of New York City and around the country. Prior to joining HPD, Commissioner Carrion served as Regional Administrator for Region 2 of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Deputy Assistant to Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, and Director of the White House Office of Urban Affairs. Commissioner Carrion's work resulted in the establishment of a White House Urban Policy Working Group and the first interagency review in 30 years of federal government policy and funding. Prior to his tenure in the federal government, 
Mr. Carrion served as Bronx Borough President and as a member of the New York City Council. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Carrion. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Miranda. Good afternoon, everyone. You're going to get quizzed on my bio if you were talking while Denise was speaking. Just kidding, just kidding. It's good to be home in the Bronx. Any people, any any Bronxites in the house? All right, all three of y'all. That means that there's people from other parts of New York State in the house, in the Bronx. And you're here for an overnight, right? You're here for two days. So uh, enjoy the borough. I don't know if you know that the best little Italy in the city is a couple of blocks away. So you should enjoy that. And the New York Botanical Garden is across the street. And I know that John Calvelli said good morning and welcome to you all this morning. He's a good friend of mine, but he probably would get angry at the fact that I'm marketing the New York Botanical Garden at the Bronx Zoo. But what a great venue. Um, this is a, a very special place. Um, this is the premier uh, zoological park of the Wildlife Conservation Society. And when I was borough president of the Bronx, I spent a lot of time in this room at community gatherings and meetings and celebrations. So it's, it's, it's good to be back and it's always good to be home. Um, and for those of you who are from other parts of New York State, um, I hope that your visit will um, will defy all the stereotypes that you've heard about a place called the Bronx, which carries um, an interesting history as it relates to urban places. Um, you know, I, I suffer from the temptation here of talking only about the Bronx, uh, but you're not here for that and I'm not here for that. I do serve as the commissioner of the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Um, our mission, our DNA, our North Star, the reason that we exist, the, the development of a fair housing plan called Where We Live is the reason for our existence. And I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, the core tenet of all the work we do is to achieve an environment and a city, and hopefully by extension, a state commissioner, where there is fair access to affordable, safe housing for families and individuals all across the great state of New York. Um, most of the housing that uh, HPD supports in terms of new construction or preservation, 90% of it is for extremely low income households, very low income households, and low income households. And you know, and if you read any paper in the state of New York, or you listen to Governor Hochul talking about the dearth of affordable housing supply, let alone general housing and market rate housing supply, if you've heard Mayor uh, Adams talk about it. If you see, if you've read some of uh, 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 newspapers recently, you know that we are at a very critical, critical point in our history. Um, what we do as an agency for the city of New York is we conduct a housing vacancy survey every three years, just about. Sometimes interrupted by things like a global pandemic, but otherwise like clockwork every three years. And what we ask is, what is New York City's vacancy rate? And is it below that critical 5% mark that will, by legislation and statute, create the environment of a housing emergency? And we, you know, those of you who've, who've been around in, in this as advocates, as housers, as agency officials, uh, as some of you might might have held different types of offices in your community, different responsibilities, as policy people, know that we have hovered just somewhere between two and a half percent to five percent for many years. Um, this year, 
we are at 1.4%, 1.4% vacancy rate in New York City. Now, if you are a low income or moderate income family in New York City, your vacancy rate, because that's a blended rate, right? So you have households that are higher income. If you are, if you take the lower income cohort, you're talking about virtual zero, virtual zero in terms of the availability. And in a market with 2 million apartments, there's about 30,000 units available, which is absurd. It doesn't make sense. We can't, we can't run a state like this. We can't run a city like this. And so the most compelling thing that we need to do with our federal partners uh, with our and we lean on HUD in a big way uh, with our state partners is to produce more affordable housing. Our, our administration has made, had made, has made a huge commitment um, over a 10-year period, a, a, a multi-billion dollar, in excess of $20 billion of investment in the creation of new affordable housing for the next 10 years. It's still not enough. It just won't, we can't catch up. So right now we're we're up in the legislature trying to get more tools and we're all crossing our fingers, hoping that they come out of those negotiations between the governor, the, the speaker of, of the assembly and the leader of the Senate, that they come out of the, these negotiations with some tools for us to be able to do our job and for you to be able to do your justice work in ensuring that when people do get into housing, they are, that they are treated, if they are able to get into housing and get over the, 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 the discrimination and the blocks that are created, that they can be treated with fairness, dignity, honor, and respect. So in the, in the face of this historic vacancy rate, we know that we need to build more low-cost housing. We need to preserve more low-cost housing and this is how we affirmatively further fair housing. Um, when the last president of the United States, which will remain nameless today, can you believe where we are? It's, it's incredible. Uh, I was telling Denise, the commissioner, I just turned 63 in March. And I, you know, in, in my, 20s and 30s and 40s, I was like, wow, you know, we're making progress. We're moving in the right direction. We're knocking down barriers. We're becoming a more just and fair society. And then this knucklehead comes around. I'm sorry. Thank you, sister. I'm not sorry. He's worse than a knucklehead. And one of the things that he did, which was insidious, was he bailed on affirmatively fit furthering fair housing. I worked for President Obama. I was in the White House as the director of the White House Office of Urban Affairs. And one of the things that we did was craft this concept of using the Department of Housing and Urban Development as a tool to affirmatively further fair housing and work with municipalities and co counties across the country to be able to create those kinds of environments to treat people fairly and justly. And then he comes around and wipes it all away. Well, guess what? New York City doubled down. We made a commitment, we got to work, and for six years, we worked with communities all across the country, hundreds and hundreds of people across every neighborhood in New York City, uh, 150 organization, uh, organiza community-based organizations, many, many, many meetings to come up with our own fair housing, affirmatively furthering fair housing plan for New York City. And it's called Where We Live NYC. And those of you who are from town might be familiar with this. It is our guiding principle. This plan is our guiding principle. And at, at this stage, we are about to put forth, we're about to re-engage with the residents of New York City to start a conversation about how to improve on the work we've done uh, over the, uh, with this plan. 
our work and this plan is imbued in action through every team in our agency. Policy, neighborhood planning and land use, new construction, preservation, even in the enforcement of the rules, we especially lean on tenant protection. And I'll give you a little story, but I wanna tip my hat to somebody in this room who was outstanding in terms of the work that was done with where we live that led the, uh, the operation on the housing vacancy survey that identified the, the emergency, the lowest housing vacancy rate since 1968. We're living in it right now. And her, she is the Associate Commissioner for Housing Policy for HPD, and her name is Lucy Joffe. She's right here. Give her a round of applause. Thank you, Lucy, for the wonderful work. <clears throat> but Lucy doesn't fly alone. We also have the Director of Fair Housing for HPD, Al Tariq Shabazz. Al, stand up and just wave so everybody can see you. You know, the, the secret you'll learn, Commissioner, is that if you identify your, your best people, Commissioner, in the crowd and you have them stand up, then the people go to them and you can get out of the room to the next appointment. <laughs> and we also have... Um, our fair housing policy analyst, a young man with an incredible amount of promise and commitment, Bryson McEachin. Bryson, stand up and wave so everybody can talk to you later. <laughs> Imbued in everything we do is the concept of fair housing. Um, but I, you know, I don't want to talk to you so much as an official, and I, I want to tell you how personal this is to me. You know, my folks came from Puerto Rico in the 1950s. Papi came in 50, mommy came in 52. They didn't know each other. They met here. They got married. They rented a, a sub-basement apartment in a tenement on uh, South 2nd Street in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. The Williamsburg of Brooklyn to, of today is not the Williamsburg of the 1960s. <laughs> Those of you who know New York City. It was a hurting place. The quality of the housing was horrible. We, I, and I don't have any memory of that. They showed me pictures. Uh, but we were able, because of investment by government in trying to pull people up the ladder, we were able to move into Jacob Reese houses in the Lower East Side. And we lived by the FDR Drive. The, we were like waterfront people. We had the river there, the park. We thought... Oh, this is beautiful. It was actually a very good place. The neighborhood was great. The local school was walk down the street a block and a half away. You could walk to the school. You knew everybody. Everybody knew you. So we got an opportunity because of public housing, because of federal investment that is now pretty much gone in uh, public housing. Uh, uh, the, the national government has surrendered that, unfortunately. And we can, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. We can talk about it. But we were able to move into safe, sound housing. And then from there, we moved into a HUD project on 12th Street and Avenue C in Loisaida. And, and, and it was a brand new development, a supermarket at the base, a, a nice little plaza, um, wa walkable to school, near family and friends. And we were then able to squirrel enough savings away to to, to buy a new house in the country in the North Bronx. And we bought a row house. And the reason we were able to buy a row house, this poor family, uh, English was a second language to my parents. Mi, prim mi primera lengua fue español y todavía hablo español. Because of my family, my parents speaking Spanish only in the home and, and, and having to learn English. Um, but facing all of those challenges and difficulties, they were able, because of the FHA mortgage program, the Federal, Federal Housing Administration program, to squirrel away 3% down payment that allowed us to buy a home. We were low-income homeowners. We have a program at HPD for low-income homeowners, moderate-income homeowners, to protect homeowners, to cultivate homeownership. And a part of our hope and our mission as we protect 
you know, the fair housing opportunities and create, create the environment of fair housing is that many, many, many of those uh, tenants, many of those low and moderate income families will have the seeds of success and be able to become homeowners. And that this story gets repeated over and over and over. I have four beautiful children. I just became a grandpa in uh, last May. I want to show you her picture. You know how it is. Right? It's like, you got to see this. Here's my, um, but all my kids, you know, grew up with the notion that they're going to keep progressing. That's our, that's our job. But I, Adolfo and his sisters and our family could not have gotten here without that investment from our local government, from our state government, and from our federal government, and from all the advocates that protected those opportunities as we went along the way. That's the work that we're doing. So for my family, this is, and, and myself, this is real. You know, in, in, despite the environment we're in, I'm optimistic about the prospects for fair housing in the future. But it's it doesn't happen by accident. It happens because people work very, very hard at it. So we released the Where We Live NYC, the city's comprehensive fair housing plan, based on six years of work all over the city with many people. And our charge was to identify meaningful actions to overcome patterns of segregation and foster communities free from barriers to restrict access to opportunity. That's our philosophical foundation. And as I told you, we, we held many, many uh, communities, uh, uh, community meetings. We, we're, we're continued in this next phase. We're, we, we continue our commitment to this uh, community-based approach. At its core, our prescription in this conversation is to listen to communities, pursue every opportunity to build housing in every corner of the city, in every neighborhood of the city, and ensure that all New Yorkers have real housing choice. <clears throat> and so I will close with this. Um, our, you're gonna be hearing uh, about something called City of Yes. And if you're not from New York City, I hope that you guys will copy what we're doing elsewhere in the state. The city of yes for housing opportunity is a fresh look at an old zoning code that was fundamentally classist and racist and kept affordable housing and people of color out of many, many communities across the city. It was, it was, it was crafted in the year of my birth in 1961, and it has never changed. There's been some tweaks to some language, but it is fundamentally a zoning code of 1961. And what we're, we, we're coming forth with a plan that says, we need to modernize this, we need to build higher, we need to build denser, we need to build around transportation nodes, we need to allow affordable housing in low and uh, low density communities. We need to ensure, we need to give uh, homeowners an opportunity to possibly add an accessory dwelling unit behind their home and be able to rent it at an affordable rate to a family member or to just about anybody. And it gives us the opportunity to build protections around those renters in those spaces. So you're gonna be hearing about this, about, about our, our ability to build taller and, if, and giving bonuses for affordable housing and building in, in the central business districts. So, Keep an eye out, and for those of you who are New York City residents, show up at community meetings and, and help us get this message out that we need to build affordable housing in every corner of the city. Our legislative agenda is about fair housing. Right now we're up in Albany saying, give us an incentive so we can build more new housing. Give us uh, the authority to uh, to com convert office buildings and commercial buildings into residential buildings. Give us the authority to, to build taller in Manhattan in the high cost areas. And when we give you the, the right to build taller, you need to add affordable housing to those buildings so that we allow people opportunities in high cost areas of the city to also have affordable living. Our fight for more resource resources from Washington, D.C. We're asking the federal government to invest more. I think we have the right 
administration, and I think we have the right president in place right now, and I'm not supposed to be political because I'm a government official right now, and I'm not supposed to say that stuff. So I won't. I never said that. Delete. What I will say is the choices we make as citizens, the choices we make as, as New Yorkers matter. Um, we, we are doing the work of, of building a more just and fair society. You all, in the many manifestations of your work, are doing the same. And I, I want to say as a New Yorker and as the commissioner for housing in New York, I want to say thank you to you for the work of justice that you're doing each and every day to try to make New York City and New York State a fairer and more just state. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. But what, are we gonna start now? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna give you a minute to get seated if you're not already seated. And welcome back after our lunch break. I hope you enjoyed it. I heard the food was very good. So um, I hope that everyone had a chance to try it. So my name is Jocelyn Spratt. I'm the director of the division's housing litigation unit. It's a newly created unit. It's my pleasure to be with you and to be with this I'm sure you'll agree shortly, very impressive panel. We're going to be talking today about what's been titled the elephant in the room, source of income discrimination. I have to say, I think that's probably the first time that the term elephant in the room has been used in a zoo. So please make note of that. So source of, more seriously, source of income discrimination is a growing problem throughout New York State and throughout the country. This type of bias, unfortunately, impacts some of the most vulnerable in our communities, veterans and other people with disabilities, low-income families with small children, and survivors of victim violence. All of those groups are likely to be able to take advantage of a voucher and just as likely to encounter discrimination when a landlord says, I don't take vouchers. Or at the Division of Human Rights, within the past year, nearly a third of the complaints filed with us involved this type of bias. So for an in-depth discussion of how we're all working to combat this invidious discrimination and eliminate it. I'd like you to join me in welcome, welcome in this panel. And I'm going to introduce them not in seating order, but in speaking order. So maybe I could try to stand behind them. <laughs> First, you're gonna hear from Marlene Zarfis. Marlene is the executive director of Westchester Residential Opportunities. And then you're gonna hear from Ashley Eberhardt, which who is, I'm sorry, I, didn't. <laughs> I apologize. She is the unusual title, head of product for Unlock New York City, which she'll explain to you. And also with her is an advisor to that same organization, Velvet Johnson Ross. And this is Ms. Ross. Uh, also, you're going to hear from Larissa Story, who is seated at the end of the table. She is the New York home-based director for Catholic Charities of New York. And at the other end of the table is Stephen Abrams Downey. He'll be speaking to you as a representative for New York State Homes and Community Renewal where he uh, is an assistant counsel. And finally, a member of the division staff, Chelsea John, who runs our housing investigations unit. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to your panel. Marlene, do you want to hold me? Sure, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Welcome back from lunch and my generally downtime of the day when I tend to fall asleep between two and three. And I will try not to do that. And I will try not to do that to any of you. Um, I'm the executive director of Westchester Residential Opportunities. We call ourselves WRO because it takes too long to say the whole name. We started 55 years ago as a fair housing organization. And that still is the heart of what we do. And that's where my heart is, frankly. Um, but we've expanded over the years. And now we have an eviction prevention program. We have independent living for people with mental illness. We have mortgage default counseling, first time home buying, which is incredibly popular actually, fair housing of course, aging in place, which we're doing with Habitat for Humanity, NYC Westchester. It's obviously for people to be able to age in place. We are able to make their homes more accessible. And we are now doing affirmative marketing of housing for Westchester County. So any developments that have county funding in them, we are doing the affirmative marketing to a, a group of nine adjacent communities. The goal, of course, is to market to those least likely to apply. So let me tell you about our fair housing program since that's why we're here. We do education and outreach complaint intakes and testing. And the complaints, are, the intakes are, no, I'm sorry. Um, most of the complaints that we get are source of, of income. The next largest group of complaints that we get is disability. So source of income is, violations are rampant, sorry to say, in Westchester County, and as you've heard elsewhere. So of the 197 intakes that we did in 2023, 45% of them were from source of income. And we know anecdotally that there is so much more that just does not get reported. 23% um, were a flat out, we don't, take we don't take vouchers, period. Clearly illegal, but that's what people hear. So before I talk a little bit about testing, which is the other part of our fair housing program, I wanted to let you know that when we get a complaint, if a client really wants the apartment, the unit, we will work with them to get it rather than, you know, trying to negotiate. Well, we do try to negotiate, but rather than going to litigation, we want to get the complainant, the client, what they want. So that's the first thing we do. And we talk to the housing provider, we explain what the law is, and we try to work things out. If that doesn't work, sometimes we need to go to litigation, but that's coming in a minute. So our testing results for 2023, we did, sorry, we did 340 source of income tests. Almost all were by phone because you can do that. It doesn't matter. They don't have to see you. It doesn't matter what you look like, what you sound like. You just want to know if they will take your voucher. So what we found from this testing is 50% of the time, it, the applicant is just told, okay, the decision will rest with, with the system. 20% of the time, once they hear that you have a voucher, they say there's a waiting list. That's after they've heard voucher. 20% um, of the agents or the landlords don't understand that when you have a full voucher, which is gonna cover 100% of the rent, that they don't need to know your credit score. They don't need to know your income. The government is paying the whole thing. And then the last 10% basically just no Section 8, period. So, as I mentioned, if a client really wants the unit, we try to work with the housing provider. But uh, when, when they don't care anymore, we find that if there's a violation and the housing provider is not willing to work with us, sometimes the way to get them to work with you is through their wallet which is where litigation comes in. 
as somebody was talking about during the last patter, um, panel, enforcement is so key. And one of the ways of enforcing is unfortunately through litigation. So there are two cases that I wanna just briefly discuss with you that we did recent litigation. The first one was one that we did um, in New York Supreme Court, coterminous investigation with the New York State Attorney General. It was a lawsuit against a new Rochelle in Westchester based uh, landlord and his several related entities, management company, et cetera. And we based this on both Westchester County and the state's source of income laws. We began the investigation in 2021, and it began with an ad, an ad, I believe it was Craigslist, and all it said at the bottom was, sorry, no Section 8, period. Um, we worked with them. We negotiated a settlement two years later, and it included most of the customary terms, like um, payment to WRO, and to our attorneys, damages, and internal policy revisions. We wanna make sure that they change their policies in a way that this isn't gonna happen again. We also require that they participate in periodic fair housing training, which every fair housing organization, when you settle, you put that in. For some reason, they think that having to sit for a few hours once every year or so is like the most horrible thing in the world, but it's not the most horrible thing. And people actually find after they've done the training that they've learned and they don't necessarily hate us. So that's, that's a good thing. And another thing that we customarily require is affirmative uh, agreements not to discriminate going forward. But this, this case had a few additional terms that were really special and unusual. It included commitments to WRO and to the Attorney General that are designed to increase equal housing opportunities for voucher holders. So it's remedial in effect. Um, they included setting aside 20 rental units in high opportunity areas for recipients of housing subsidies publicly advertising any available units in buildings they own or manage with a statement confirming that the government vouchers are accepted and not charging a voucher holder any broker's fee and not charging any excessive application or other fees that might discourage a voucher holder from applying. So I, I think this case, which as I said, was with the attorney general's office, really can make an impact going forward. And then we have one more that I just wanna mention briefly. It's ongoing and it's with the New York State Division of Human Rights. We filed a complaint, we, WRO, filed a complaint with the State Division against Down Home, Dawn Homes Management and we allege source of income discrimination. So Dawn Homes, is, is big. Um, they have 36 apartment, apartment buildings in New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut. They've got over 2,000 units in all the Albany area alone. We did a multi-year testing investigation of seven of their, their complexes. And that took place between 2019 and 2021. Just to give you some idea of like how slow sometimes this has to work. Um, Testers were told at these developments, these complexes, no vouchers. Some of them were told there's a minimum income requirement of three times the full monthly rent or three and a half times. So if they are looking for the voucher holders portion itself, not the government portion, to equal three times the monthly rent, these people would not qualify for vouchers. So they are in effect immediately discriminating against them and keeping them out. Um, I don't know if that's intentional or not, that's, but that's, what, that's the effect. If you have a voucher and they're only looking at your portion, you are not going to be able to rent there. 
And there was also steering. So this complex, these different seven buildings that we tested would steer people away. We, you know, we, there's nothing here for you, but go to the other, the other building down the street. So this is still an ongoing case. We've held negotiations. The next step would be filing in state court. So I want to thank you all for listening and think about how important source of income is. It's really, it could be such a great thing and it can also hurt a lot of people. I'm sorry. Before we continue, I want to correct an, a really glaring omission on my part, and that is that I neglected the center of the table and a critical component of this panel, Larissa Story. I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on, big problem. Laura Harding, who is the president of Erase Racism, a Long Island-based organization that is a critical partner in the fight against discrimination generally, and of course, source of income. So I apologize, and we now all can welcome her individually, right? Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker is Miss Everhart. And uh, she, as I mentioned earlier, is from Unlock New York. So please tell us, what is Unlock New York and why are you the product director? <laughs> the question of the day. Um, Manny is going to get our slides up and then we'll get started. Okay, thank you all so much for having us today. Uh, my name is Ashley Eberhardt, and I am here with my colleague Velvet Johnson-Ross. Um, and we're going to be talking to you about the work that we've been doing for the last few years in community with tenants who are directly impacted by source of income discrimination. At Unlock NYC, we build mobile tools that help New Yorkers who have vouchers create a paper trail when they're facing source of income discrimination. Um, we formed our women-led tech nonprofit in 2019 uh, when our founding team talked to over 100 New Yorkers who were searching for housing. Um, and no matter what conversation we started, we ended up talking about source of income discrimination. Um, during many of these conversations, we were just hearing stories about people being ghosted as soon as they mentioned their voucher or turned down or treated unfairly or even, frankly, being, um, you know, being met with a lot of stereotypes around what type of tenant they would be because they have a voucher. Um, however, that wasn't the end of the story. We also met some amazing tenants who were organizing um, around knowing their fair housing rights, being really clear about what those were, recording every single phone call they were having with landlords and brokers, and sending reports to city and state agencies and legal service providers um, who could do something about the, the um, discrimination that they were facing. Uh, many of them were benefiting from early intervention programs that were run by the New York City Commission, Commission on Human Rights, who were, like we heard just now, uh, really mediating at the point of source of income discrimination and trying to get a fair housing opportunity. Uh, others were using their stories for advocacy um, at the city and the state level, and, and sometimes even on the national stage, or pursuing litigation, which is their right as a, as a right to file city. Um, together, we worked with these tenants and saw an opportunity to make it easier to keep a really strong and organized paper trail when you're facing discrimination. Um, and that's exactly what we built. Uh, the heart of Unlock NYC is our rights recorder. It's a free, easy to use mobile tool that helps tenants with vouchers build a paper trail when they are facing discrimination. Um, so far, about 700 New Yorkers, from undergraduates at CUNY to seniors who are searching for affordable housing, um, have successfully used our rights recorder tool to capture evidence of housing discrimination, make a report, and really do something about it. Uh, since 2021, we've received over 2,000 reports um, of unfair denials from all five boroughs of New York City um, and every single uh, city council district. Um, and we've seen that from private landlords to the, uh, to the most notorious large landlords. 
so we'll do a really small demo. Here's how it works. Uh, first, tenants go to our website um, to click on our rights recorder tool to either record a phone call that they're about to make or make a report about something that's already happened. Um, then our simple chat bot, which is uh, not AI, it's just, it's all I, um, it prompts the users to share some evidence, um, some specific details about what happened, who did it, and include any evidence that they have, um, which could be a screenshot of a text message or an email uh, or a recording that they've made separately. Um, we developed the language, this is really important, we developed the language for the chatbot directly with tenants. We actually had a whole session or a series of sessions where we were laying it out on the table and writing out the script. And the questions themselves were shaped in collaboration with our legal service provider partners to make sure that they were aligning with the types of intake questions that a legal service provider would ask for. Um, once the report is submitted, a member of our individual justice team will review it, they'll adjust any missing details or evidence, um, and then they also can add existing intel that we have um, for thousands of landlords and brokers in our existing database. Um, we see our job as to kind of give a quick set of second eyes to every single report to make it as strong as it can be before we get it to a legal service provider. Then the magic happens. Uh, we generate a report that is a secure link, um, an encrypted file that compiles all of the information into one place. Uh, we store evidence files on an encrypted server so that even, you know, for the, kind of for the duration of the statute of limitations, so that even if a tenant loses access to the phone that they were texting that landlord or broker on or any other device that they had evidence on, they can still safely access uh, their case files. And this is really important for the tenants we're working with who are in really precarious housing situations, and many of them are waiting until they're safely housed to pursue litigation. Um, so it's really helpful for them to have that repository of reports um, that they can act on later. Um, the full report can be downloaded as a PDF file for easier investigation, um, and then we do some matchmaking. That's the last step in this process. Uh, we have partnerships with the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Uh, we've sent reports to DHR when um, state intervention makes sense. Um, and we also have about seven other legal aid providers across New York City that we can match that report up to the right person depending on what type of justice the person's looking for. Now, to make all this magic happen, we also work with advocates, researchers, and journalists, and policymakers to shape the public narrative to drive a broader system of change for voucher holders. But in addition to making reports about experiences in our community, we built the largest crowd source database of its kind with thousands of allegations of fair housing violations against voucher holders. And one more statistic I would like to give you, 81% of our users are BIPOC, 18% of our users are disabled, and 86% of our users are women. And now our data set has reports from all five city boroughs, every city council and every statewide, even statewide. We use what we're learning from our partners and advocates and researchers and journalists and policymakers to shape the public narrative and drive broad systems to change, broad systems to change voucher holders. We're currently now working with the head of DSS and working with the mayor as a part of Impacted Advocates, where now you're seeing impacted people making decisions on policies that impact them, that will now drive policy for the rest of the city's current situation with the housing and with homelessness. So now that's what we're doing right now, working with the mayor's office. But also this is the first time this has ever happened to have people who have been impacted, voucher holders, making po public policy. Um, voucher holders play a vital role in our work and we published research projects with them. We appeared on primetime TV, leading news outlets and shared a lot of their personal stories. People come to us with such deep, hard, tragic stories. And we wanna make sure we get their stories out there, but also change the public narrative of what people think about voucher holders. We have to also look at the history. I'm a historian by trade. So we have to look at the history of how people shape the narrative of this voucher holders and when we think about public policy around welfare, when we think about public policy around homelessness. And though sometimes those words are very coded, right? And so like we understand that um, there's a lot of that behind just saying a voucher holder. There's a lot of co co codification going on with that. So what we try to do is we try to change that narrative with our users and try to educate people about that through telling people's stories. So, um, and we make, just we just make a case for voucher holders and have them have their 
we let them know that they are powerful. Um, <clears throat> so what we have is a leadership collective, which advises our team and builds skills, advocacy, and does nonprofit management. And then we have a capstone project where people can build their skills for a particular, particular time that they um, are a part of that for a year long term. Um, I'm a founding member of the Leadership Collective. Um, I am a, I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in women's history from Sarah Lawrence College. I never thought that I would be a voucher holder. I worked in um, advertising for over 10 years. I was a former public school teacher. Um, I ended up becoming homeless because of a bad landlord. I ended up getting sick because I was allergic to mold and didn't even know it. Ended up getting cancer. And that's when my story started with vouchers and homelessness and then understanding that. So it was interesting because I was a women's historian. So it, I read the Matthew Desmonds. I, I understood it from a historical space, but also going through everything was a very different moment in history for myself. So I was able to actually live a lot of the uh, things that I was, I was reading and studying when I was in grad school and then be able to digest it. And so that's how I got more involved with what was happening and said, you know, these things need to change. And also understanding how um, people, you know, the history of redlining, understanding the history, the, the history of racial covenants and how those things still impact us even till today. Um, so by design, Unlock NYC team is majority led by New Yorkers who have experienced the voucher system, right? And half of our staff and 100% of our governing board have used a voucher to find a home for their families. And our leadership development program works to cultivate the full potential of New Yorkers with vouchers as advocates, storytellers, and designers of the future that we imagine. So like I said, our leadership collective advises our team. We build skills in advocacy and non-for-profit management and conducts projects. Some of our members come from not having any type of background in any kind of job skills whatsoever. Some of our members do. So we bring everyone together as a collective and we help each other with, with wherever we have shortcomings in, in building each other's skills. So it's a beautiful space and um, to see everyone grow, to see everyone find housing, to see everyone grow and get their degrees. We have one of our leadership members is now, she's in law school. One just graduated with her bachelor's degree. So we have so many different people who are in different phases who never thought they would actually be homeless or a voucher holder themselves or who've been through the shelter for years and now are ba basically taking the reins over their life and reimagining what being a voucher holder is. So, we have designed internal policies, which is really different from many places that to work with. We have equitable compensation, we have a flexible work environment, and we fund personal emergencies, and we create the economic safety nets necessary to support our team. Like currently, I have been on a health sabbatical because of the fact that I was living in a moldy apartment for years and my doctor said I needed rest. So I had been on a sabbatical for almost, well, almost a year just to rest. Not many places will allow you to do that. Not many places will allow you to understand like your housing made you sick and take that into account. And the fact that we're majority, we're equitable in terms of how we think about our ideas and making sure that everyone's voice is counted, no matter what experience you have, no matter what education you have, no matter what background you have. And so we would like it unlocked for the rest of other spaces to be able to unlock the potential where they work at as well in this particular space, but also look at voucher holders very differently and not just look at them as a quote unquote voucher holder. They're a whole individual. So we take a more organic approach to that and understanding that everyone comes to this particular space as a voucher holder from a very different space and place. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanna say I am extremely interested in Unlock. This is my first time, so if you notice, I was listening and you will probably be getting a lot more referrals from us once I finish explaining what I do. I am Larissa Story. I am the program director for Catholic Charities Home Base in the Bronx. We hold four offices in some of the poorest zip codes of New York City. 
Homebase is a much larger organization across the city of New York, holding over 22 offices, and we cover every zip code in the five boroughs. We, many of our clients have shelter history, not all, but I would say the majority of ours have had a shelter stay or a family member that stayed in a shelter that's in their household currently. Most, if not all of our clients are facing eviction, are in housing court, are living in poor conditions, are unable to advocate for themselves and come to us because they are facing homelessness in one way or another. Um, the services that we provide are to try to prevent them from going into the shelter. We provide court advocacy. We do landlord mediation. We provide financial assistance for clients who owe rent. We work very closely with HRA to um, secure vouchers such as FEPS and city FEPS. We work with HRA to um, apply for benefits. If benefits fall off cases, we're the middle person. So a lot of times you'll hear clients mention home base. Um, and their subsidies, and it's not really us, we're just the face that's advocating for the, for the client to make sure that they are receiving the benefits that they deserve. We do a lot of community engagement. We do education for clients, TEP workshops, which are tenant education workshops, so that they understand not only their responsibilities, but their rights as tenants. Many of our clients is their first time living in their own apartment, and we wanna make sure that they're prepared for this. So from very basic, things that they need to know, how to communicate with their landlord, how to pay their rent, how to budget, financial management. We provide those workshops. Um, in terms of screening for subsidies, we also do that, FEPS and city FEPS. We explain to clients how they may qualify. Things that affect this are their public assistance cases, their shelter history, their income, whether, whether they have children. And with that comes dealing with <clears throat> many landlords and brokers. And we also have to educate clients on their responsibility to educate brokers and to know that they cannot be discriminated against because of their income. So the misconception often is that, oh, it's my income, it's because I don't make enough. And we educate them, no, it's your voucher. It's the source of income that's going to be paying your rent that you cannot be discriminated against. And if you do, um, while we do not have legal representation, we do refer them to the SOI, to the New York City um, Committee. And we've had cases that have been successful with litigation. They return to home base and we are able to finalize their application and have them move successfully into their apartment, which is why I'm so excited to hear about Unlock because it's a great resource for many of our clients that were kind of in a bind. We give them a phone number, we give them an email, call SOI and hopefully they'll take your case. But now there's much more for them to be able to connect. On the broker and landlord side, we also try to educate and explain what source of income is. Sometimes a conversation is all that's needed because they are not aware that this means they cannot discriminate because of voucher or because of the portion that the client has or because the client doesn't have a portion. Um, sometimes or many times we get clients saying, oh, they want working clients only or they want HRA to pay the entire rent. And we have to, oh, give me the number. Let's have a conversation. And that may be enough. Um, we do hold once a year workshops to do community education to landlords and brokers and explain the inspection process and the application process and talk about fees and side deals and second leases and things that are not allowed. And if it happens from there, at least we did our part in communicating what's the right thing to do so we can work with you. Um, we cannot work with you if any of these things take place. And we, you know, we try to do our best to, to secure our clients' apartments. Um, as of now, even with the small staff that I have, we've already moved hundreds of people this year because we do also do things like transfers when they're in poor living conditions and the initial assessments for the subsidies, modifications for incomes, um, all of that comes through our office. And with a staff of two housing specialists, we've already moved about 200 people. Yeah, so thank you for having us. And now it's time to hear from Ms. Harding from Erase Racism. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. And it's um, a pleasure to be here uh, on this panel with people who are really doing the work. So I'm Laura Harding. I'm the president of Erase Racism. Erase Racism, uh, my predecessor, Elaine Gross, was really a part of the source of income work and making sure that it was 
um, and advocating for it to become law across New York State and on Long Island. And so I'm really excited that in that space, so let me tell you about erase racism. Erase racism is over 20 years old. We focus on addressing and exposing the devastating impact of structural racism, uh, particularly in public education and, and housing. So we have a four-prong approach to that. We conduct research and advocacy um, for fair, affordable, and inclusive housing. Last year, we launched our affordable and inclusive housing tool for New York State, which identifies areas uh, of high opportunity where affordable housing could be and should be built. And we also included an education component to that so that people were aware of the areas and what the schools look like in these places and also where you currently live. Um, we also um, do a lot of research and advocacy for educational equity. Um, we have published uh, groundbreaking research on the way that districts um, of color, uh, what we call intensely segregated districts of color because they're 90% of color and above, uh, are consistently underfunded by the state and the federal government. Um, and so we advocate for that funding to be um, rectified. And we are one of the ones that are pushing for what you may have heard is the foundation aid formula to be changed and for the governor to actually sign a bill allowing the New York State Education Department to um, study the changing of the, of the formula so that it uh, connects to cost of living and the reality of what New Yorkers are dealing with um, when it comes to living here. Uh, we have a youth leadership development program where we are building capacity in young people to be change advocates and social justice warriors for tomorrow. And we also provide DEI training and consulting, uh, not only the workshops, but also supporting C-suite leaders and, and equity team leaders around how you begin to embed um, equity, inclusion, belonging into your functioning. And so this is what I'm here to talk about today. So we're really excited about source of income discrimination. It's an excellent first step to really address interpersonal racism and discrimination. And since its implementation, what we know is that the calls, the referrals, the reporting has skyrocketed, um, probably more than we even imagined certainly here in the city and also on Long Island. However, the next step in this work has to be systemic change. It has to be systemic change. And we have to begin to focus on the way the structural discrimination has been built into the system. It currently, the voucher system privileges large management companies, wealthy private homeowners who can afford to wait a while to get a check. Um, but if you are a smaller management company or a small or private homeowner who's really needing a, rent, a renter to help pay your mortgage, it disenfranchises them as well as, as the applicant. And here's why. If I have a person who's going to give me a check right away in front of me versus a candidate who has a source of income voucher, and I like them, but I have to wait to go through an inspection, I have to wait if there are changes to be made to make the changes, by the time I see that check, I probably would have gotten two or three from someone who can just write me a check. So I want us to focus on the individuals who are perpetuating the discrimination, but I also want us, and, and this is part of the work Erase Racism is looking to tackle, I also want us to, to tackle the way it's built into the system such that we are streamlining some of the processes we're actually uh, making it a lot easier for landlords and management companies who want to rent to voucher holders. And we're doing a level of education. So we live in this space. We know fair housing in and out, right? I get complaints, I pass them off to Ian Wilder, who you all heard from earlier at Long Island Housing Services. 
I work with CDLI, I work with housing help. Um, sometimes I pass them off to attorneys and refer them there and suggest areas for testing. Um, however, and I provide a level of education, right? I participate in a lot of fair housing conferences, but a lot of landlords, we assume know the law. We, they know the law to get you out, but a lot of times they don't know the law about what they should be doing, right? Especially if it's a kind of, hey, I got to hook up through a landlord, a, a friend who gave me, you know, who are letting me rent a place. Um, and so there's a level of education that needs to be done um, for all the large management companies, the small management companies. There's a level of recognition that they're also, some of them are bearing the brunt of wanting to help and wanting to take voucher holders. And so a lot of times in this country, we focus on interpersonal racism and discrimination, but Erase Racism believes that we really need to look at what are the small levers, what are the small things we can change in the system that can actually make this process easier and not create additional barriers and hurdles, both for the, the applicant and the leasee and the landlord. Um, and, and in that way, offers some support in reducing the number of housing uh, source of income discrimination cases that you see. Thank you for passing that mic down and saving me a little trip. So I'm your next speaker is Stephen Downey from uh, the HCR. So the mic is right there. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I will stand, not because I think I'm special, but just a little easier to operate the uh, PowerPoint there. Um, so yeah, good afternoon. My name is Stephen Abrams Downey. I am a lawyer with the Fair and Equitable, thank you, Manny. Uh, with the Fair and Equitable Housing Office at New York State Homes and Community Renewal. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, HCR is the state's housing uh, agency, and we have a mission to build and develop affordable housing across the state. We also sort of have various other tasks involved in there. We uh, administer some uh, Section 8 programs directly in different parts of the state, we are also tasked with overseeing the state's rent regulation laws. Um, so I think today my presentation is going to pull the lens back a little bit from uh, some of the other work that you've been hearing about from some of these, these different organizations. I, I'm just going to look just as a basic introductory uh, matter. What is source of income? What is the actual problem? And then for the second part of the conversation, we'll look at some of the steps that the state has taken in recent years to address this issue. All right, so as a very general matter, and again, this is probably going to be familiar information to a lot of you, but just as a refresher, uh, source of income discrimination uh, means that an individual has been denied housing uh, because of their income. And we are really talking about any kind of non-work income here. Uh, I think oftentimes the examples that we, we think of are government benefits, whether that's uh, Section 8 housing choice vouchers, Social Security, or any other kind of federal, state, local benefit, but it doesn't have to be a government program. It can also refer to something like a pension or uh, child support. If someone is denied housing because they uh, receive, because they're source of income is a pension, that would also qualify. Or sometimes if a housing provider says you know, work income only, that would be something to look for. So it doesn't have to be a government program, even though that's probably the example we think of most often. Um, so now let's take a look. What does this actually mean in practice? Uh, you know, what are the real consequences of this form of discrimination? Uh, obviously, the sort of first and foremost problem is source of income discrimination. Uh, creates barriers that will prevent people, uh, voucher holders or anyone else, from accessing the safe, secure, and stable housing that they're legally entitled to. Um, and 
This means then by extension that people are going to be spending more and more time looking for housing. And in the meantime, a lot of these individuals will be in maybe substandard housing or they'll have to remain in emergency shelters. Um, all of this puts a lot of pressure on the housing stock. If you just think that you have maybe everyone, every voucher holder in a certain area looking for the relatively small stock of, of housing that is, is available to them. This means lower voucher utilization rates. It means that people have limited access to community resources. If say a large number of housing providers in a given area uh, refuse to rent to, uh, to people who have vouchers or, or whatever it might be, then voucher holders are gonna be effectively barred from using the school district in that area or whatever other resources are available. All of this, just the upshot is that it serves to reinforce racial segregation and the concentration of poverty in certain areas. And all of this is fundamentally at odds with the purpose of the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program, which is one, to improve housing quality by expanding choices for households receiving assistance, and two, to reduce racial segregation and poverty. And I think there have been some sort of, some studies that are a little discouraging showing that uh, Section 8 hasn't necessarily led to a huge increase in housing choice among voucher holders. And a lot of the re reason for that is because of the barriers we see through lawful source of income discrimination. Uh, I want to quickly sort of run through a few sort of particular populations who are going to be very vulnerable to this form of discrimination. And in most cases, this means uh, communities who are disproportionately reliant on government benefits. So if you start out looking at, there's all sorts of data showing that households headed by women or survivors of domestic violence uh, are reliant on uh, government benefits at a much higher rate than the rest of the population. So that means if, the, those, if housing providers are having a policy that effectively says no government benefits, those populations who, maybe already vulnerable are going to be especially susceptible to this kind of discrimination. And again, you can just sort of see the statistics here, up to 80% of, uh, of domestic violence survivors uh, rely on some kind of government benefit like SNAP. Um, and then also just as basic demographic fact, um, you know, women tend to live longer than men statistically. So the older population you get, that the higher percentage of social security beneficiaries are going to be women. So if you look at 85 and up, that's 63% of social security beneficiaries are women. So again, that's a population that will be disproportionately harmed by all source of income discrimination. The same applies to veterans. There are over 200,000 veterans in New York state alone who uh, don't have any kind of wage or retirement income the vast majority of that population receives some kind of benefit, whether it's social security, SSI, or some other kind of benefit. Um, so the again, the upshot is about a quarter of veterans in New York State are reliant on some kind of government uh, benefit. And again, they're going to be part particularly vulnerable to lawful source of income discrimination. And then finally, I'll just also say uh, senior citizens or people with disabilities, about half of people who receive SSI in New York State are over the age of 65. There are about a million people, or more than a million people in New York State who receive fe federal rental assistance. Of that population, 23% of them are seniors and 30% have a disability. So again, these are already vulnerable populations who are gonna be made more vulnerable by this form of discrimination. So that's the uh, problem. Let's take a look at what the state has done in the last few years to at least try to, to start addressing this problem. Um, so the first part is that lawful source of income can make a real difference and can be, make an improvement on these kinds of issues. Um, so when we say lawful source of income dis, uh, legislation, this just essentially means that housing providers are prohibited from denying someone uh, housing because of their source of income. Uh, and so we have here, there's a study from HUD that sh found in areas that have these kinds of protections, there's up to an 11% increase in voucher utilization. So that's a really significant number, and it does make a difference in people's lives. 
Um, and then here in New York, the sort of landmark event was in 2019 when the state human rights law was amended to include lawful source of income as a protected class. So from that time forward, uh, that there is a that is no longer a prohibited uh, housing providers are now prohibited from discriminating based on an individual's non wage income. And just to uh, wrap up very quickly, I just want to talk about another step that the state has been uh, taking in recent years uh, relating to mobility programs as, the, as a way of overcoming racial segregation and the concentration of poverty in certain areas. Um, so this is, uh, we just have here a case going back to the early 70s. Actually, I think Ian Wilder mentioned Mitt Romney's dad. He's in the name of the case, so he's getting a second shout out of the day. Um, so uh, essentially what this case found is that the uh, public housing in Chicago was racially segregated and the uh, court uh, required HUD to take some action to remediate that segregation in public housing. Housing choice vouchers were part of the intended solution at that time in the 1970s. Um, and again, the principle of mobility, it's right there in the name, it's housing choice is supposed to be uh, it's supposed to give people the freedom instead of you can only being required to live in a certain area where a public housing project is located. You are, in theory, supposed to be able to take that voucher and move to the area of your choice. And that's a way of overcoming racial segregation. To now to try and sort of make that principle of mobility a reality, uh, New York State uh, has implemented the Making Moves program. Uh, this was something that started as a pilot back in 2020. Uh, and what this does is it offers resources to, to families who have vouchers. It will match them uh, up with a counselor to try and give them the resources that they need to overcome obstacles to housing choice. Um, and it will find them the, the neighborhood that they want to live in, whether that's based on the school system or whatever other factors. This is trying to give them as many resources and as many opportunities to be in the area that they want as possible. Um, as we say, we started in 2020 with a pilot in New York City, Buffalo, and Long Island. Uh, there were a lot of sort of positive results that, that uh, participants in the program found better economic well-being, educational results, uh, and, and physical and mental well-being. Um, and now, as of this year, 2024, the program has been expanded to serve families in Tompkins, Orange, and Dutchess counties. And we are pleased to announce that it's coming soon. There will be a uh, NOFA notice of funding availability to further expand the program into more regions of the state. So that is something that we're definitely very excited about and uh, something uh, we'll definitely love to hear from you if you have thoughts on. All right, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Hello down there. Um, so I'm the director of the Housing Investigation Unit with the State Division of Human Rights. So we enforce the human rights law. Um, and one of the protections, as was mentioned, is source of income. And um, as you mentioned, thank you, that it was amended into our law in 2019. But it's not new, especially in New York City, right? It's been on the books and being enforced since 2009. So um, it's really exciting that it was expanded at the state level and that we now have jurisdiction over that protected category. So source of income complaints are the fastest growing complaints that we receive at the division. Um, the most complaints we receive are in disability. This is the second, this is the, the, the second highest that we're receiving at this time. And as a trend, what we're typically seeing is that um, voucher recipients mostly um, they're being denied, um, not directly, but typically with there's minimum income requirements or something else written into a posting that would essentially exclude them. So we investigate those claims at the division. We have um, actually a couple of investigators here today. So most of them, I think, are at the front running the show. But if there are um, any housing investigation unit staff members, you want to raise your hand over there. <laughs> Thank you for the work you do. Um, and so they take in these complaints of discrimination, they investigate them. So um, I just wanna give you a quick little information about if you um, have experienced source of income discrimination, how you file a complaint with us and, and what we do. 
So you can file a complaint with us in many ways. We made it very easy for you. You can fax in your complaint, you can submit it online, you can drop it into our office, you can mail it in. We receive those complaints and we look at the complaint for jurisdiction. To establish jurisdiction for a source of income, it's, it's pretty easy. You have source of income, you were denied housing. You think because of the source of income, we will investigate that, okay? We um, engage in, we dual file our complaints with HUD, not for source of income, but for other protected classes. And as you can imagine, people who hold vouchers or have alimony or child support or other sources of income, they have many identities. So they may also feel that they were denied because of their gender or their race or disability or something else. We would dual file those cases that are within jurisdiction with HUD. We also conduct joint investigations with the New York State Department of State Division of Licensing. Um, and they are also investigating brokers and real estate agents while we are doing the same to see if there was a violation of the law. Okay. Um, once we receive that complaint, we say this is, you know, this meets our jurisdictional standards. We're going to serve that on the respondents. Respondents have an opportunity to respond to the complaint. Then the complainant has an opportunity to rebut that response. That's essentially the pleading stage. And then our investigators really get to work. They are um, sometimes door knocking. They're um, engaging in this third party verification or comparative data. They're collecting evidentiary documentation. They really do a lot of work to get to a final determination. And a final determination in our office, similar to if you've heard from the City Commission on Human Rights, is that we reach probable cause or no probable cause. So was there a violation of the law? Would a reasonable person believe that a violation of the law has occurred? It's a pretty low, broad standard. So if we find probable cause, we will then refer that to our attorneys. I'm also an attorney, but we have our litigation unit. Um, and they will then litigate that case. And our housing cases can be litigated um, on site in front of an ALJ or um, the parties can elect to take their cases to Supreme Court. Okay, so that's a little bit about our process. And we're gonna now answer some questions from you all. Let me try to get to people who need a mic or do you have, oh, excellent, even better. Okay, do we have a mic on that side too? Oh, good, Catherine, you have on flat shoes, I hope, good. How you doing? I'm a broker. And uh, um, I really wanted to point out, you know, a way that the brokers as well as the agents can really let you guys know how the managements are blocking us from renting these apartments. And um, so an example is there's an apartment available. You take the information because we're not supposed to just say up front that there's a program. You're supposed to be able to qualify for it based on the program that you have and the money that you're receiving from it. So now you go in there and you, you give them the paperwork for the program and they're offended. One, because they don't want programs in the building. And then two, they are no longer taking your calls. They're not taking your emails. They don't want you to come by, but they don't say it like that. You know, they just don't answer you. And that now you have a series of buildings that you can't rent. So when you say, oh, well, we're going to check after the agents and the brokers, it's not us. We would rather rent them because we want the commission. We're out there, we're working morning to night, and we don't get paid until the person gets a place. And if the people are not allowing us to rent them, then we have a problem. But then the that particular person would say, oh, it was the broker or it was the agent. And that's not the case. The case is how do we report the managements, you know, who don't want to do it? Or if they're charging more for the application fee and it's on our it's our responsibility to say, hey, you know, you're not supposed to be charging more for the application. It should only be twenty dollars. And they're offended about that, too. So they're not taking your call for that as well. So now you got an extra series of buildings that you cannot rent. So I want to know, one, how do you report them in private so that you're not blocked? 
or blacklisted from other managements that they know other people at and tell them, hey, watch out for that girl or that guy. So I want to know how do you do that? And and please just give me the information on that. It would be really helpful. Yeah, that's something that comes up a lot. This is Chelsea. Um, so from the enforcement perspective, um, we I actually saw this a lot. I used to work for the City Commission on Human Rights as well. And this is something that came up all the time. And the division is very similar in how we handle it. So I want to give you this information from both the city perspective and the state. Um, we have the ability to initiate our own complaints. So we don't have to have um, an individual or an organization like Long Island Housing Services filing a complaint in order to bring a lawsuit. Um, so if you have information about someone who is discriminating, whether it be source of income or anything else, you can contact the division or you can contact, if you're in New York City and prefer, the commission, and they can initiate their own complaints. And so you don't have to necessarily be involved as a complainant. You're passing along this information. You can always ask to, whenever you're interacting with one of these government offices to remain anonymous, um, although I would encourage you not to because things go to hearing. And if we want this person, if we want justice, it's helpful to have evidence and to have someone testify. But I understand that this is people's, you know, it's their their licenses, it's their livelihood. Yeah. And so um, something I, I also have encouraged um, lots of real estate agents is to keep a really solid log of who you're working with and if there are instances of discrimination. If you as an agent are named in a lawsuit um, or named as you know a, a respondent in an investigation, it doesn't mean that you're going to be found guilty of discrimination. It means that we have to investigate it. So we dismiss agents all the time that are complying with us, that maybe just are taking training and saying, I was communicating this discriminatory statement. But we name the agent, the brokerage, the, manage the management, and the landlord typically all in one case because we want to know who's really liable here. So I just want to also say if you find that you are you're receiving a complaint in the mail and you're like, oh my gosh, I, I didn't communicate that, you should just work with the investigator. Um, they're neutral fact finders. It's their job to take in all the information um, and to provide the information of what really happened here. Is there someone else who wanted to respond? Oh, okay, great. We think that was covered really well. I will say um, we totally understand that. I, we noticed recently that about 85% of the reports that we're getting in were instances where tenants were interfacing directly with a broker and agent. So it is really important to us that we understand the role that brokers play. Um, you know, I think you're often placed right in between the tenant and the landlord and the landlord is using that to, pr to protect themselves. Um, so I really agree with everything Chelsea said. Oh. Also, and also, um, we started working actually with um, brokers and realtors now. They're starting to report people, and they're not being as fearful anymore because they know that their voices matter, too, in this conversation. So the fact that you're speaking up and you're speaking out, I would suggest you definitely call, give them a call because we have to work to, at voucher holders and brokers and realtors. We're in this fight together, and I, we can't get housing without you. without you. So we need you in this fight with us. May, may I just add from a liability perspective, because I'm lucky enough to be part of the team that brings these cases in court, not to the administrative hearing judge. If you are representing the tenant and you encounter it, there's we would not find you to be liable in the discrimination. You are not an agent for the landlord. And if I understood you correctly, that sounds like what you're encountering. You're bringing your client. No? No, I understand the blacklisting.
So, so can I? Yeah. You're blacklisted. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think. Yeah. So so can I answer your question? Because I think you raise an important point about what happens um, when we do fair housing training, is that. The people who come to fair housing training, if they haven't been mandated to go there, are usually going to be the people who are going to play by the rules, right? And so one of the suggestions I have for you is that when someone sends you a list of things that you know to be illegal, you have to like put them on notice that what they're asking you to do could actually cause you to lose your license. And I think that... Um, Yes, you I, I get wait, get let me let me could you let me finish? I'll let you speak. Thank you. So I think that yes, it sounds very easy for um you to say that, but you know, you have what three, four, five lawyers here. So as an attorney, people come to us all the time. Well, if you work for you know, if you have clients that may not be your government, and the things they ask you to do are absolutely illegal and preposterous. And you consistently have to say to them, no, no is a sentence. It is a full stop. And what you're asking me to do will actually cost me my profession. Now, in terms of the blacklisting piece of it, I hear that. And I also think that is sometimes where you can maybe contact some of us up here and suggest that we do some outreach to do some training for people, right? Or to even do some testing so that the onus isn't on you to do the, to be the reporter, but now that you've amplified and highlighted that there's an issue, uh, some of the organizations can then send testers out to see if that works. So it's not a foolproof. We can't tell you, I can't tell you this is going to solve it, but we've given you maybe about three to four to five different ways. And that's how it is, you, you know, that's how it is. And, and we're at the point, I think, in, in, in source of income discrimination where the state and the AG's office have really stepped up their enforcement so people are on notice that it's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you um, time. It, it may even cost you losing, you know, your license. So those are, uh, you know, it may, we may not give you the full answer, but I think we've given you about three to four to five different things that you could choose from. I yeah, think we've given exactly. this topic a little bit of enough time. I think we should move on to the next. Okay. Report it to one of the organizations. Hello, I am Brian Phillips. I am a real estate licensee in Manhattan. And I have a question about what, what can a landlord, and I disagree with my colleague, I think it's also the landlord's agent. What can a landlord agent lawfully ask me when I'm working with a voucher recipient? They don't, they don't know when I first call. And how, what do I, what am, what can I, what am I allowed to disclose? The question I get when I inquire about an apartment is, first I want to know with the landlord's agent, what is a credit score and income? Do I then disclose that I, I'm working with a voucher recipient? Do I have to say that? And they may also want to know whether they live now, are they in a shelter? Do I have to disclose that? Wants to feel bad. Kelsey or? Um, okay, so you don't have to disclose that information. Um, typically, even if someone is a voucher recipient and there's a credit question, um, if it covers all of their rent, it doesn't even matter. Um, but really, they should be applying. So that conversation shouldn't be happening where they're weeding people out before they can actually even submit an application. Like we should be giving folks the opportunity to even apply for the unit and to have their paperwork submitted. Um, so I would encourage you, if, if I was having this conversation, I would say, let me send you the application. Cause then your client has applied 
the landlord, then it's on them to say whether they're going to deny it. And hopefully we'll find out why, if so. You can always refer to an enforcement agency if you feel that it was because of their subsidy or credit and they have a subsidy, whatever it might be. Um, but I would try to avoid having those back room conversations without following the process. The 2019 changes in our state law make it like really foolproof. Like people get to apply $20 or the cost of a background check, whatever is less, submit it. Um, just so that these, there's no side fee, there's nothing, you know, there's no talk behind closed doors. It's not supposed to be. There's not supposed to be, thank you. <laughs> but I think the reality is that, that and that's a great suggestion because when you work in a community of realtors, there are conversations. So that's an, an outstanding suggestion. Yes. As someone who is a voucher holder, who went from being a renter who had a really good job and had good credit to someone who became homeless, um, I understand your um, trepidation about these kind of challenges because I went through that just being a voucher holder and like now I'm like, I, my credit is impacted. I don't have a job. Um, how will I be able to interpret this? And I think, um, Realtors, the realtor I have is a good friend of mine, and he is someone who's an activist. And so for him, he basically challenges all the landlords. He just submits your application. He gives them everything. And he doesn't allow them to bully him into not accepting voucher holders who might be from the shelter. I was in community. So I think it has to, you know, and back to the sister too, who was back there. It's, realtors and brokers have power, but you have to use that. You have all these people here that are backing you up with the law. It is the law. So use that power that you do have. That will support you. And then therefore you'll be able to help more people. I think we get lost in the, mi the minutia of things a lot of times. And we don't look at these particular issues. I'm someone who was an out, I, I look at my situation. I'm someone who was an outlier. And so I'm living in a high impact area. I'm living in a built in a, a, a area with that had racial covenants that didn't even allow black people in, in the 1940s. And I got in, but I got in because also I have a master's degree from Sarah Lawrence. I'm an activist. You could look me up. I won a David, I, you know, I'm a finalist for the David prize. My situation was a little different, but I should not be the exceptional negress in order for me to get an apartment. So that should not have to happen for everyone. Everyone should be able to get access to housing. Housing should be equitable for everyone. And so when you have voucher holders who are in the shelter, look at them the same way you would look at me and advocate for them the same way. Hi, um, my name is Hersey Rain and I have a question. My mom lives in, uh, a, com a housing complex of 126 um, apartments. And in the past five years, um, HPD has come in and had to condemn some of the apartments due to black mold. So if you have 16 floors and a few of those floors have apartments with black mold, how do we get someone to come and check the entire building or hold the landlord accountable? Because Painting over black mold does nothing. If they don't abate, uh, abate, do the proper abatement, it does nothing. And it's a continuous issue. Um, when I uh, reported it and that I had uh, mold in, in my apartment, it went from one room to another to the entire floors and the air never got scrubbed. So how do I know that, you know, all the illnesses that I've had the past few years are not related to that? Because how do how does one report or, or or start the paper trail of reporting mold in such a big unit. A lot of these people that live there, my mom has been there since 1981. I have been there since 1981. You know, a lot of those people have been there like 40 years. So how do we get help for those people that are now elderly that can't advocate for themselves? Um, is Commissioner Carrion still here? <laughs> Um, so the commissioner from HPD spoke earlier. Um, I would say just on the inspection front, call 311 every day that you have, that you see mold or that you think there's mold. Every day, file a report. I have the 311 app. I'm a New Yorker. Um, I live in Manhattan. I submit everything on that app and it creates a really wonderful paper trail. 
Um, but for our law, so one of the parts, one of the protected categories under our law is disability. Mm -hmm. So if there's someone in your building, if it's you or someone else who um, has a disability and needs a reasonable accommodation related to mold abatement, mm -hmm. you can file a complaint with our office or if you're in New York City, with the City Commission on Human Rights or with HUD. Um, or with us and we can dual file it or with HUD and they can do a, a dual file. So you have options for enforcement on that piece. I would say just for the mold and violating the, the building code, HPD is a really great resource and I would encourage you to continue to, to report it. Okay, thank you. Was there a question in the back, sir? No? I, no, sir, if you don't mind, because we can't hear you. Hi, to Kelly from Buffalo, New York. I'm also a landlord and a realtor. Um, however, when you call 311, what it does is the whole building now, everyone has to evade, ev evade the build, like evacuate the whole entire building for them to treat the whole building. And then now it's causing a larger problem for people and then more shelter problems. So, again, report and whenever you can, but... I don't know, like I have a tenant that called and she had lead-based paint in one of her units. And I had four, un four units in one building. Everybody had to leave. People that were even affected had to leave, you know? So just- I just wanna say that's not totally the case, but this is also off topic. So let's take another question. And you two can connect. There's, um, there's a, you know, an ability to schmooze after this. Are there any additional questions? First of all, I want to thank you, this conference, for being inclusive and allow the elephant in the room to talk so often. So one thing that I think was not really addressed clearly is one of the reasons why vouchers are not accepted nicely is because what is accepted is a culture of mismanagement of the agencies that issue vouchers. So having to deal with a, one of these companies means a big headache, not only. I, I think Laura was saying something very correct, that there is uh, systemic changes that are needed because when a person with a voucher comes to rent an apartment, uh, is offered a lease with a contingency. The contingency is that after some times, could be two weeks, could be three months, could be four months, we, you don't know when. So there is a contingency with no limit. There will be an inspector that will come and tell if this <coughs> unit can be rented or not. So you have in one hand a normal contract, and in the other hand you have a contingency contract. It's like would you sell the house to somebody that pays you cash or to somebody that has a mortgage contingency. So this is one case of systemic change that I think is very important. There has to be, if you want to have uh, housing quality standards, there has to be a pre-approval. I don't know, you, you cannot have to wait, especially during pandemics. You might have to wait forever. So it's very unfair. Also, uh, the communication, I think for example, talking with, I think, her Ashley, Ashley, I would like you to sometimes send some tester to see how the case manager are doing their job, because I know very well, personally, I don't know how things are escalated, but there was one line exchange between one of my agent and a voucher recipient, and we can go into the details, but what happens is that after 18 months, I received a Supreme Court judgment, not judgment, but, you know, to uh, lawsuit. Now you understand there has been no zero attempt to connect, to explain, to find a solution. This is, I think, is illegal. I don't know if it's illegal or not, but it happened to me. And uh, <clears throat> I think when I am defending myself, I have four lawyers in front of me, one of which is a Yale graduate. I have to pay my lawyer $450 per hour. There is an asymmetry so that in a sense, I'm forced to accept an extortionary settlement because that is just an extortion. I have no way to pay more, but 
this time I thought within myself as a, a bad word and I said, I'll go to trial. I want to see what happened during those 18 months. I, want, I will not pay a single dollar until I'm sure that there was no, for example, strange business between the case worker and the law firm because the law firm maybe goes out for lunch with the case worker. How do I know? So we need to bring clarity, transparency in all this. And the stuff, okay, so I've talked enough, but I think the message is clear and strong. Okay, and we're getting close to end time. So just may, may we indulge two minutes perhaps, or? I think that's the, an important point that you're talking about and that all of you have amplified in terms of who are the stakeholders that are involved in the source of income discrimination. So I think Ashley, not Ashley, Chelsea was the one who said it, um, that sometimes everybody gets sued. Everybody's name is listed on the lawsuit, but it may not be you who's actually doing the discrimination. It may be your agent, right? And I think you've also amplified something like today I got a phone call where someone asked me to advocate for them. They're a, a, a voucher holder and they were having an issue getting in contact with their case manager and the manager of the program. So again, I think that what we're talking about here is the very first step to address something that's real. And the next step, if we wanna really eradicate this, is to really look at where are the systemic levers that allow, um, that make it easier for the discrimination to occur and that also may disenfranchise everyone on you know, that, that's involved in the process. So thank you for answering. I want to thank everyone because we're now at the end of our time. But I also want to encourage everybody in the room to keep the conversations going. You have all these wonderful resources in front of you. You have their contact information. So please, we encourage you to keep communication going and it will get better. Thank you very much for your time. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you. Welcome back for those of you who were here yesterday, today too, of a 2024 Fair Housing Conference. And for those of you that are joining us for the first time, welcome. Today, you're going to be hearing from a very interesting panel, but before we get to that, I would like to introduce today's first speaker. And she is Denise Miranda, who is now the Acting Commissioner for the New York State Division of Human Rights. She, Denise Miranda was nominated by Governor Hochul to assume this position just about a month ago in March 2024. Prior to that, beginning in 2017, Commissioner Miranda was appointed and then confirmed by the Senate as the executive director of the New York State Justice Center for the Protection of People with Special Needs. She served in that position for seven years. Prior to joining state service, Commissioner Miranda served for six years as the managing director of the Urban Justice Center Safety Net Program Project in New York City. She began her legal career right here in the borough of the Bronx as an assistant district attorney in the Domestic Violence and Sex Crimes Bureau of the Bronx District Attorney's Office. Commissioner Miranda has been actively engaged in the practice of law for nearly 30 years, focusing her work on social justice issues and protecting the rights of vulnerable individuals. Please welcome Commissioner Miranda. Good morning. That nearly 30 years sounds really different when it's on a microphone. Okay, could sit with that for a minute later on. Um, welcome everyone to day two of our conference, Beyond Brick and Mortar, Housing Equity and Inclusion. As mentioned, I'm Denise Miranda. I'm the Acting Commissioner for the Division of Human Rights. I'd like to thank our partners at HUD and the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors for making this event possible today. Today's program focuses particularly on the obligations of real estate professionals. 
The Division of Human Rights, along with our counterparts at HUD and the Department of State, work to ensure that real estate professionals comply with fair housing laws. The state human rights law is one of the broadest and strongest in the nation and applies to nearly all forms of housing. In one sense, we're very much all in the same business. All of us work to ensure that our fellow New Yorkers can enjoy a safe and decent home. And I recognize that that is a quite challenging task. Barriers to housing for people living with disabilities, families with children, or people who have been facing economic difficulty remain high. We as the state of New York are committed to eliminating these barriers. Over the past few years, Governor Hochul has signed legislation strengthening our housing laws. And as you'll hear from our speakers today, the state has continued to fund testing by fair housing organizations across our state. But beyond enforcement, we're also committed to education and prevention and working with groups such as Hudson Gateway, Rabney, NISAR, and others to ensure that every real estate professional knows their obligations under the law. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Demetra McCain, Principal, De Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Wow. <laughs> I just should have just said that we went to NYU together back in the 90s, and that would have been a lot easier. Secretary McCain assists HUD's efforts to eliminate housing discrimination, promote economic opportunity, and achieve diverse, inclusive communities. Secretary McCain joins HUD following 15 years of service with five as president at the Inclusive Communities Project, a Dallas, Texas-based affordable fair housing nonprofit. Prior to this, Secretary McCain has worked on USDA Section 515, Rural Multifamily Housing Matters at the National Housing Law Project. She also served as a staff attorney for the Neighborhood Legal Services Program of Washington, DC. She has also taught as an adjunct professor, a fair housing and homelessness course at Coppin State University. Secretary McCain is a graduate of Howard University and New York University and Brooklyn College. Please join me in welcoming Secretary McCain. You're doing a great job your first month if you can actually say my title, <laughs> because it's a challenge for me as well. And I'm going to try to move this laptop without messing anything up. I don't want to ruin what you have going on here. There we go. I think I got it. I think I got it now. Well, good morning, everyone. What do they say in New York, right? Is that how it goes? <laughs> Well, I got to tell you, I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I say that I became adult in New York because I spent all of my 20s here in New York. Um, came here straight as a 17-year-old uh, from high school, going to college here. Um, and didn't leave till I left for, for uh, uh, law school and ended up in D.C. But uh, as was mentioned, I'm originally from Dallas. But I got to give you guys kudos because you all were the first state to adopt a human rights law. So give yourselves a hand for that. And then beyond that, I, I was taking a look at your website and I really love the fact that you say that hate has no place in New York. There's a lot of hate going on right now. So to have that as a theme, I say kudos to you all. And not only that, you guys really are like on the cutting edge here. We have these things called FIPS, right? So FIPS are our Fair Housing Initiative Program partners. Those are like mostly nonprofits, some government agencies too, who receive some of our grants to do work and investigate fair housing um, in tandem with, like I said, some funding from HUD. Um, and you guys actually have seven FIPS here. You've got, just so everybody knows, you've got Westchester Residential Opportunities, met with them just a few months ago. You have the Fair Housing Justice Center, who's here right now. Um, clap, clap, clap. <laughs> clap that up, yeah. You have uh, Long Island Housing Services. You have Housing housing Opportunity. Where, where, where are you? Where are you here? All right, right over there. You guys have Housing Opportunities Made Equal in Buffalo. You've got Brooklyn Legal Services. You've got CNY Housing in Syracuse. And you've got Legal Assistance of Western New York in Rochester. So you guys have been in this fair housing world for a minute. So I, I appreciate being among friends here and people who know and appreciate the importance of fair housing. Because we know, listen, before we had a pandemic, 
we had a housing crisis, right? And then we had the pandemic and then things were just exa exacerbated, right? And so when you have a housing crisis, guess what else you have? You got more housing discrimination. That's what you have. And that's really unfortunate, but it blew up. And so today we sit here exactly seven plus days from the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And it was Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King who took his family out of the South, moved to Chicago to experience some of the fair housing tragedies that were going on in Chicago, because those folks were fighting for fair housing, right? And so it wasn't until his assassination, like I said, seven plus days, seven plus a day, so that's eight days since his assassination, right? Then we had a week later, the president and Congress finally, finally, yesterday was the anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. Yesterday, 56 years of the Fair Housing Act. And as much as we've had fair housing laws from court cases before the Fair Housing Act, and then we had the Fair Housing Act, we still got work to do, right? We still got work to do. Actually, the home ownership gap between black and white families were better before the Fair Housing Act than they are today. So things have gone awry. We have not stayed the course. And so it takes all of us to try to get us back on track. The same thing goes for Latinx families as well. The home ownership rate today, think about that, let that sink in. The home ownership rate today, the cap is bigger now than it was before this federal fair housing law. Wow, that's a lot, that's a lot. But let me just say some other things that are going on too. Just last summer, just last summer, our office, the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, ended up having to charge multiple entities in New York, right? We had to charge multiple entities in New York who actually created a scheme targeting Caribbean homeowners in New York, right? Trying to steal and take away their titles, right? I don't know if you're familiar with this case, Homeowner Assistance Services of New York. Think about that. As much as people work really hard to become homeowners, right? They connect with realtors, perhaps realtors like some of you. They become homeowners, but then somebody comes in and creates a scheme to try to steal their title to their home. And what do they do? They hire people who are also perhaps of Caribbean descent or perhaps sound like it on the phone and target specific people based on the national origin, right? And so we know that the Fair Housing Act protects people along seven protected classes. There's race, there's color, there's national origin, there's sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation, there's religion, there's disability, and familial status. Familial status, fancy word just for saying somebody has kids under the age of 18 or they're about to adopt kids under the age of 18. So those are the seven protected classes. And so our office handled a case that was targeting people based on race and national origin right here in New York. We don't want to see that happen again, do we? Do we? We don't want to see that happen again. People work too hard to become homeowners. And let me just say this too. In addition to the Fair Housing Act, we have other tools as well. We have a tool that we use called Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So even before, right, we have the 1968 Fair Housing Act, we had Title VI, which is actually turning 60 years old this year. And under Title VI, we actually had a case here in the Bronx, right, related to, um, related to some HUD funding housing uh, where people were being discriminated against of, along the lines of race. And Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 protects people based on race and national origin as well. And so we, we use all tools we possibly can to make sure that we're trying to help and protect folks here in New York and the entire country, right? And in addition to that, we've had a couple cases very recently um, along the lines of disability. Like I said, we have those seven protected classes where we've had um, tenants or prospective tenants told that they could not use their very much needed assistance animals in the housing they were trying to get. And that included a mother with her young child who were turned away and did not have that housing opportunity. So. In fiscal, fiscal 2023, our office handled about 
8,200 individual cases that came knocking on our door with the help of FAPS such as New York. So New York FAP staff, give yourselves a hand because we cannot do this work without you. Clap it up for yourselves. And so we get these cases and if we do fortunate enough to have a FAP like the one in New York, then we partner with our FAPS, Fair Housing Assistance Programs, and they handle some of these cases. And so they're swamped. I know they're swamped. I talked to somebody earlier hearing that they're swamped. We're swamped, but we're doing the best we can with the resources that we've been given by Congress, and we will continue to do that. So when we take those individual cases, the cases that we see the most are disability cases and race cases, right? Um, of the 82 I mentioned, some of them also uh, are along the lines of retaliation, uh, when someone is uh, trying to assert their rights and, and is retaliated against by a housing provider, or someone engaged in real estate transactions. Um, but listen, everybody doesn't file a case with us because we know there is housing discrimination taking place that people don't even pick up the phone or go to the website to contact us to complain about. And that's real. Now, the type of case that we receive the least is based on religion. But let me tell you, just like you have your, your, your theme and your phrase that says, New York is not a place for hate, hate is happening. And hate is happening along religious lines, which is why just recently, um, and in coordination with other federal agencies and, and at the request of the White House, we're taking some action about that. And I issued a memo not too long ago, just reminding our staff and our FIPS and our FAPS to keep a watchful eye out for any type of housing discrimination along religious lines, because that happens too. And not everybody complains about the discrimination they face, because why? Because you're in a crisis, right? You gotta move on. It's like, I need some housing. I don't have time to call these people. So, so that's some of the stuff that we're working on. And please understand that we cannot do this without your support whatsoever. Hot off the presses, folks. Hot off the presses, on Wednesday of this week, the Federal Register published HUD's proposed rule entitled Reducing Barriers to HUD-Assisted Housing. Raise your hand if you've heard of that already. It came out. All right, we've got a few people who heard about that. I'll tell you a little bit about it. So let me say this proposed rule is published by now. You can find it at federalregister.gov. HUD's rule proposes that people not be automatically or categorically denied access to be or terminated from HUD-assisted housing including public housing, housing choice vouchers, and HUD multifamily housing, simply for having a criminal record. Instead, instead, HUD is proposing that public housing agencies and owners of HUD-assisted multifamily housing be required when making an admission decision to use an individualized assessment that only considers criminal records that are relevant to, in, to endangering the health and safety of staff and residents, and also provide full consideration to mitigating factors and circumstances. And now this proposed rule, this proposed rule would continue to afford discretion to PHAs and assisted housing owners while providing direction and adopting and implementing fair, effective, and comprehensive admissions and termination policies. So in doing so, the proposed rule, as we've proposed it, would minimize the unnecessary exclusions from HUD-assisted housing, while at the same time allowing providers to maintain the health, the safety, and the peaceful enjoyment for their residents and for their staffs and for their communities. And so we are actually seeking public comment on this proposed rule before it's finalized. I certainly invite each and every one of you to go to the website. We're taking public comments from folks like you all the way up to June 10th. And so that's really hot off the presses. But let me just say this, New York. I am so incredibly impressed with how you all understand the impact of source of income discrimination. Right? So when a family wants to pay their rent partially or in full by their federal housing choice voucher, you understand what that means when they're turned away from doing that. You not only understand that because you, you guys adopted a law protecting that type of, of situation, which is not a federal law, but you all understand that and you all are actively making sure that those rights that you have here in New York 
are actually recognized and utilized. So give yourselves a hand for that. That's really big. That's really big. And now, very recently, I issued a memo to our FAPs, including the New York FAP, reminding folks that the funding that we give our New York FAPs and FAPs all over the country actually can be used to test source of income discrimination where there is such a law that you guys have. If, in fact, that testing is tied to trying to uncover discrimination based on the Fair Housing Act. The same exists um, for our FIPS as well, but that came out very recently. And my good friend, Richard Minocchio, who runs our public housing office, he, his office actually just created a website that really kind of focuses and tells people what, what source of income discrimination really is. Again, it's not a federal law, but sometimes source of income discrimination where there is such a protection such as New York, can run a file of the Fair Housing Act. So I just really wanna give you guys kudos for that. And let me say this too, when it comes to real estate, and I, I mentioned earlier that huge gap that there is for home ownership, which works again, re relates to wealth. Cause a lot of people, most of their equity and their wealth comes from the homes that they own. When it comes to that, our office is very intent and we're taking cases as it relates to appraisal discrimination, Right, that's been in the news a lot. We're doing big things on appraisals. We're, we've got a lot of stuff going on when it comes to appraisal discrimination. Because if you buy a home and you have equity in your home and you can't like pull that equity out and use it for things like sending your kids to college, et cetera, et cetera, then that's a problem there, right? And also, unfortunately, there are lenders out there who actually discriminate against folks. Can you believe that? Right. Um, so we take those cases as well. So as you go about doing your work, either as professionals or in the community with other folks, your neighbors, your, your church members, et cetera, et cetera, please remind them that HUD is open for business. The Fair Housing Office is open for business. They don't have to pay anything. And we are continuing to prioritize the work and the demands and the commands and the directives of the Biden-Harris administration and the legacy that our absolute amazing former secretary, Marsha Fudge, gave us. So I just want to say this, that it's important to keep this stuff going. We've got systemic discrimination that still persists. We've got new discrimination that's coming in, as you guys just recognized earlier, since the pandemic, it's gotten you know even more tense. So we've got all these things going on. You guys have an amazing agenda today. So I'm not going to stand in the way of that. And I just want to thank you all for inviting me. I really, unfortunately, I got to run out to the, my next event. But thank you all for having me. You guys are doing great work. And keep it up. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, who is Brian Green. Brian Green is the Vice President of Public Advocacy at the National Association of Realtors, where he oversees all the legislative and regulatory advocacy on behalf of the association's 1.4 million members. He joined NAR in November of 2019 and spent his first year there raising the association's profile in Washington and nationwide on all fair housing related policy matters as NAR's very first director of fair housing policy. Prior to joining that agency, he served for 10 years as the general deputy assistant secretary in HUD's office of fair housing and equal opportunity. There, he oversaw the policy direction and operational management at that office, which is, of course, charged with enforcing the nation's fair housing and anti-discrimination laws. He has held several other senior positions at HUD during his three decades at that agency, which is commendable including a stint as the Associate Deputy Assistant Director for Sec Assistant Deputy Assistant, <laughs> let me start that again. <laughs> the Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Affairs in HUD's Office of Policy Development and Research, where he worked to reduce regulatory barriers to affordable housing. 
In addition, he was the 20, the 2007 recipient of the Presidential Rank Award, the highest federal honor bestowed upon federal senior executives for outstanding service. And he earned his degree in government from Harvard University. Please welcome Brian Green. Thank you. I had no idea you were going to read all that. Uh, <laughs> if I had stayed at HUD any longer, my title was going to get really long. So, um, yeah, they really do. I, you had to turn on to the back of the card to see the rest of it. Um, let me say, um, one, it's, it's always a pleasure to be invited back to New York. Uh, this is where I grew up. I came to uh, this zoo uh, many times as a kid. Um, so it's great to be here as an adult talking about serious things. Um, so I really want to thank um, the Division on uh, Human Rights for inviting me, uh, for my friends at HUD uh, inviting me as well. And it's great to see uh, you all partnered with the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors. It's just wonderful um, that you all work together um, and that uh, you invited me to come to this wonderful place to talk. Um, you know, I told my kids I was coming to the zoo to speak. They were really surprised. Um, but I was thinking about this too, because um, the, you know, we had that eclipse uh, Monday and I read a story about how at the Fort Worth Zoo, uh, all of the animals uh, during the, uh, the total eclipse that they had in Fort Worth uh, thought it was nighttime. And they all started to head uh, for shelter. They all, you know, were confused uh, and thought it was time to go to bed and um, and and sought shelter. And you know, it made me think that uh, you know those are animals who might be confused by this, but we as humans, um, we also can get confused. And um, even with our big brains, uh, we often forget that we also have basic needs um, and that we shouldn't need big brains to figure that out. Um, we should be able to figure out as humans that we need housing for all. Uh, another great confusion, thank you. Yes, we learn something from the animals, right? Um, another great confusion is that uh, we need to appreciate that we are all one species. But we've spent millennia, and especially in the last 200 years or so, with scientism advancing these notions that we are not. And that has, that has stuck with us, these notions that some people are better than others. And almost um, anywhere on Earth where cultures push this, you will find that the people pushing it um, have to use savagery in order to try to uh, assert that. Um, as humans, we should know better. But then we also find more polite ways to assert this. Um, our government, the US government, did this for sure. We've maintained racial classifications, racial hierarchies, uh, et cetera. This year, for example, uh, marks the 100th anniversary of the Racial Integrity Act of 1924 that sought to sort out human beings and maintain white Americans as the pure species of person that uh, should not intermarry or mix with others. Until 67, and Loving versus Virginia, that that was overturned. We did the same thing in housing. We codified in our housing policies uh, racial hierarchies, which determined where we lived, where human beings could put their head down at night, where we actually listed like Scandinavians at the top, followed by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and then African Americans and Mexicans at the bottom. We were, you would have thought we were talking about the animal kingdom, the way we ranked people. And let me just say, my own association, the National Association 
of realtors was confused. We had a code of ethics back in the 1920s where we explicitly said, to be ethical, you must discriminate. You must exclude certain populations from communities. Now that was the 1920s. Fast forward, nations pushing for a national fair housing law. 50, 56 years ago uh, this year, we at the National Association of Realtors opposed that. We opposed the passage of the Fair Housing Act. So we did, of course, ultimately change. We passed a code of ethics. Um, but you know, discrimination didn't fully disappear. No, I think everyone here in New York recalls the New York Newsday case from uh, a couple years back. Um, you heard that I started November 2019 at the National Association of Realtors. A week later, Newsday published that piece. Uh, so I was off to the races addressing the discrimination that obviously still persisted in the real estate profession. <clears throat> um, today, we're in a much better place at the National Association of Realtors than we even were five years ago. We have a, a robust fair housing team consisting of several individuals. Um, NAR has supported HUD's disparate impact rule. It has supported HUD's affirmatively furthering fair housing rule. Um, we support more funding for HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, um, funding for the private fair housing groups, funding specifically for testing, which we were talking about, and you're going to talk more about, uh, funding for this, the state and local uh, organizations that participate in the Fair Housing Assistance Program, all of that. We're supporting funding for more housing choice vouchers, and you're going to talk about that today, too. So we're a very different place. But even within our association, we have prioritized fair housing, uh, not just with training. I remember right after Newsday, a lot of people said, OK, more training is needed. And yes, better training, more committed training. And we've done that. We've done some interactive training that we've created. We've also created implicit bias training. <clears throat> but we've also said we need to make sure that our state laws uh, require more robust training. And we've looked all throughout the United States uh, at these state laws to see how we can improve that. But then beyond that, make sure that there's accountability as well when real estate agents violate state laws, that something actually happens and that there's actually dialogue, say, between FAP agencies or, or whatever state um, commissions there are that enforce um, the fair housing laws and those real estate commissions. Because real estate agents would always say, if I engage in discrimination, I will lose my license. But in many states, no, you wouldn't. And so we at the National Association of Realtors have now been working with all the states saying, we want this accountability. We want to make sure that real estate professionals who engage in discrimination cannot participate in this profession. This does not help us. So we're pushing that across the United States and doing other internal culture change as well. We've lifted up uh, the Fair Housing Champions in our midst. One of the top awards we give out now is uh, our Fair Housing Champion Award. And then finally, we're, we're demanding more accountability within our association. Um, believe it or not, the National Association of Realtors is funding self-testing. So we are funding brokerages to test their agents. So a number of brokerages have signed up to do that so they can find out if they're engaged in discrimination and correct it before, say, a New York Newsday does that and exposes it. So that is what we're doing within our association. And as the vice president now of policy for the entire association, I'm bringing fair housing policy to all of our work because we, we know these issues are there in mortgage finance. We know it's in federal housing policy. We know it's even in taxes. Uh, Bronx native uh, Dorothy Brown wrote an incredible book called Whiteness of Wealth that talks about uh, discrimination in the tax code. The New York Times put out a story yesterday about property taxes and discrimination, uh, an opinion piece. <clears throat> so all of these issues intersect with housing opportunity. But the last thing I want to talk about is housing supply. And I know there's a robust discussion here in New York on this issue. And uh, <clears throat> we all know that affordability 
is largely a function of housing supply, of the lack of housing, a housing shortage. It is also a fair housing issue. That home ownership gap that my friend Demetria talked about, uh, that home ownership gap doesn't close until we address housing shortage and affordability, because a lot of this affordability issue is also a function of past discrimination. And you're seeing that in terms of what people are able to afford and how uh, this housing supply shortage is exacerbating the home ownership gap. That 30 percentage point home ownership gap between African Americans and whites is getting wider. And we've done some data, we've done some research, and the data shows that even though, and I'll use the example of African Americans, even though African Americans are about 13% of the American population, last year they represented only about 5% of housing purchases. Um, and what you find when you dig into it is, it is, it tends to be people of higher education among this group who are purchasing housing. Why is that? Because you need higher levels of education to get higher income, especially if you don't have family wealth. So the typical buyer um, among African Americans is a African American woman with graduate degrees. So they're trying to overcome a history where they did not have equity in housing. And we look at the data in terms of where people find their down payments, you'll find that white Americans were twice as likely as African Americans to find their, the money for their down payment in the sale of a past home. And we look at the, the differentials in wealth, white Americans have about eight times the wealth of African Americans. Um, and of course, if you're seeking higher levels of education, you're also incurring student loan debt. And we're seeing in the data um, that African Americans have the highest levels of student loan debt. About 41% of African American purchasers have significant student loan debt, much more um, than other, other borrowers. And then finally, African Americans and Hispanics are tending to tap into their retirement and their pensions to, to find uh, the down payment. They're three times as likely as whites to be tapping into the future, their pension uh, and retirement in order to get that house. Because it is important. The median house price now in America is beyond the reach of most Americans. The majority of Americans can't afford the median house price, but it's even more acute for uh, people of color. So we've got to address that. And home ownership is critically important to achieving wealth in this country. Homeowners have 20 times the wealth of renters. So as home ownership goes, thus goes the nation when it comes to wealth. So let's deal with these things. Obviously, our nation's facing great, great challenges. Um, there's There are wars abroad, and no doubt we need to be focused on that. But here, domestically, Housing availability is the number one issue. And we need to continue to remind our lawmakers of that, that we need a Marshall Plan in the United States to make sure that people have housing. Domestically, that is our number one issue. And that word domestic comes from the Latin domus, for home. So let's do everything we can make sure, and everything we can do to make sure that all Americans, all Americans of all backgrounds have equal access to home. Thank you. All right, now we're gonna move on to the CE portion of today's agenda. And I would like to introduce to you the members of that panel and ask that they join us up here. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Robin White. She is an instructor with the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors. And next, I would like to have Zaitel Andino Caballero, the Deputy Director of Housing, Fair Housing Equal Opportunity at HUD. And seated next to her will be John Herrion. He is the acting general counsel at the Division of Human Rights. 
And last but not least, Elizabeth Grossman, the Executive Director of the Fair Housing Justice Center. So please, when, when everyone gets their seats, please welcome our panel, and I'm sure it's going to be interesting for all of us. Good morning. Well, we've heard from wonderful people who are at that other end of fair housing, the one that makes the laws, the ones that enforce. But I'm the person who's on the front line of fair housing. Every realtor in this room is on the front line of fair housing because it's with us that things will change. So I thank you for coming for your three hours of CE, of Fair Housing. We're gonna have some fun and we have some great panelists, which is going to make this easy for me, I think. <laughs> so, um, clickers. Just make sure I'm getting the right one. Maddie. Oh, there we go. I'm Robin White. I have been a realtor for 30 years. I am a associate broker. I am a little bit further up. I was born in New York City and lived in New York City until I moved to Orange County. So I'm hailing from Middletown, New York. I've been with Keller Williams Hudson Valley Realty for the last eight years. And I have been a realtor for a long time, also an instructor. So it's my pleasure to be here to be able to instruct you with your three hours of CE. Okay, so what are we gonna do? Today, we are talking about fair housing. And I know for the realtors in the room, this is something that you do every year. This is something that's not necessarily fun. This is something that you just have to do. But today, we're gonna make it a little bit fun because I want you to remember, we are at the front line. So, fair housing, why? Why do we need fair housing? What's, what's the reason for fair housing? Before the Civil Rights Act of 1866, there was no federal law to govern the rights of citizens to buy, sell, inherit, or lease real and personal property. The Supreme Court decision passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which guaranteed the rights of citizens, all citizens, to purchase, lease, hold, sell, convey personal, and real property. However, we know that didn't do the job, okay? So subsequently, the court um, in, 19, in 1896 and in 1917 ruled that separate but equal was highly legally acceptable. So that caused a lot of division. Separate but legal, separate but legal. I'm old enough to have seen separate but equal. We'll get into that. What the Civil Rights Act didn't address was the ability to division. protect citizens. Separate but federal, state, but legal counties, neighborhoods separate from but developing legal. zoning laws. I'm old enough deed restrictions to have segregation separate. under that separate but equal laws, which allowed communities to be separate but not equal. I wanna share a little story. I watched my parents go to buy a home. My mother couldn't be on the mortgage because she was a woman. And they decided that at that time, a woman was always, you know, she wasn't reliable financial source because she could have a child, she could stop working. My dad, who was an MTA worker, had a great salary, but they were restricted to where they could look for a home. We brought a home in a neighborhood where we were among the first of African-Americans to be in the neighborhood. By the time they brought the home when I was 13, 
By the time I left for college, my diverse neighborhood, that my best friend was Italian, another friend Irish, was probably about 75% black because of white flight. This is what we do as realtors. This is why there is a difference with fair housing. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, 1968, and 1988, it took 100 years for us to make headway from the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which allowed no exemptions. Discrimination was perpetuated through mortgage practices called redlining and staring and blocking. In 1962, President Kennedy issued an executive order guaranteeing non-discrimination in housing for FHA and VA loans. The very loans that we now encourage our buyers to use were loans that were used against us. Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Title VI, which was enacted prohibiting discrimination in any programs receiving federal money, it didn't include privately financed. So maybe, you know, the government couldn't discriminate, but there was a lot of private financing. So you could go somewhere, get financing, but they didn't have to follow the laws. In uh, 1968, which was just said, I remember 1968. I remember the riots. I remember people protesting to live where they wanted to live. I remember my grandmother and my mother being excited about hearing the passing of the Fair Housing Law. Originally enacted Congress as the Title VIII Civil Rights Act of 1968, the Fair, Act, Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in housing based on race, color, religion, or national origin. In 1977, they added six, sex, excuse me. Um, in 1988, HUD was giving the enforcement power. Now as realtors, you know, we kind of, we don't want to hear about enforcement. We don't want to hear that someone is going to actually tell us how we can do our job. But it's important, it's very important. It's, we need that accountability. The role of HUD was, was to negotiate a voluntarily agreement between affected um, parties. Two or more classes added, two or more classes was added, mental and physical disabilities and familiar status. I want you to just go with me. Hello and welcome to History Pod. On the 11th of April 1968, the Fair Housing Act, also known as Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, was signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 had outlawed discrimination based on race, colour, religion, sex or national origin. Nevertheless, significant obstacles remained for minorities who were attempting to secure equal housing rights. Despite their contributions to the American effort during the Second World War and the ongoing Vietnam War, racial minorities were still subject to overt discrimination when attempting to rent or purchase homes in residential areas. Organisations that included the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People and the GI Forum lobbied extensively for federal fair housing legislation. But despite the Fair Housing Act first being put to Congress in 1966, it was met with resistance that stalled its passage. However, over the next two years, the national atmosphere began to change and in the aftermath of the race riots of 1967's long, hot summer, the Kerner Commission report strongly recommended equal housing legislation. On the 4th of April 1968, Dr Martin Luther King Jr., a vocal supporter of the bill, was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. His death prompted riots that spread across the country amidst which President Lyndon B. Johnson urged Congress to pass the bill promptly as testament to King and his legacy. Despite further attempts to delay the legislation, 
An hour of debate on the 10th of April led to the House approving the bill by a vote of 250 to 172. Johnson signed it into law the next day, just two days after King's funeral. The act made it illegal to discriminate regarding the sale, rental or financing of housing based on race, religion or national origin. I'd like to bring up my next speaker, who is John Heron, who is the Acting General Counsel of the New York State Division of Human Rights. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Robin, for the introduction there. Just going to talk about some of the protected classes uh, that are uh, in the New York State human rights law when we're talking about fair housing. So, um, you know, we've heard a lot about the Federal Fair Housing Act uh, here in New York State. We also have a very strong law uh, that includes a number of protections for a number of different protected classes uh, to keep people free from discrimination. So some of those classes here are uh, marital status, defined as persons who are married or divorced. Uh, we have sexual orientation uh, also added uh, under the uh, Sexual Orientation Non-Discrimination Act. Military status, which is unique to the New York State human rights law. Uh, somebody cannot be denied housing or have their terms or conditions of housing diminished in any way based on any of these protected classes. Um, age is also an area of coverage uh, that is um, included in the state human rights law protections. And then some of the more recently added protections are gender identity or expression. So somebody who is expressing their gender identity through different ways is also covered. It is not limited merely to persons who are transgendered. It can be by way of expression that somebody can be covered uh, if they've experienced discrimination because of that. Uh, lawful source of income, which is an area we've talked about quite a bit at the, at the uh, program uh, here yesterday and again today, which is a trending area that we're seeing and uh, other partners in law enforcement, housing, fair housing law enforcement are seeing the same trends there. Uh, domestic violence victim status was an area of protection that was added to the state human rights law along with uh, citizenship and immigration status. Uh, we've also seen added expansions to the human rights law with relation to prior arrest and sealed records. So as I mentioned yesterday, I'm always proud to talk about the New York State human rights law and um, the New York State legislature have always expanded and clarified protections, civil rights protections here since I've been with the agency for 16 years. And while some states here in the country are in the business of diminishing or eliminating rights, New York State has always been in the business of adding them and enhancing protections. So I'm very proud to be a part of that. And with that, we will turn things over to Elizabeth Grossman. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> it's like, now I don't have to crane my neck. Um, as uh, some other speakers have mentioned, I'm the executive director, general counsel of the Fair Housing Justice Center, where a nonprofit Fair housing organization, um, you heard from two of uh, our colleagues at other fair housing organizations yesterday. We received some funding from HUD, uh, which was mentioned, and some funding um, from New York State as well. So what we do is we provide services to people from the public. We have an intake service, uh, service where people who can register complaints of discrimination with us we do outreach events like this. Uh, we use testers to observe the practices of housing providers. We have a, we have a policy program. Um, and we do have a robust litigation program um, when we do use testers and they uncover systemic patterns of bias. We bring enforcement actions um, to make sure that the housing providers do not continue to discriminate and to open up those housing units to everyone. So I appreciate everyone's attention. I hope to never see any of you um, ever again, except as a training. Um, we have lots of examples of the kind of cases that we bring on our website. Um, and I really um, very much hope to be able to work with all of you to um, help you as much as we can to comply with the law. And um, not uh, we, we do not enjoy bringing lawsuits. Um, it is not fun for us. We would much rather be at an event like this, working with people 
who want to be educated about the law and want to comply with the law. So if we can ever be of assistance to anyone, if your organization would like training, um, we're all available to do um, any kind of training that um, is helpful to you. So let us know about that. So Robin was kind enough to give me a couple minutes just to mention um, a couple issues that we're doing a lot of thinking about and a lot of um, work on. So one um, is criminal legal system interaction that John mentioned. Um, the uh, details are up on the slide. You can all see them. We have fact sheets on our website. DHR has information on its website. Um, we are seeing a lot of brokers not understanding the laws about criminal legal system interaction. Um, so wanted to highlight that and call it to your attention. Um, there's two important laws, if you can move to the next. Oh, sorry. Um, in New York City funded housing, there are other rules that you can look up as well. Um, if you can move to the next slide. So coming soon, I just want to put on everyone's um, radar that there is a new New York State law that will be in effect in November. And in a minute, I'll talk to you about a new New York City law that will be in effect um, in January. So these will um, are advances towards greater protections for people with criminal legal system involvement. Um, the category of criminal legal system involvement is not yet a full protected characteristic. So I can't tell you that much more about what the um, New York State Clean Slate Law will look like. I'm sure we'll be getting information about that coming soon, but I just wanted to make sure everybody um, knew that it was coming. And um, if you wanna sign up for the FHJC's newsletter, we'll certainly be pushing out information about that. And I'm sure DHR um, will as well. Um, so the, clean, the New York Clean Slate Law has some additional protections that are stronger than the, um, Sorry, this, we're still on the clean slate law. Um, so yeah, you can read all this. I'm not gonna take the time to read it to you, but it's available. Sorry, the New York City Fair Chance law has um, some greater protections and um, you can look at those um, as well. So I guess we'll maybe have time for questions if people wanna talk about it some more later. Um, okay, and then I've been asked to quickly talk about source of income discrimination. I know you talked about this yesterday. I know you know what it is. I know you know that it's a huge problem. I think about three quarters of the complaints that we get are about source of income discrimination. A lot of it is by brokers. We get called from people who say, I applied for 25 apartments this week and I believe everyone discriminated against me because of my voucher or subsidy. We're doing a lot of testing. The other organizations are doing a lot of testing. CHR is doing testing, the Attorney General's office is doing testing. I appreciate the self-testing that was referred to earlier. So we really want to help you get educated about vouchers and subsidies, get educated about the law, and not engage in discriminatory treatment of people with vouchers. Having a voucher, and we saw this during COVID, <laughs> people with vouchers had their rent continually paid. People who lost their jobs due to the pandemic did not have that ability to pay the rent. So it's a safe and secure way to have your rent paid. There are stereotypes about voucher holders that persist um, that are not true. Um, the, there are studies that they're just as great of a tenant as, as anyone else. And so we're asking for your partnership to end a terrible wave of source of income discrimination that we're experiencing right now in our city and our state. Um, so I think you know all this. It's on the slides. You talked about it yesterday, which I didn't know when I made the slides. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to engage um, further at the Q&A part or um, talk to you privately. Or again, we're all available to do any training that you um, might need. So thank you. So we have bias. And for anyone who tells you that they're not biased, they are lying. Because how many dog people do I have in this room? 
Raise your hand. Okay. How many cat people do I have in this room? There. And guess what? Dog people have bias against cat people. Cat people have bias against dog people. Dog people are, to are thought to be friendly. Why cat people? Not so friendly. So we have bias. But bias becomes a problem when it comes to housing. When one person can't live where they want to live because of a bias. So I want to share with you, I know you've all heard about Newsday. It put a black eye on my profession. Okay. We didn't think it was happening. We thought at 2019, we had gone beyond discrimination. And of course, we who are in New York City, you know, from New York, I mean, we're great. Okay, so obviously we didn't do that. That was someplace else until this expose came out. And it was embarrassing. The home buying experience for blacks was a sharply different experience than it was for whites in our testing. We conducted 39 match tests involving black testers. In 19 of those tests, the black tester experienced unequal treatment. That is 49% of the time. Every place I went to basically, they, they treated me very well and they, they showed me that, you know, they were really interested in what I wanted. But it was only after they got back to the office and compared them that we noticed that the treatment wasn't uh, equal. I think what I am surprised at is the shared discrepancy between the two of us. So okay. a lot of people will say to me, oh, I don't care. I'll take Freeport and all the houses are cheap there. I don't care about the school because you're going to have any children. I said, but you got to protect your investment. After looking at the area that she went to and the area that I went to and all the nice choices that she had so much more than I did, I, I felt I was slighted a little bit. As black testers, they were getting uh, directed to more diverse neighborhoods or that they weren't getting equal service compared with the white counterparts. Every time I, I see and hear things like that, I'm still like very surprised. Etri declined to comment. Coldwell Banker stated, Incidents reported by Newsday that are alleged to have occurred more than two years ago are completely contrary to our long-term commitment and dedication to supporting and maintaining all aspects of fair and equitable housing. Lisa Culpo, a young black female tester in a particular test, she was asked for identification proving um, who she was. What else? I do need a copy of your license. Oh or something, some form of idea. The thing is, because I've gone on so many tests where they have never asked me for ID, why would they need ID? Okay. You know, if you come in Wednesday, I'll show it something. All right, but it, this is uh, routine? I mean, this is something that's not on you? Yeah, no, no, that's what we do with everyone. Because, you know, if you want to give it, you give it. If you don't, you don't. But okay. don't forget, I'm going out. All right. Uh, it's it's a stranger also, you know, so we just ask for identification. That didn't happen when her white matched pair counterpart went in uh, to the same agent and asked for the same criteria. All of these surrounding areas are great and they're great for your commute and they're great for your husband. And Lisa's listings were in more diverse neighborhoods like Hicksville and East Meadow. Her white counterpart's listings were in more white communities. Petrelli declined to comment. Kelvin Toon is a black man in his early 50s, and he went in to meet with an agent involving a test in the Brentwood community, a community that is 80% Hispanic and black. The agent communicated to Kelvin, our black tester, that she enjoyed meeting with clients from the Brentwood area. Every time I get a new listing in Brentwood or a new client, uh -huh. I get so excited because they're the nice people. When we sent Kelvin's counterpart in to meet with the same agent, the white tester was actually uh, warned about Brentwood not being a nice place. The nursery home we need to be near is is near is in Brentwood. Okay. And so we no, found no, a couple that are in Brentwood. Pretty, pretty close to each other. Okay. 
And it just seemed like those would be handy also for going to visit. Do you want to give me them and I'll look into them for you? Or? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. That warning came later to the white testers saying there was concern about gang activity going on in Brentwood. <laughs> This agent wanted the white tester to know about, but that information wasn't provided uh, to Kelvin, the black tester. The listings centered black tester Kelvin in Brentwood with 27 house listings, while the white tester got zero listings in Brentwood. I mean, she, she's telling him these are some of the nicest clients I've ever worked with, et cetera, et cetera. He's steering me away from that. And not only in the listing she sent me, but also in telling me that about the, the gang violence. Vickery said she had warned only the white tester about gang activity because she had not been aware of it when she met with the black tester, despite widespread media coverage. She also said her business partner, Gene Gillen, sent the listings to the black tester. Gillen said the listings were unquestionably prepared based on Vickery's criteria and that Vickery may have sent the listings using Gillen's email. She said she didn't know the race of the black tester until she met him later on a house tour. Keller Williams, which was their employer at the time, released this statement. Keller Williams does not tolerate discrimination of any kind. All complaints of less than exemplary conduct are addressed and resolved. What we found when we looked at the total number of listings, agents provided 50% fewer listings to black testers on average than to their white counterparts. Shocking. We think it doesn't happen. Excuse me? Okay because I can't hear you, but we have, we're gonna have on your tables, there are index cards. So I would like for you to write down your questions and also um, your email so that if we don't get to it today, that we will definitely email you this. But I wanna talk to the realtors for a minute. It's, there's obvious things that we don't do, but it's the inobvious things that we might do. Staring, we do it sometimes unintentionally because we think there might be something better for our client. I'll give you an example. I'm from a more rural part of the state. So when somebody comes from New York City and they say they want five acres and this huge house, I know that they have no idea what five acres look like. I also know that they will not they're not used to no sidewalks, no lights, and not driving to a store to get milk, okay, during a snowstorm, um, maybe 10, 15 miles. Now, I know this information, but my job is to do what my client asks me to do. So until they tell me, after I've shown them three houses on five acres, and they ask, so who does the lawn? Okay. They said, well, is it possible? So what does one acre look like? So I give them one acre. Sometimes I have to tell them, well, maybe can I, can you let me show you something that you might like? And 10 to one, they want a neighborhood, a subdivision with sidewalks and that they only have to go to the store in 15 minutes. But our job as realtors is to provide our clients what they ask for, no matter what they ask for. And it's up to us to be able to give the public the ability to, to live, whether they want an apartment, whether they want a condo, whether they want a co-op, whether they want that five acres, it is up to us as realtors to be on that front line. That is the only way that fair housing is going to come into play. That gave us a black eye. 
There's buyers out there who think we only want our commission. There are sellers out there who want to tell us who they would like to sell their home to. That's against the law. And as long as we want to stay in our profession, we have to uphold the law. I want to leave you with that thought because sometimes you have to reevaluate the way you do business. We are in the greatest state in the United States, in my opinion, but we're having an influx of people who want to have the same opportunity that we have. We're having an influx of people who do not look like us, who do not sound like us, who do not know our ways. We're privileged, we can buy real estate. A lot of people who are coming into this country never had that opportunity. So it's on us to do what we have to do to make sure everybody has that opportunity. We're gonna take a 10 minute break. I thank you, I thank you, I thank everyone here who has come to not only hear about fair housing, but to do who, who's doing their job. Because as realtors, we are great. For all the realtors in the, in the room, give yourself an applause, okay? Because we run. Don't ever forget, if you do not get in your car, if you do not open up the door, the mortgage guy doesn't get called, the inspection guy does not get called, okay? The banks are not on the table. Your handyman guy thanks you. Lowe's thanks you, Home Depot thanks you, Raymore and Flanagan thanks you, <laughs> Ashley thanks you, because you are on the front line. Okay, we're gonna break for 10 minutes. Thank you. So the break is over. Let's, what are the issues? Along with the real estate industry, state courts, the FHA justified its racial policies both in its appraisal standards and its restrictive covenants recommended, recommendations. Again, another story. Been a realtor for 30 years. Um, I guess it was about 1999, I was selling a house and I had some very proactive attorneys who caught the fact that the deed that my client needed to sign had a deed restriction. The deed restriction said, they, they could not sell to Negroes or Jewish in that community. This deed had been passed around for three times. This was the fourth time of the sale. No one caught that. Of course, the deed is no longer in existence because they had to take it out. But that's what a deed restriction looked like. That the states, towns would have deed restrictions by claiming that the purchase of Afri uh, by an African-American in a white neighborhood or the presence of African-Americans in or near such neighborhoods would cause the value of white owned properties to decline. This in turn would increase, the, uh, increase FHA's own losses. So the Federal Housing Authority, which FHA stands for, felt like if you sold to Black Americans, or if Blacks and whites live together, the value would go, go down. This, um, so because of this, property owners, you know, they felt that they, white uh, property owners would default on their mortgages. I, I, I never figured that out, but why try? In three decades during this administrative policy, the agency never could provide or obtain evidence to support the claim that integration undermined property values. It was based off of this, it was based off a, a report in 1939 by Homer Holt, the FHA's principal housing e economist that set out the principles of sound public and private housing and home financing policy. Hoyt explained that racial segregation must be an obvious necessity because it was a worldwide phenomenon. 
he only supported this, his only assertion on this was that he noticed that in China, of all places, enclaves of American missionaries and European colonial officials live separately from Chinese neighborhoods. On this basis, he concluded that where members of different races live together, racial mixtures tend to have a depressing effect on land values. Because of some of these, we have a great generational wealth gap. You heard it mentioned. There's been a couple of cases, one of the famous ones, I believe it's in San Francisco, and I apologize, no, I'm sorry, it's in Los Angeles, where a family was given back the land that they, that was taken. Happened to be, you know, a little oceanfront land, has just a little value, just tiny value. They figured out that they lost almost $10 million and wealth. When we do fair housing, we don't realize that fair housing is somebody's retirement, it's some kid going to college. It's there for an emergency if someone has a medical major catastrophe. Our housing, the ability to own housing in America fuels this country. So the results are unequal and biased housing market, lower appraisal values, substantial generational wealth loss, urban decay in inner cities, lack of services in healthcare and education, higher poverty rates than in any other community. Middletown built a hospital in New York State. It was the first hospital built in 30 years. That hospital was built because there was an explosion in Orange County of, of people coming from the city. So you don't think about that the house that you might sell, the apartment you might rent will affect the doctor's office, the school, transportation. That's what fair housing does. We look at fair housing, we consider that we do have to take the three hours and we figured, oh my God, we gotta give you three hours of our time. We gotta take it away from our business. But you must understand what fair housing, the results that if you don't have fair housing, it affects your city, it affects your community, and it affects you. So we're gonna talk a little bit about enforcement of the Federal Fair Housing Act. If a complainant prevails in a discrimination lawsuit, the court may issue an injunction, restraining order against the violator, actually award some money, punitive charges. And I don't know about you guys, but you work real hard. You don't wanna give it up. Not because of something crazy. Violations of the Fair Housing Act. How about $25,597? for your first violation. How about $63,991 for your second violation? And if you haven't learned by then, $127,983. Now, I don't know about most of the realtors in here, but for you to have to pay out 127,000, how many years did you have to work to get that up? to pay it out, not that you made it, but you gotta pay it out. So I want you to think about that when you think that you wanna discriminate, remember those dollars. Remember how much gas it took you to drive around, okay? Remember how many hours that you stayed on the MLS looking for that property, okay? Remember how much time you missed from your family because you were doing your job. We're going to hear from experts, an expert, so that we can find out what it really means to discriminate. Cecil, I got it. I got it. <laughs> okay. So Cecil, and I'm not going to say her full name, 
because I don't want to butcher her name, but she's just going to share some things with us. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, for that introduction. And um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with these Titans of industry alongside myself. My name is Zairo Andino Caballero. I am the deputy director of the Region 2 Office of, for Housing and Equal Opportunity um, of the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. My office covers the New York area, but in addition to New York, we also service New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. And today, it just so happens I am going to be discussing a recent charge of discrimination by HUD against a realtor to try and sort of illustrate some of the issues that may arise in the context of realtor um, discrimination. And this case happens to origin from Maplewood, New Jersey. So it's the other side of the Hudson. Um, and in this particular case, the characters involved are a complainant. The complainant is a person with mental health disabilities. And the respondents were a realtor and her husband. They also happen to own an LLC that happens to be the property owner involved in this particular real estate transaction. Um, they owned seven residential units and so the realtor, in addition to being the, uh, one of the owners of the LLC, was also acting as a leasing broker. Um, okay, so in terms of the fact patterns, everything started in 2021. The realtor placed an MLS online posting regarding the property and mentioned no pets allowed. Um, complainant had her own broker that was assisting with the transaction. There were a series of exchanges um, with regards to the property. The property, for instance, was seen by the complainant and her broker. And um, they submitted their application for leasing the property, the related fees, income verifications. After the process is, is done, the realtor started to inquire about how many persons would be moving into the property and whether or not there would be pets present. Um, complainant and her broker sort of didn't necessarily directly answer those questions at that point in time. The realtor approved eventually the application and it's upon application approval that complainant reveals the grand reveal, right? Of, well, I have an emotional assistance animal. Um, the realtor at that point in time says, well, you know, I cannot say no to that. And had the case ended there, it would have been a lovely story to not discuss today. Unfortunately, um, the fact patterns start to become a little bit prickly later on down the road. By the way, I believe this presentation is going to be circulated. So here is the hyperlink to the case in case anyone's interested in, in reading later on. Um, so the realtor emails a draft lease. She asks for a picture of the dog involved and also explain that she would be contacting the insurance company to see if there would be any type of insurance premium increase related to the presence of a dog in this particular property. The draft lease that was sent out had a series of conditions that I'm gonna be um, summarizing here today. There was a prohibition of pets without landlord consent, barking noise fines, a 60 day lease termination notice if the dog became an issue for any reason. This is a direct quote, landlord gives the reason, tenant cannot fight the issue or give the landlord any issues about leaving. It didn't end there. There were additional lease restrictions such as if the dog bites anyone, the tenant needs to carry an insurance to cover for that. If there are insurance increases, those have to also be paid for by the tenant to cover the landlord. The dog cannot pee inside the house, not even on a pad, a wee-wee pad. Um, 
visit requests to confirm proper maintenance of the apartment were also embedded in the lease. And finally, that the dog could not be washed in the tub. Um, <laughs> I kid you not. Um, so of course, these terms are concerning because of their restrictive nature. Um, they do raise concerns about an improper or illegal conditioning of the exercise of the fair housing rights, which in this case happens to be the right to have disabling conditions to be reasonably accommodated. And in this particular case, furthermore, the accommodation entails, of course, allowing the presence of the therapeutic animal in the home. Um, I would like to, to address some concerns as it pertains to insurance, because I, I, I tend to hear these concerns a lot um, when interacting with realtors and other industry experts. Um, it's always best to explore alternative options, meaning, for instance, reach out to the insurance company and try to make a reasonable accommodation request to see if there is some type of waiver or adjustment that can be made to the insurance premiums in consideration of the presence of an assistance animal that is furthermore needed as part of a valid exercise of a federal fair housing right. Um, that could be a potential alternative. There's also always the option of just going out into the market and exploring if there are other insurance products out there that um, might be a better fit for a particular scenario where there's, there's a potential client with an accommodation need for an assistance animal. I think the important thing here is to always remember there are ways to collaborate even when you think you're hearing a no. There are ways to start new conversations and try and figure out if collaboration can be reached so that all parties, in this case, realtor, insurance company, um, the, the potential renters, can, can reach a point where fair housing compliance can be effectively achieved. Okay, so going back to the case, um, the complainant receives this lease and of course, she's quite unhappy. So she recommends certain revisions to the lease to these particular provisions specifically. Um, complainant also shared a civil rights fact sheet by the New Jersey Department of Law and Public Safety which provided specific guidance to landlords as it pertains to assistance animals as well as service animals. Realtor responds by saying, well, I need the dog certificate because you know, you're know you saying this is a therapy slash service dog, direct quote also. Um, I need proof of current rental payments. I also need your landlord's contact information to verify your rental history. Um, the realtor also explains that as per her point of view, the civil rights fact sheet um, was intended for associations, co-ops, condos, not to family homes. It just so happens that this specific unit was in a, in a building with only two homes, even though the LLC owned by the realtor had seven residential properties in total. Um, anywho, I think this particular fact pattern also presents an opportunity to sort of pause and ponder on what transpired. The first thing that I would like to clarify is that under federal reasonable accommodation requirements, there are only two elements that a person needs to prove. One is that a person falls within the meaning of disability as defined by fair housing laws. The second aspect to this is having some type of disability related need to the accommodation being sought, in this case, an assistance animal. That is it. Assistance animals need not be certified. Um, at HUD, we've, be we've been becoming increasingly aware of various companies out there. A lot of have an online presence. Um, and they sell all sorts of certificates and um, registrations and license licenses for assistance animals, none of this is needed. And actually, at times, some of these companies, it might be a problem relying on these companies because at times, some of these companies are not necessarily doing the proper vetting in terms of does the person fall within the meaning 
of disability as defined by the Federal Fair Housing Act? And furthermore, is there a nexus or a disability-related need for the particular accommodation being sought? Um, the other quick remark is, and, and not to be the language police, but in this particular case, the realtor seems to conflate and confuse a little bit the terminology as it pertains to therapy animals vis-a-vis -vis service animals or a service dog. Um, assistance animals is sort of the umbrella term or the encompassing term as it pertains to different types of animals that can provide some type of support related to a disability related need. Um, and support animals can run the gamut from therapeutic dogs to cats, rabbits, birds. This is not an, an exhaustive listing, but actually just so happens right now, the SDNY is litigating a, a case from our office that our office investigated, and it involves three parrots. Um, so only to illustrate that yes, assistance animals can be wide ranging in nature and it'll, all, it'll depend on a, a, a different combination of variables um, as it pertains to a particular um, person's disability needs. But returning back, so service animals, what are service animals? Service animals are providing specific work that's directly tied to a disability related need. Um, so for instance, let's think about a miniature horse that um, provides support to a person with disability related conditions that might at times um, create episodes of dizziness, or let's say a person needs for medications to be retrieved in certain moments. Those are types of tasks or work that is being performed by an animal in the direct service of a specific disability related need. And that's, in other words, the difference between an assistance animal is it's an all encompassing category. It can include therapy animals in addition to other types of animals, whereas service animals are providing specific work that, that is directly tied to a specific um, disabling need. And so bottom line, as it pertains to assistance animals, therapeutic or otherwise, just please remember, no certification is needed. Even training verification is not needed, especially in the fair housing world. Um, so going back to the cases fact patterns, um, there were additional exchanges con concerning um, the rental history, complainant, for instance, provided canceled checks, um, complainant also clarified that emotional support animals um, are covered by the Fair Housing Act and that dog certificates are not needed. The realtor continued insisting on the certification. The realtor also said she would have an attorney review the lease's terms um, for Fair Housing compliance and that the review would be performed by an attorney. Um, the complainant's broker, in turn, um, emailed back realt the, the realtor and tried to explain, as it pertains to the insistence with um, the rental history verification, the broker tried to explain that the complainant had been sexually harassed by her current landlord. There was also a person associated to the landlord that, that was harassing complainant as well. Um, so complainant had real concerns about retaliation through negative references about her rental history because of the sexual harassment. At this point in time also, a medical letter verifying um, the disability related need for the assistance animal was also provided to the realtor with again, an additional clarification of assistance animals need not be certified. Um, so going back to the medical letter, maybe I should pause here. Um, the, the, the complainant's broker also emphasized that the only thing that was needed was the medical letter to prove a need for an accommodation animal, um, in this particular case. So I, I just want to clarify this case involved a mental health disability, which 
is of course invisible or not obvious. And that is the specific reason for the complainant's broker having provided the medical letter. There are of course different scenarios where the disability is visibly obvious. Um, let's consider the context of a person with sensory disabilities that's using a guide, log, a guide dog that's visibly obvious that that specific individual needs um, a guide dog accommodation. So in the, in the context of visibly obvious um, and easily perceptible disabilities, this type of verification need not be provided. It's only because um, the complainant in this particular case had invisible disabling conditions related to mental health that um, the letter was needed and the letter need not also come from a medical provider, even though in this case it was provided by a medical provider, just as long as the person who is producing the letter um, has sufficient knowledge as to the disabling conditions of the person um, and can certify to that effect could be a social worker, for instance, that would have been enough also for purposes of proving an accommodation need in this particular case. Um, okay, so what happened after all of this? The realtor sends a text message to complainants saying, hey, lease is, is possible if you agree to the original language, in other words, without any type of adjustments or revision. She also explains that the attorney would have to revise the, the proposed language and furthermore insisted on talking to the current landlord specifically about dog noises or potential issues um, related to, to complainants has tenancy and the realtor proposed to either ask the landlord directly or do it through her attorney. At this point, complainant became, I guess you could say, frustrated with the process. Um, she went online and left a one-star review of the realtor. First, the, the complainant explained she was doing so because of disability discrimination. Then the complainant went back to her own review, replied to her own review and added that she had been provided with a lease that contained illegal provisions. And that's a direct quote. So now it's out there in the internet universe that seems to never end. Um, and after this online posting and review claiming discrimination, the realtor came back to the complainant and basically said, the rental is a no-go at this point and claimed it was because of um, the inability to talk to, to the landlord. What was the result of this? HUD made a charge um, last year in 2023. There were three specific charges of discrimination included in the HUD charge. One is refusing to rent. That's the first charge. The second charge has to do with discriminatory terms and conditions. And the third charge is failure to make reasonable accommodations. Um, so it's very lamentable. Um, once again, if I guess if I can leave everyone with um, a final thought is, if you come across a case like this saying, well, you know, I cannot say no to an assistance animal is definitely a most beautiful um, ending to, to a story from a fair housing perspective. Oh, one final thing, if anyone's interested to file complaints, um, whether on your behalf, on behalf of other, even on behalf of a client, you can most certainly do so. HUD provides a myriad of ways to file complaints, um, online, mail, or email. All the information is included in the slide deck. And finally, our office is always available to provide fair housing guidance to the public. This includes realtors. Um, we, we pride ourselves in providing very direct technical assistance and in really going into fact patterns, if you will, and trying to figure out what is the best resolution to a particular issue you might all be facing. So please just know you need not handle these scenarios alone out there. 
um, you can definitely reach out to us. And this is a service free of charge without need to involve a private law firm or anything like that. So you might as well avail yourself of, of HUD as a resource. Thank you. So now they do come after you. So I wanna talk about that little form that we have to give everyone, the fair housing form. Guys, everybody's familiar with them. Everybody's familiar with it? Thank you. Okay. So on your open houses, you have your fair housing notice? Yes. Okay. You give your fair housing notice to every client, customer? Come on, guys. We got other people here, so we, we want to say that we're doing our job, okay? If you haven't read it, I suggest that you do. Not only do you read it, explain it to your clients, explain it to your customers. Let them know that you are a fair housing agent. And here, this form is for your information in case you feel that you've been discriminated against. That's coverage for you guys. Okay, because when you have that form out there, you're not gonna discriminate because you just gave them information on how to make a complaint. The idea is that we wanna treat everyone the same way, no matter what. So give out your forms, make sure that your sellers and your landlords, for you, I'm from upstate in this, not too many landlords I deal with, but for you guys in the city, got issues and I feel for you. But when you're taking that listing, when you're interviewing that tenant, keep that form handy, okay? Make sure that your landlords know, your sellers know that they are responsible for the fair housing laws. It's not just us. It's our clients and our customers. And by the way, the elephant in the room, it's for us. Fair health. I just lose the microphone. Also goes for agents. You're representing someone, you call up another agent, you say, I have someone that wants to see your home. They ask. What's the last name? No. They ask, are they financially able? They ask, where are they from? No. As agents, you do not ask anything. You say, when do you want to show the home? You say, do you belong to the MLS? Do you have an E key, whatever key, however the access is? and you allow that person to come in. You also don't judge the agent by their accent, by their last name, because if you discriminate against the agent, you're discriminating against the client, which means you're in violation. Sometimes we do not think of these things. So be careful on how you do business. There's enough business out here for all of us, but let's do it ethically. We are not, okay, so there's a list that comes out every year about who's the worst, whether it's used car salesmen, excuse me, real estate people. But <laughs> um, sometimes we're on the bottom of that list, okay? I prefer not to be on the bottom of the list. I don't want to be the third from the bottom of the list either, but let's raise the bar. The public has a bad taste in their mouth sometimes from the way we do business. And fair housing is one of those ways. Oh, yeah, I got to put her. So, go back. As you saw, there are ways to file a complaint. Learn the ways that a client or customer can file a complaint. Because if you know it, then you are comfortable 
with what you have to go through. And you're comfortable to be able to bring it to your customers and clients. What does what practices can be considered discriminatory? Okay, so the criminal background checks. Let's talk about that. We have landlords we, who want to know if the person that they're going to rent to is safe. So criminal background checks. On April 4th, 2016, HUD's general counsel released guidance for all housing providers regarding on how to use criminal background checks and how it could be a violation of fair housing. As you've heard, the New York, New York State is gonna to get tough on it. We're gonna have the clean slate, but be very careful that when you order a criminal background check, because if someone has done something 20 years ago and they're now person in society doing what they need to do, should we really look at that? Should we look at someone who was 21 and did something stupid? And I'm sure all of us who were 21 did something stupid. We just didn't get caught, okay? Should that affect someplace where someone can live? So when you're talking to your landlords and they want that criminal background check, maybe ask them, would they want a criminal background check ran on them? Be very careful with it. Your e &O insurance will not cover you if you make a mistake. There's a lot of money out there for fines. So credit check, possibly. And by the way, this is, I'm gonna step on some toes. Credit checks for people who have vouchers, really? Really, guys? Credit checks who the people have vouchers? Why? Why? Talk to your landlords. If someone is being guaranteed that their rent is going to be paid, a credit check? I don't think so. So be very careful when you're running those checks. Criminal, credit, be very careful. Inform, first of all, you're not a bank, okay? We're realtors. We're not a bank. We're not loaning money. We do have we do have to protect our clients, but they have to be within the law. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. Disability. This is the, one of the highest areas that they're finding discrimination with disability. So one of the things I like to um, do is, of course, share stories. I moved up to Orange County 30 years ago. Within six months after I moved, my husband had a major stroke, making him disabled. I had to move my family from the, the, the town that we originally moved to, to, to closer to the hospital, to his doctors. I wanted to rent a home. I had four kids and I wanted to be close to the school and to his doctors. I found the perfect house about five blocks from my kid's school, you know, within seven, eight minutes of the hospital. But I had to make some accommodations. I needed grab bars. I needed a ramp. I was willing to do it. I was willing to adjust. And I promised that landlord that I would restore their home once I moved. At the time, I was not a realtor. At the time, I didn't know the ADA laws. And it was very painful to tell my kids, because you know, when you take children through a house, everybody picks up the bedroom, tell them that they couldn't live there. I was hurt. I didn't tell my husband the reason why. So disability, whether seen or unseen, we have to be careful. So I'm gonna bring John back up here to talk a little bit more about it. Thanks, John. 
Thanks very much for that, Robin. Um, yeah, the, the volume of cases our agency sees, the housing discrimination cases, over half of the, the complaints that get filed with our agency related to fair housing include allegations of discrimination based on disability. So this is where we see a significant volume of our cases. Uh, Zidal did a really nice job taking us through a case that involves assistance animals as a type of reasonable accommodation that fair housing laws require. Um, you know, when we're talking about protected classes and disability has this protection as well. You can't deny a housing opportunity. You can't diminish the terms or conditions or diminish the way you provide services because somebody has a disability or because of their race or their religion, their sexual orientation, all the protected classes we have. But we're talking about disability. There's a specific affirmative obligation it exists in employment, it exists in access to goods and services that are open to the public, and it also exists in housing. And what that additional affirmative obligation is, is to change the way you do business, change the policy or procedures that you have as a housing provider or as a realtor um, or as a designer or as a constructor of housing in order to make it accessible and usable for people with disabilities. And the phrasing in the statute is use and enjoy. So it, we look at both of those components when we're, when we're evaluating these cases. So that's distinct to disability, this is affirmative obligation to reasonably accommodate. So some of, the, uh, some of the language here in the slide talks about a refusal to make reasonable accommodations. And the word there is reasonable, okay? We evaluate what is the cost of this modification versus what is the resources of this particular uh, covered entity, of this particular housing provider. Uh, under the New York State Human Rights Law, a lot of times people will ask, well, who pays for this modification? Who's going to pay for this work? Under the New York State Human Rights Law, we answer that question with another question. Where are we talking about on the premises, the housing premises? If it's the interior of the unit, the person who resides there has to pay for that modification, okay? If it's the exterior, if it's a common area, an area that's commonly used to get in and out of your home, the obligation is on the housing provider, the landlord, so long as it's reasonable to make that modification, to pay for that cost. I think that's an important piece of information to share with your clients, to have that information available, because it expands on the amount of housing that you can share with them if there's a concern about how am I gonna get into the front door? Well, I know I attended a fair housing program at the Bronx Zoo and I know that we can ask the housing provider to pay for that modification so long as it's reasonable. There are funding sources that are available that you also may wanna make yourself aware of that will provide, for, provide monies for people who have to do that modification to the interior of their unit. Really great to have those resources at your fingertips as well. Again, to do what? To assist your clients to find a wider variety of housing that other people without disabilities uh, can look at as well. So I think Zidal took us through the no pet provisions of that and um, that use and enjoyment part of the law too is very important. Uh, you know, we see these ramp cases, we'll send investigators out to do a site visit and the, you know, the landlord will say, well, there's a ramp there and we'll go out and take a look and yeah, there's a ramp there, but it's at the back of the building and it's where all the garbage comes in and out and it's on like a roller coaster slope, right? That's not use and enjoyment of one's home. You wanna go in and out through the front door just like everybody else is. So those are some of the pieces of the puzzle that we're looking at when we get disability cases uh, that focus on reasonable accommodation. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Robin. Oh, huh. So I hope this is a little bit of a different take of your normal fair housing class because you've had some experts here from the field that you're able to hear that these things happen. So what are our responsibilities? As brokers, what are your responsibilities? Fair housing policy, do you have one? Do you discuss, this is April, Fair Housing Month. We, you know, brand that all around. But what are you doing in your offices? Are you grabbing your agents together and saying, hey, let's do an hour of fair housing. What's happening out there in the market? Do you, are you coming against anything? Do you need more training? Reporting. This is the fun part. We don't want to report each other. Okay, we have a realtor line. They say the blue line, we have a realtor line. We don't want to report anybody. But if you do not report a realtor or, or an agency that is discriminating, you're aiding. That's called aiding and abetting because you're allowing them to continue to do that behavior. 
So it is important. And my favorite one is record keeping. Whatever you do, make sure you have a record. It does not have to be written because we all have CMRs and whatever, you know, you put it on, you just make a record. Whatever you do for one, you do for another. I cannot stress that enough. Whatever you do for one, you do for another. So whatever paperwork that you are required to have your client sign, whatever rules that you want to, you know, put in for your own business, know the law, use your housing and anti-discrimination disclosure forms. Please use your, your housing and anti-discrimination forms. Please, pretty please with ice cream on top. Reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications. If you have a form, please use it. Know what you can and cannot ask your clients to do. I know landlords push back, we all know that. But they're hiring us to protect them as well. They're hiring us for them to find a tenant that they both can live with. So we have to do our due diligence and making sure that everybody is compliant to that. Your seller is hiring you to, that's their generational wealth. And if they want to do something that's discriminatory, they can lose it. So it's on us. As I said before, we are the front line. So let's talk about social media and advertising. We as realtors, we have gotten this down. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and anything else that could be possibly put our name out there. We do it 24 seven. Oh yeah, that's right. We also still mail things. And since there are state people here, I won't say it, but I know some of you guys are still door knocking. However, make sure that what you're putting out there, your representation of who you are as a realtor is fair, is compliant. Watch the terminology you use. Watch the words that you write down. Be careful with what you put in on the MLS because that's pushed out to different areas that you have no clue to because everybody has a website. Everybody got an app. So be careful. If you do not know how to advertise, hire someone. If you're not sure of what your social media looks like, get a friend to look you up. Find out how you face to the outside world. Do you, are you fair? Are you represented, you know, representing everyone? Check your social media, check whatever type of advertising that you're doing, and then get fair housing training. I know you don't want to be in a room or on Zoom for three hours. I get it. But as you've seen, new laws, new, you know, new things are coming. And New York State is the toughest state. We have 15 protected classes. We protect everybody. Okay, it's not a bad thing, but it just means that you gotta stay up on it. You gotta learn it, you gotta know it. It's gotta become second nature to you that what you wanna do is to be fair and equitable in whatever you do. So let's see what realtors used to think about fair housing. On April 11, 1968, the Fair Housing Act was enacted into law, recognizing that property rights should not be abridged because of discrimination based on race, color, national art. or religion. Resistance, harassment, and violence are unfortunately hallmarks of the pursuit of equal housing in our country. For generations, Access to housing of choice didn't mean access for all. Where you lived was often dictated by the color of your skin. There was a thing known as white flight. 
if there are two or three uh, African Americans in a block, then it's time to go. Real estate brokers that were taking full advantage of those fears, of that flight. That's how many of the communities were changing block by block through the course of a summer. But the population was discriminating. You know, this, this, the neighborhood, uh, when, whenever a person of color came into a neighborhood, people would begin to sell, they panic, you know. It was awful, you know. In the uh, mid-70s, uh, I was showing um, a black couple through a home, and I got a phone call from a neighbor who um, used very offensive language and told me that if I sold that house to that person or that group, that they would do physical harm. We acknowledge our industries and associations early opposition to fair housing and recognize those individuals and organizations that helped change our policy. For example, in 1947, African American real estate brokers formed the National Association of Real Estate Brokers with a clear fair housing purpose. And that certainly started to give me a platform necessary to not only talk with my realtor brothers and sisters, but to work even more diligently within the community which we came from, which was denied opportunities of property ownership. Many people have given much of their lives to advance the cause of fair housing, often risking more than just their livelihoods. Despite continued opposition across the country, the Fair Housing Act declared a national policy of fair housing by prohibiting discrimination based on race, color, religion, and national origin. Changing attitudes and behaviors proved to be difficult. And the community organizations attacked us that first year, breaking our office windows, demonstrating in front of the office, coming into office. There was a network of uh, ladies that were at home that would call and jam my telephones. Stop selling in our neighborhood, click up. Stop blockbusting in our neighborhood, click up. You know, et cetera, et cetera. Progress has been made. The Fair Housing Act was amended in later years to prohibit discrimination based on gender, disability, and familial status, and to increase enforcement of the law. So when we looked at it and said, no, wait a minute, this makes good business sense to be um, a positive, person in the real estate market and following the fair housing law, that we should get out there and do something to prove and help our members know that they're doing the right thing. When I started out, I remember having people say, well, I want to go to this neighborhood, but I don't want to go to that neighborhood. And it seems like over time, I mean, we're talking 30 something years, I don't get those questions asked. Where, where I live, um, everywhere, there's people all sorts of, of um, race, creed, color, age. It's a, it's a melting, a true melting pot. But many communities remain segregated and housing discrimination based on race, religion, and more still exists. Only half the country prohibits discrimination in housing against the LGBT community. And HUD reports that the highest proportion of complaints involve discrimination based on disability. Each of us, as Realtors, as business leaders, or leaders in our local, state, and national associations, have a role to play in this commemoration. Today, we're leading efforts to expand fair housing protections based on sexual orientation and gender identity. We must strive, together with our partners, to define how to bring about a market that's truly open and provides equal housing opportunities. We are not alone in commemorating the Fair Housing Anniversary. We are working together with our partners and allies to show that our industry is firmly committed to equal housing opportunities and recognizes the unique and important role each organization and each of us has in this monumental endeavor. Fair housing has made us stronger in a lot of different ways. One of them is protecting us in all of these areas. Race, religion, familial status, age, everything. Well, we're just doing the right thing for, for people, you know, for, for everybody. So we're doing what's ethical and what's right. Our Fair Housing Center and the Grand Rapids Association of Realtors works in coordination with each other to make sure that fair housing is, um, is absolutely there for all. 
How will you participate in commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act? After all, fair housing, fair housing, fair housing, fair housing make us stronger, makes us stronger, makes us stronger. 50th anniversary, we have since moved since then, but we're still dealing with the issues. What we can do is we can stay alert to new policies and practices. We can do our required training and we can embrace the change because markets change and we don't discriminate. So as I, before I open up to questions, I'd like to go back to my panelists. I'd like to ask is anything that you can add to just drive home everything that we've spoke about today. I'll start with you, Elizabeth. Uh, I have a lot to say, is this on? <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll just pick out a couple of things. Um, I get a lot of people who say, yeah, that Newsday story changed everything and now there's no more discrimination. <laughs> Not true. It's still going on. It's the same. It's still going on in Long Island. We're testing in Long Island all the time. Long Island Housing Services is testing in Long Island all the time. We're testing in the 12 counties in our service area. Hasn't changed at all. Um, very, very, very sadly. So counting on you all to help um, turn the tide on this. I will mention that um, we do receive anonymous complaints um, on our website for people who see something. A lot of them are from brokers. Um, so we appreciate that if it's a situation where you don't feel like you can do something formal, um, but you want to say something, um, our website um, is the place for that. And just finally, I neglected to mention, Robin talked about credit checks. And the there is no need to do credit checks for someone who has a voucher. The government has guaranteed their income. Don't spend your money on a credit check. The same is really true for minimum income policies that a lot of landlords have put into place. Um, and we recently won a trial in federal court, including a million dollar punitive damages award, clarifying that minimum income policies as applied to voucher holders are illegal. So please, uh, please keep that in mind. Thank you. Um, please keep that in mind when you are working with minimum income policies. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, thanks for the opportunity, Robin. Yeah, so uh, two things come to mind. Yesterday, uh, a point was made about, so, you know, what if it's my, my client that's driving all of this and making problems for me as a realtor uh, to do my job and, you know, diminishing my, my role here and really asking me to do unlawful things? that I could lose my license over. And one of the points I wanted to, to add to this discussion is the, the provisions in the state human rights law that protect people against retaliation for opposing discrimination. So if you tell the, you know, the person who's driving these, um, you know, these actions or this conduct that this is something that could cause me to lose business, lose my license, cause me penalties down the road, uh, and you get retaliated against I think you have a colorable claim under the New York State human rights law that you've opposed discrimination and um, and that's unlawful conduct on the part of the, the, the person who's making the decisions on that in that regard. The other thing I wanted to share, I shared this yesterday, was um, I did a program with the New York State Association of Realtors up in Albany and um, they, they actually acknowledged at the beginning of the program realtors across the country. Uh, who would distinguish themselves as fair housing in, you know, in, the, in the context of fair housing practice. And the theme they all shared was how it really improved their bottom line, was that when they added fair housing practice into their everyday business of, of being a realtor, not only did they add customers and clients to their, to their catalog, um, but they also were involved in community building you know, make diversifying and adding inclusivity to, to communities was a real value they were realizing as realtors and as members of their own community. And I thought that was a really nice way, rather than say comply or else, <laughs> these are the real benefits and values that can be realized by including fair housing in your everyday work. So thank you. Ooh, 
the last one. Um, I will say that not all discrimination out there is necessarily intentional. There can be circumstances in which discriminatory acts can, can sort of form without there being a direct intent to cause those types of harms to an individual. And if anyone ends up in a complaint process or in a litigation, please try and consider how to settle as soon as possible, how to make the other person who feels aggrieved whole as soon as possible. That is always a better course of action, I would, I would posit, than ending up with a hot charge or a ruling from some, some federal or state court that is now making formal findings that will be forever out there in black and white. Um, so I would just urge everyone to, to consider sometimes there's not necessarily intentionality behind the actions, but discrimination will nonetheless manifest if that happens. Please consider how to correct the harm and course correct the situation as soon as possible. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists because they take their time and they brought their expertise. A lot of times when we go to fair housing classes, we don't get to hear the other side. We only, you know, get talked to and be reminded what we shouldn't do. But there is another side to it. There's always another side to whatever laws have been enacted. So I want to open the floor to whatever questions that you might have. I think we have some questions. Go ahead. I don't like talking. You take a break. Okay. So thank you very much for your contributions and questions. And as I said earlier, the panel's going to do their very best to reach them. If we don't get to your question, if you included your email, which I see many of you did, uh, then you'll get an email response in the future. All right, so I'm not good at standing at a podium. Here's the first question. Is it public information to see all the settled cases of the testers? And if yes, where is that data located? Does anyone wanna take that question? Um, so the Fair Housing Justice Center cases, all complaints are publicly available on our website. All settlements are publicly available on our website. We send out a newsletter when we announce every complaint, every major event in the case, and every settlement. Um, we have not lost a case on the merits. Um, we bring cases that, that we know are, are going to be successful. As others have said, um, settling sooner than later is is often a good um, response for for everyone, and and we encourage um, that. But if you're interested uh, in settlements, there's plenty um, of them available on our website. I also want to add that the division has public information on their website. I encourage you to take a look at the division's website not just for settlements, which you can find. And we do an annual report that highlights some of those, but you can also find a great deal of other information that will be useful in your practice. If you check on there, a New York City Commission on Human Rights reports their settlements online as well. So you can peruse those. And you wanted to add, I think, something about federal settlements, perhaps? Yes, absolutely. So HUD definitely does publish not necessarily 100% of settlements, or we refer to them as conciliation agreements, um, but we do publish a portion of those agreements online in our website. The other thing is our DOJ um, partners, they also do publish consent decrees and other types of settlements that may be reached upon the, after the initiation of uh, a lawsuit in federal court. Does anybody else wanna add any resource that we've omitted? Great. All right, let's go on to the next questions. It's actually a series of questions and I'm gonna do these in reverse order to how they appear. Um, the, let's start with this one. Where are the fines paid by discriminatory brokers and landlords 
where do they go? Do they assist the community? That's an excellent question. Um, the fines go to the governments. They're basically paid to the governments and well, it goes into that black hole of governments. Um, there are, however, other types of remedies that when we um, are, are either negotiating settlements or after litigation, um, there are other types of remedies we can seek, such as, for instance, compensatory damages to compensate the aggrieved person for out-of-pocket losses. There's also what we refer to, at least in the HUD world, as public interest relief. And public interest relief is primarily geared and targeted at providing reliefs to other people out there who may have suffered harms and didn't necessarily come forth as an actual complainant. So think, for instance, a victim's fund as part of public interest relief. Sometimes we will also um, get some type of monetary relief to, to provide to, for instance, for housing advocacy groups. So it can run the gamut, um, but the fines per se, they go to the government. Yeah, so presently that's the case. It doesn't mean it has to be that way in the future because I like the idea, right, of maybe doing something legislatively to, to allocate some of that money to the back part of that question, right, which would be to add to resources for fair housing in the community. I think, um, you know, I, I think civil, civil fines and penalties um, for drunk driving Right, go back. I think some of that monies go back into anti-drunk driving uh, incentives or or work in the community. So maybe there's an avenue there for that as well. Great. All right. Now the second question from this submitter was, what is required in terms of documentation for emotional support animals? So um, so in this area, housing providers are allowed to ask for medical documentation to support the two things that were mentioned earlier. Is there a disability and is there a disability related need for the emotional support animal? Um, our investigators will be looking at that as well and scrutinizing that as well. Um, there is a stereotype out there that people are gaming this system here. They just want to have a pet. It's not an emotional support animal. What kind of support does this animal really provide? Do you have a disability? So all of those things, um, you know, uh, need to be sorted through a bit. But in terms of the type of medical documentation that our investigators are going to be looking for, it's to establish those two things. We'd like to see it from a treating healthcare provider. And, um, you know, it's medical documentation. There's sometimes confusion that there's some type of like formal recognition uh, or certification that you've, that your dog has passed the emotional support, you know, animal academy. And if you've paid a fee for that, you've been taken, okay? So um, there is no recognition of such a certificate. It is the relationship, and there's a lot of medical literature to support this. It's the relationship between the animal and the person that diminishes the, the impairment or diminishes the impact of, of the psychiatric, typically a psychiatric or depressive impairment that that individual is living with. So uh, housing providers can ask for medical documentation uh, to support both of those, those questions. It has to be reasonable medical documentation related to their disability. They cannot ask for their full breadth of medical records. Right, so 30 years of medical treatment or psychiatric treatment is not an appropriate request. And in most cases, it's simply a letter that provides the nature of the disability, whether it's mobility or sight or whatever it is, and how it it has to show a nexus to the use and enjoyment of the property. Um, and here's a question that is going to be, I think, maybe a little trickier. <laughs> how do agents avoid discrimination in regard to animals? <laughs> How do agents <laughs> avoid discrimination? Well, the first thing you do, you ascertain whether your um, client, customer, um, what is the animal? Is the animal emotional support? Is it an assistant? If they say that that's what it is, then you represent them that way. 
Okay, you represent them in the fullest of what their rights are. So that, you know, you inform anybody, you know, if you're taking an application, you're informing the person that yes, my client has an animal that is, you know, that falls under that protection. However, if a person says I have three dogs and they're all 45 pounds, and you know that there's not an apartment in New York City, New York State that's gonna take that, then you have to inform your client that you have something that is going to prohibit you finding the type of living accommodations that you want. Okay, so our, our thing is always to give information. So you inform your client, your dogs are wonderful. I'm glad they're your pets. I'm glad that everybody loves them, but it might be difficult for you to find something that you want. After that, that's pretty much what you, you have to do. One other thing I wanted to add is that, uh, to be, keep, be mindful that emotional support animals, service animals, assistant animals are not pets. So housing providers are allowed to have no pet policies. They're allowed to have breed restrictions. They're allowed to sign whatever uh, you know, requirements they're going to associate with, a, with a, either a pet policy or to have a no pet policy on its face that is not unlawful. Um, again, reasonable accommodation is modifying a policy, changing that no pet policy waiving a breed restriction or a size restriction, which are impermissible um, when it comes to assist, assistance or service animals anyway. You can't, you can't have a breed restriction. You can't have a size restriction. Uh, you can't be assigning fees that you would normally assign for pets because the emotional support animal is not a pet. It's, a, it's an animal that's designed or is there to improve the quality of life of the person who's living with that disability. Um, so going back to the original question, if you're working as a broker and you get a question and you don't know whether it's legal or not, you can pause, you can do your research, you can go onto any of our websites, you can do an internet search. There's free legal support for housing providers all over the city. You can pause, do your research, figure out how to comply with the law and get back to the person. What we see all the time, every day, is you don't know what to do, so you avoid the person. And that's where discrimination happens. Okay, there's a follow-up question, or related question. If a prospective tenant has a pit bull or a Rottweiler as a service dog, can they be excluded as a tenant? Those types of dogs are often deemed to be vicious and dangerous. Yeah. Um that's that's we get so many questions and concerns regarding as John pointed out breed restrictions and the short answer is no. In the world of reasonable accommodations and disability rights whatever animal is the one that is helping alleviate disability related symptoms pertaining a person that's the animal that will be regarded as an assistance animal or therapy animal or service animal, depending on the context. But regardless, if it's alleviating a symptom, that's the animal that should be accommodated, as John explained, by creating an exception or a waiver to a no pet rule. The, the perception of an animal, a particular animal, such as a pit bull being dangerous, that's something that shouldn't be used to deny an accommodation. However, should once the person is living in the particular housing unit, if should an, if an accident were to happen, then there are proper legal remedies in place for addressing that particular harm or accident or tort situation that might arise. It's just a matter of not jumping the gun and not assuming that just because there would, will be a pit bull or a Rottweiler presence that necessarily and undeniably there will be some type of harm that will materialize. I actually have a question. What about municipalities that will say no Rottweilers, no pit bulls, okay? And you are working with somebody who has one as an assisted animal. How do you go over the municipalities? So municipalities are covered under Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And in that regard, it's service animal, which would be a dog or a miniature horse. Probably didn't think you'd hear those two words put together today. 
We are at the Bronx Zoo. Um, are the two types of service animals? And emotional support is not a service that's covered for places that are open to the public. So these two these two laws get confused often. And the way I try to clarify it is, where am I standing? If I'm standing in a government office, I'm standing in a place that's open to the public. I'm not standing in my home. Emotional support animal is not required by the law. If I'm standing in my home, there's a broader universe of animals that can be uh, can serve as assistance animals. So it's a different law that would apply there for municipalities, uh, but that would be some of the takeaways on that. Thank you. All right, now uh, this is a follow-up to something that was raised yesterday. What happens or what can be done if the real estate agent gets blacklisted for advocating for fair housing gets blacklisted by homeowners. So I think I covered this in my follow-up earlier that there are provisions in the New York State human rights law that prohibit retaliation against an individual who's opposed to discrimination. We typically see those complaints in our agency from like a complainant, a complaint gets served, we serve that complaint on the, the bad actor and then the bad actor does something worse to the, you know, fires the complainant or threatens to the victim just because they got a copy of the complaint. Uh, and now they're, you know, they're, they're angrier. Um, I've seen those underlying complaints get dismissed, no finding of discrimination, but the retaliation that took place after the filing of the complaint is something that we can put the bad actor on the hook for. So as I mentioned earlier, if you are engaged with a, um, you know, if you're, your, I guess your boss, I'm not sure how, what the, the right wording is, but if the housing provider that's hired you to, to, um, to assist in selling their property is telling you to break the law, and I, I'm a lawyer, so I like things in writing. It doesn't have to be in writing, but I would encourage you to put it in writing. Let that, um, let that uh, individual know that that could re, uh, result in your loss of license and fines and penalties and all the things that were covered today. You know, if you're retaliated against thereafter, some method of retaliation is used against you by that individual. As I said earlier, I think you have a colorable, a colorable or a viable claim under the New York State Human Rights Law to pursue that. We have a lot of information on the Fair Housing Justice Center website. We have one page fact sheets um, that explain very briefly um, what housing discrimination is. And so I think some people find it helpful to say, hey, housing provider, you know, I went to this great training in the Bronx Zoo and I heard about these fact sheets and just want to let you know um, that I, you know, can we talk about what you said yesterday? Right. And so that's a way to like, not, you know, not have it be from you, but have it be like, this is my understanding of the law. Here's an outside organization's fact sheet. So some people are more comfortable doing it that way. Okay. Next question. How should a realtor handle a homeowner who wants a background check for her rental? So our relationship with our clients, we we try to, well, we develop a relationship with them. And one of our responsibilities is to tell them their liability. So you might want to inform them that if you continue to insist upon this, um, it will open them to liability. It can open them to be, um, you know, get a charge against them for discrimination. So give them the information, tell them what the law is, and give them information. That's probably the best way you can handle that. So that, um, yeah, they want that, but just tell them how they're opening themselves up for the liability. And to expound a little bit on, on what Robin said as it pertains to information, sharing information with landlords. Um, I believe as part of today's um, training, that um, a handout is going to be included and it's the 2022 guidance memo from HUD as it pertains to criminal records. It says all the do's and don'ts. So with very concrete examples, if, if a housing provider is still insisting on doing criminal background checks, how to specifically handle that in a way that prevents civil rights risks. So I would encourage everyone to just take a look at that memo. And again, it, it provides very practical tips on how to navigate these um, difficult issues. Okay. Is it considered discrimination 
and a violation of the law if a broker refuses to work with a client when the client says that the client cannot afford the 15% broker's fee? <laughs> We're not going to have that conversation. Okay. Okay. That, that conversation is not here. Okay. We are not going to have that conversation as we do not discuss commissions. For the realtors who are in the room, there's a lawsuit that has been settled that we're looking at. So why are you asking this conversation? I'm not going to have it. Okay, then we're going to... We're going to move on now to a series of voucher-related questions. And the first one is that Ms. Grossman mentioned something about it's illegal to have a minimum income requirement for voucher holders. Is this a new law coming or is it something that exists? And if so, where do we find that law? Um, so it's not a law. There's some DHR guidance on this uh, matter that John can talk about in a minute. Um, I referred to a lawsuit that the Fair Housing Justice Center won last year. So there was a court decision. And just to clarify, you can, if the person has a 100% fully paid voucher, there's no need to do the uh, minimum, to apply the minimum income requirement or do the credit check. If you're doing credit checks or applying a minimum income policy and the person has a partial paid voucher, you can treat them the same way as you treat everyone else, but you should only be looking at the tenant share of the rent pursuant to that voucher. Um, so I think that answers the question. The DHR guidance. That, fo that follows the guidance. Yeah, I'm not going to add to it there. Yeah, so the guidance uh, that Elizabeth was talking about is on our website, uh, New York State Division of Human Rights uh, website. We have guidance on source of income protections. And a lot of times it's it's the practice, right? It's how you know, you may be assigning certain requirements, uh, hopefully to everybody in terms of looking at these things, but if in practice it's being fo focused on people with vouchers or being focused on a member because they're in a different protected class, that's where things get problematic in the way that um, different rules or criteria are being applied. If they're being misapplied in an unlawful way, uh, that could be a route to either source of income discrimination or some other discrimination based on a protected class. Okay. Here's some a question that I think comes from real experience. If a landlord says they've had bad situations with voucher holders in the past, what are we going to do? What do you say to that landlord? In particular, what if the landlord says, they were close to foreclosure. I'm going to take an opportunity here to share something with you my first boss shared with me. And what he said is substitute the protected class, right? So if, you're, if this person was to say, you know, I had problems with African-Americans in my homes in the past. I had problems with people that were Jewish or Catholic. It's the same level of protection. Our protected classes aren't, well, we'll you know, this one will minimally enforce because those people are trouble. We don't do it that way. Source of income protection is the same protection that would be afforded somebody based upon their race, their religion, color of their skin, national origin, immigration status, so it doesn't change. So substitute the protected class and see how it sounds. Anything else on that? Oh no, spot on. Okay. Thank you, John. And uh, another question, also I think, from probably an actual conversation, is an elderly retired landlord forced, and that's the term used, forced to rent to people with criminal records, even if they are concerned for safety? In terms of the safety concerns, because this also bubbles up a lot, um, I will say, and again, the HUD guidance does 
um, delve deeply into the subject, but I will briefly say there are many individuals with criminal records out there, and those records have no bearing whatsoever on the quality of the renter, of that person as a renter. It has, it bears no weight whatsoever on the quality of the tenancy. It's not even a good predictor as to how the rental um, experience would be with that person. So just because a person may have had a criminal record in the past, for instance, Robin shared the example of a person maybe in their 20s and having done something, a mistake that ended up um, triggering uh, some, some type of indictment or whatever, we shouldn't be making these types of judgments and sort of extrapolating and deciding, well, this person will just be a horrible renter and will represent harm to the property or others. And, and that's the bottom line, not making decisions based on these stereotypes and preconceived notions. Again, I would, however, encourage everyone to take a look at the handout, the 2022 HUD memo, because it goes into every single criteria as to if a criminal record is gonna be taken into account, what to consider and how to consider in order to avoid civil rights uh, liabilities. And just going back to my earlier slides, I put the information on there so you have it. Um, you'll get the slide deck and you'll get more information coming out from both the city and state. But both of the new laws are designed to require housing providers to do an individualized assessment. And they have, you know, reasonable rules where you wouldn't consider something that was 30 years ago and had nothing to do with housing. Um, but there are circumstances where landlords will be able to take a look at those um, background checks. So it's it's um, on its way. Uh, more information will be out there, but we're we're at a moment where we're um, we're entering into a period where people will have greater protections. So please educate yourself on those. So to follow up on that, as things stand now, and then I'd ask you to address how they will be in the future in New York State. Are criminal checks allowed or not when leasing a home? So there are there are certain protected there are certain protected elements of criminal backgrounds that are protected under the New York State human rights law. So it's um, uh, arrest uh, pending dismissal. I don't have the list in front of me right now. Oh, my, oh, it's on it's on the slide. Thank you, Elizabeth. Slide will have that list rather than me baffling it right now. Um, so, so if, if you, if you fit one of those areas of the protected class, you cannot be doing background checks that are focused on those class of individuals that fit that type of a criminal background. Um, this is the, is the slide up there. Um, you know, I've done programs in the past where like, uh, employment programs where people in the room will, t will ask about, you know, we'll talk about a past criminal history and talk about the problems they've had with finding employment because of that past criminal history. And we, I talked about the rights that are associated in the human rights law about protections in seeking jobs that's based upon uh, past uh, criminal history. And, and oftentimes I was asked, well, what about housing? You know, I have problems finding housing because of a criminal history. And, and these are people that want to find work, they want to find housing, they paid their debt, and they want to find an avenue back into society and not end up back in prison. So I understand that there's concerns on the other side of it in terms of safety and, and what have you, but the laws are also designed to get people who have paid their debt and are, who are now out in our communities to provide them with avenues and opportunities to be good, upstanding members of those communities. And I think that's the background that we have to be mindful of when we're talking about criminal history for people that are looking for housing or for employment. And you, go ahead, I'm sorry. Were you gonna speak? Uh, with respect to the slides, uh, how can the attendees get uh, copies of those slides? Are they being distributed? Do I see a nod? They're gonna, the slides will be emailed to all the attendees. So you'll have 
this particular one for reference. You can print it out. You can put it in your office. You'll have all of them and maybe use them as a resource when you encounter some of the situations we've talked about when you have a client who doesn't seem to want to get with the modern day program and fair housing. You can show them there's authority for the position that you're taking. Uh, with those slides, will, Manny, will the attendees also get the names and the contact information for the panelists? We'll have contact information for panelists and also we'll have a video of the past uh, two days of conference for everyone to uh, peruse. Now the next one is uh, a rather broad one. Are there standards of services required from agencies that provide the vouchers, like a public housing authority, regarding ease of interaction, user-friendly procedures, speed and accuracy of doing what they are mandated to do, and who enforces the accountability for those voucher providers? Go ahead. We don't call them standards of services per se, but yes, um, from a programmatic perspective, HUD does have regulations in place as it pertains to voucher handling, voucher holders, landlords who are participating um, of the voucher holder program. The Office of Public and Indian Housing at HUD is the one that sort of sets those regulatory standards. They also develop leases that are entered into um, between the landlord and the renter and the leases establish obligations for both parties throughout. Um, the entity that will be enforcing all these regulatory and other requirements are usually the agencies that are managing the voucher, not necessarily directly HUD. So for instance, usually a housing authority of a particular jurisdiction might be, might be the one that is issuing the voucher and therefore is, is going to be um, enforcing in case of any type of violation. So if a situation arises, definitely reaching out to the corresponding housing authority or the administering agency of that voucher and trying to figure out what could be a possible corrective action would be the way to go. All right. This is a question that uh, someone's looking for how to proceed after the following situation. I had a rental transaction with a housing voucher recipient after the client, the tenant, reached out to me and stated, afterward, the client reached out to me and said the landlord was being negligent about a gas leak. The fire department was called and tried reaching the owner. I instructed the client to try to contact the landlord to resolve the matter because she had signed a lease. The landlord then sent me an email stating that he wanted to sue me and my brokerage because I did not provide a mental health report on this tenant. What is my recourse? Um. I mean, it seems like a very convoluted scenario to, to manage from up here, but I will briefly say definitely reaching out to the agency that issued the voucher and is responsible for, for administering the voucher. Um, these agencies, amongst other things, they have health and safety requirements that are set by the federal government, which landlords have to meet in terms of um, the conditions of the property that's being rented and paid for with a voucher. So reaching out to, to, the, to the agency that's managing that voucher would be definitely a, a good first step. As to everything else, including mental health checkup, I would encourage the person to just reach out to our office or to DHR or to the Fair Housing Justice Center. And okay, and John wants to make a remark. There is no mental health report. <laughs> You're not allowed to ask. It's impermissible to ask about disability. 
Uh, so there is no such thing. And if there is one, it's going to be a, other problems probably. And if, if people need necessary repairs in their home, there is a lot of funding out there for nonprofits who help people with tenants' rights. There's a lot of fact sheets. There's a lot of information out there so tenants can be provided that, and there's a lot of places they can look for help. Great. Okay, this is the last couple of questions, and it they did come from the audience. They were not planted by panelists. Why is there a fair housing month? Anyone? Yes. Um, on April 10th, 1968, the Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act, which we now know, thanks to the 1988 amendments as the Fair Housing Act, um, that's basically the date in which Title VIII was first enacted. And so we, we commemorate on an annual basis the Fair Housing Law during the month of April, which we refer to as Fair Housing Month. This law also came, as Robin was explaining earlier, um, there was great sacrifice to get the Fair Housing Act. So during Fair Housing Month, not only do we commemorate the, the Fair Housing Act, but we also recognize and commemorate the sacrifices by MLK and the civil rights movement so that we can now enjoy fair housing rights. We have fair housing laws because I can live anywhere that I can afford to live and you can live anywhere that you can afford to live. And we as realtors are on the first line of that. That's what makes America great. And this is gonna be our last question. And, and it's a nice follow-up to what you just said. Why isn't every month Fair Housing Month? <laughs> it is, we're all going to follow the laws as they apply to our particular occupation. Every month is Fair Housing Month if you are involved in housing. Every month, every day, every minute. And the whole purpose is it's fair housing. And as she just said, we all have a right under the law and a protected right to live where we can afford. It would be great to be able to live where we choose, period. But everyone has the right to live where they can afford. And that is fair. I'm gonna thank you very much for your attention. Please thank the panel.